Good morning, everybody. Uh, I see a full house here in our largest meeting room, and we have hundreds of people also on the WebEx. Good morning to you all. Um, we may need during the day, I could already sense it coming into the room, a bit of fresh air. Uh, we are generating quite some heat here, I can tell you. Um, part 21 is the last aviation domain for implementing the ICAO SMS requirements uh, in Europe. Uh, we don't see this implementation just as a compliance task, just to tick the box to be ICAO compliant. We have several safety recommendations from recent accidents and incidents suggesting that design and production uh, uh, to implement the SMS in the Part 21 domain in Europe. And we also know from recent history that across the Atlantic, um, SMS has also been called for in design and production. So we're not alone. In fact, we are a bit behind many of our partners internationally. SMS is a supplement to compliance. Let's make that very clear. It's not an alternative. It is a very needed supplement because rules are always a bit behind reality. Uh, we have seen recently one crisis or disruption after another, COVID-19, energy crisis, Ukraine war, shortage of supplies, shortage of skilled manpower. All these things are shaking our business, our industry. So we see SMS as the managerial tool to mitigate emerging risk not yet addressed properly by the rules. It will come sooner or later, but the rules are always a bit behind. One thing is to say that SMS is needed and put it into the regulation. That we have done the last couple of years regulatory drafting, political negotiations, industry, member states, etc. Now the real work is starting. That is how to implement it. So although it has taken two years or three years to do the, the regulation, it will take five to ten years to do the full proper implementation. We know that from some of the other domains. It's a journey. And we are ready to um, follow industry on this journey and also with the national authorities. We don't expect everything to be fixed and completely mature after one year. It will not. We know that. So having realistic am ambitions, we are ambitious. Things have to be implemented. We have regulation, we have guidance, we have everything stated what we want to see. But it is a journey we are embarking on together. Um, we have tried to draft the rules and guidance as good as we can. Also consulted industry and member states on the way. Uh, but we, we admit upfront that all rules and guidance may not be 100% perfect and fully adapted to different business models and industry, which are, by the way, also evolving. Um, so we also open to get the feedback. Up front here in the start, down the road. The purpose of the workshop today is twofold. First, it is to understand the implementation issues that you see as industry. And second, to identify the oversight challenges it may pose or uh, for, for, for national authorities or for IASA. Um, where we would like to see a fairly standardized implementation, for sure. Even before we start today, I would like to thank all the panelists and the teams who have prepared this live stream event. As you can see in the agenda, we have with us several small size, medium size, and large organizations to share their experience and challenges in implementing SMS. Some of the organization having activities on both sides of the Atlantic, some have multiple approvals across various 
technical aviation domains. We also want to hear from competent authorities how they are going to deal with SMS for part 21. That's mainly for the production side, since for the design side, it's Siaza. Finally, this afternoon, we will have two interactive sessions on oversight, so you can interact with the Yaza team. An opportunity also for Yaza to listen and respond to your comments. I hope this workshop will give you some additional benefits. I hope that we can encourage a culture of risk management and reporting so we can detect potential safety issues before they materialize. I hope that we can become more data driven and benefit from safety intelligence. We are building that up everywhere. We need to get it structured. I hope that we can move towards an overall management system to better address the interfaces between domains. We all know that cybersecurity risk management is just around the corner. Environment, health, we have many dimensions. I hope that the workshop also can encourage to develop the way authorities are doing oversight and the inspector mindset. SMS can never be a tick the box exercise. So here we also would expect a cultural evolution. With these expectations, I will leave you in the hands of the IASA team, wishing you a very fruitful workshop today. Thank you. Thank you, Jesper, for your words. Welcome again. Good morning, everyone. My name is Eugenia Diaz Alcázar. I'm the head of the Department of Production and Maintenance, and I will act as the master of ceremony during the morning to guide you through the through the different points in the agenda and supporting again the, the different colleagues uh, when we are working on this uh, planned timeline, which is very important that we keep in mind. So again, welcome and allow me to go before starting the day uh, through some practical points for your awareness. What you see there at the very beginning of the slide is the slide of code. This is the way we've decided we will take the questions today. Uh, our experience is very positive on the use on, on a slide that we can really manage very well the questions we receive. And the added value as well is that you, audience, can vote. So we will take uh, first, of course, the most voted questions we see in the slide. So please use it. A uh, typical one that you see everywhere, mobile phones, please, in silent. In case of emergency, for the ones on site, you've already received some instructions when you took your badge at the reception. And you saw here in the slides, we placed for you some instructions as well in case of an emergency. For the remote participants on WebEx, the chat will not be the way to collect the questions. We will monitor it for taking any kind of problems with the connectivity. So please, for connectivity issues, use the chat. For questions, use a Slido. Microphones are muted for the people that are attending through the WebEx. This is the agenda. I trust all of you have gone through the different topics. Um, I will not really read it for you, as I'm sure that you are already aware. You see it has been distributed through different panels, different breaks during the day. And yeah, it is an intense agenda. Eh? It will be, we hope that it is uh, fruitful for everyone. We have, just allow me to highlight that we had the welcome and review by Jesper Rasmussen, our director in flight standards, and the summary and conclusions will be given by Berashel Gessler, our CT director. And finally, please remember the session will be recorded and you can see the session in the EASA YouTube channel. And you will see the presentations. You will have the chance to see again the presentations once the event finished, because we will put them there. And with these administrative notes, we are ready to start. The first block that we have in our agenda is SMS requirements for design and production organizations in Europe 
the context. And here I will give the floor to my two colleagues, Jean-Pierre Arnaud and Jury Oroc. Thank you. Good morning to all of you. Uh, welcome in Cologne. My name is uh, Jean-Pierre Arnaud and with my colleague uh, Yuri, we will give you uh, um, the context, the regulatory uh, context, uh, how we have amended the Part uh, 21 rules to uh, include um, SMS. And uh, to understand how we did that, uh, it's important to make the difference and the relationship between product safety and SMS. So this is what I'm going to try to explain in my first, uh, with the first slide. And for that, I've decided to use uh, an IKO figures about a safety record. It's an old one, but I did that on purpose because you can see that after the Second World War, we had a high number of incidents, accidents, and fatalities, uh, taking in consideration at that time the, volu the volume of, of traffic. And as you can see, I put technical factor in the sense that the design and the production community have done a great job by improving the products, by improving the reliability of the products, by taking good care of system reliability, by introducing QMS, by taking into account human factor in the design. And for that reason, we can say that part 21 was ground, was a ground construction center on the product, and it has achieved very good safety records. This is clear on the, on the slide. And nowadays, we can say that we have very detailed certification specification, which achieve a high level of safety. And you can all be very proud of that. So the first statement from this figure is probably that compliance to the product-centric rule remains a must. And we are not going to disrupt that concept we need still to be compliant, whatever we introduce in the rule now. Nowadays, we need to consider that air traffic, just trying to use the remote, okay. Can you put me back? Use the EPR on the left and right hand. It takes exactly. Okay. So sorry for that. That was what I wanted to demonstrate. On the left-hand side of the figures, you can see that the approach was a reactive approach. We have learned a lot from accident. We have improved our certification specification. And this is what we call product safety and very good safety record. Now, what we want to consider is the future. And we know that air traffic is going to double within the next 15 years. This is the ICAO forecast, the IATA forecast. Every 15 years, the traffic will double. And we also know that the aviation system is under high pressure. I could quote a few one post escalate right now, energy crisis, shortage of raw material and volatile prices, supplier chain is strained, trouble finding skill labor, attractivities of salary, cyber security, competition and financial consequences, the need to take into account innovation and the need to be to give consideration to the climate change. So the system is really under pressure. And when we look back at, uh, to these 15 years and the, the, the last 15 years and all the, the several accidents that we had, unfortunately, we can trace back this accident to missteps misstep, to organization, at organizational level. 
I can quote a few accidents, the Challenger Shuttle, Colgan Air, Fukushima, and more recently, uh, Boeing 737 MAX. They all point to a wrong business model or wrong uh, decision at managerial level. Sometimes it was detrimental to safety. Sometimes it was a safety culture, which was not at the expected uh, level. So if we want to uh, cope with this increase of traffic, with this pressure, and have no accident or zero accident, this is the target, at least, we can dream. Understanding who makes mistake is for sure valuable. But understanding why people make mistakes is very important as well. This is what we call the context. This is what we call the operational context in which you design organization and production organization, you deliver product. So we want to see that relationship between the operational context and the product safety. We need also to map safety success factor will help to improve the level of safety performance. Sometimes we call it safety two for, for experts. So what are the factors that make the product safe, the environment safe? And last, anticipating in a fast evolving world is what an effective SMS will try to achieve. Jesper was mentioning we are going through uh, a succession of uh, disruptive events. I don't, I would like to be optimist, but for us it means we have to adapt to all these crises. And this is why we should try to anticipate as much as possible. This is why 10 years ago, IKO decided to publish Annex 19, uh, calling for implementation of an SMS, uh, including uh, for all domains and including part 21. One interesting aspect is to address the interfaces between all the domains. There are many risks at the interfaces. And the objective of Annex 19 is to collect any kind of safety information that signals safety concerns. For instance, I can quote two enablers, establishment of a reporting a safety culture, a confidential reporting uh, culture system, and safety intelligence. How are we going to use what we call big data or safety intelligence to understand where the vulnerabilities of the system are? Uh, this is why we have uh, spent some time <laughs> by amending uh, 21A3A uh, about collection of uh, events. Analyzing and processing this safety information in a meaningful way, ensuring that middle manager pass safety information and messages up and down the organization so that the working force is, is fully aware of safety concern but also that the senior management gets the right information and takes the right decision at the right time. Last aspect is developing capabilities to identify hazard and mitigate the risk. As soon as we know where the vulnerabilities are, the question is, is it acceptable? Is it tolerable? Should we take action? This is the culture of risk management and this is what SMS bring into the equation. And finally, moving forward, the concept of integrating management system. Jesper, say a quick word about that. We have, uh, we push for a management system encompassing all type of activities. And we know that cybersecurity will be one of these elements to consider in the future. With that, I guess, uh, I set the scene to describe the relationship and the differences between uh, product safety and SMS, and I will invite my colleague Yuri to explain you how this has been transposed into the Part 21 requirement. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. 
Good morning, Part 21 community. So I will continue on the presentation and uh, with a, a reminder maybe. So the um, IKO SMS principles are usually represented by four pillars, namely safety policy and objectives, safety risk management, safety assurance and safety promotion. Each of those pillars, as you see, are composed of a number of elements. For instance, key safety personnel, hazard identification, continuous improvement, or safety communications. To those ones needs to be added two very important elements that uh, Jean-Pierre have mentioned, and you can see on the, on the right part of the slide, positive safety culture, and data intelligence or safety intelligence, as, as Jean-Pierre mentioned. So you take all those elements together and this is forming the system that we call safety management. And this is coming as a complement to basic compliance to the rules. What we needed to do uh, was to ensure that those pillars and elements are transposed into the European framework for design and manufacturing of products. That's why a rulemaking task was initiated and it's followed its way up to act the actual changes to Part 21. Yeah. So through this rulemaking task, the exercise was to identify the gap between ICAO Annex 19 and Part 21. Obviously, the product-centric approach to manage safety was already in Part 21, and we can uh, give as example the certification and oversight of organizations, the um, design assurance, the level of involvement, and the quality assurance uh, of products together with the um, monitoring of the products in operation with, uh, when necessary, the issuance of erosiness directive, uh, for instance. Now, what needed to be added or reinforced was um, a more organizational view to safety beyond the product-centric approach. An organizational view which is um, tailored to the size of the organization and to the complexity of its activities, and which is able to identify areas of improvement, define objectives, communicate on them, and monitor them over time. Another, ele another element which needed to be added or reinforced depends was the more proactive approach to identify hazards before and, and mitigate the, the related risk before this is translated into uh, an unfortunate accident or incident. For instance, difficulties to recruit staff or the impact that uh, crises can have, energy crises, uh, sanitary crises, we, ha we have mentioned this. The last element which needed to be reinforced or made systematic is the fostering of a positive safety culture, including just culture principle. And here it is about avoiding that uh, a corporate culture of concealment appears in an organization. Let's say that the takeaway from this slide is that the changes that we have introduced in part 21 are closing the identified gap with IKO Annex 19. Well, in terms of timelines, the changes to Part 21 uh, entered into force in seven, on 7 of March 2022 and became applicable 7 of March 2023, so a few months ago. Since that date, the affected organization have until 7 of March 2025, so it's a lot of numbers, to demonstrate full compliance with the novelties introduced in the regulation. A reminder here, when I mentioned affected organization, I mean approved design organizations or approved production organizations. Having a closer look at 
the provision themselves. Uh, point 21A139, it's still a lot of numbers, sorry. And uh, 21A239 in part 21 are not the only provisions of part 21 which have been affected, but they are the ones where most of the pillars and elements mentioned earlier are visible. But in summary, next to the well-known uh, design assurance and quality assurance, we have now the safety management elements. Timelines, milestones, so 7th of March 2023 was the date. We are a few months later, we can say what has happened uh, since then. If we look at the uh, POA environment, so on that date, several, uh, not several, generic, generic findings were issued to the affected organizations and level two, level two. And um, the policy or the idea behind that is that implementation of SMS is a significant change. And it was recommended that all affected organization, POA side, apply for this significant change by October 2023. And we are in October, so you can check among yourself where you are. But you have still a few days, let's say. On the POA side, uh, the approach was a little bit different, meaning there was no generic funding issued, but rather, uh, findings on a case-by-case -case basis uh, during the, novus, uh, the normal oversight activities. To support this implementation, of course, there is need for IMCs and guidance material, and as I published the related IMCs and guidance material in two packages. The first one was published in December uh, last year, I will not say 7th of December because uh, it was in December. Uh, and it contained the MCs and guidance material mainly to the organization's requirements. The second package was published last Friday. And it is about, as you can guess, the MCs and guidance material to the competent authority requirements. So now the MCs and guidance material are now fully available for you. Everybody. But uh, in practice now, uh, implementation, the frequently asked question is certainly, I am already an approved organization, what do I need to do? And I give you the answer. You should perform a gap analysis. <laughs> a gap analysis to uh, compare what you have already in place versus what is now in part 21. Uh, but uh, caution, this gap analysis should not only check what is in the organization and what is not there. It should also, for what is already in place in the organization, assess the level of maturity of this. We have and this is the, the main topic of this slide, uh, different tools available to support performing this gap analysis. For instance, the EASA management system assessment tool, which has been recently updated to also take part 21 into consideration. There is also uh, the um, management system assessment tool which is available as an annex to the standard developed by industry with regard to implementation of SMS. Once the organization will have performed this gap analysis so they can uh, determine the level or the magnitude, let's say, of the, of the organizational change that they need to, to do in order to comply with the requirement and then agree, discuss with the team leader and agree on an, on an implementation plan for this. So I think 
I can stop the presentation here because uh, I'm sure during the rest of the day we will talk about the practical challenges that uh, organizations are facing and also competent authority. So on my side, that would be it. Maybe Jean-Pierre, you have some uh, wrap-up notes. Thank you, Yuri. Uh, in fact, we have uh, prepared these slides that you can bring home, uh, which uh, sum up to a certain extent the key messages that we would like to share with you. Uh, initially, we wanted to uh, prepare a questionnaire with Slido, but we decided to uh, give up with that. But one, one important statement is that being compliant does not necessarily mean being safe. Unfortunately, the rule cannot address all the risk, and especially with this fast-evolving world, there is always new risk, emerging risk that we have uh, to consider. We know also that the rules are not perfect sometimes, so we have to be very humble. The rule cannot address all the risk, and this is what SMS will try to achieve by practically by proactively identifying hazard at organizational level so that all type of risk, risk of all nature, I'm not talking only of risk at the level of the product, are effectively managed. This is what we call the concept of performance. How does the organization perform? How do they have this contextual approach? And compliance with the rule remain a bust. You remember these figures from ICAO, the safety records are good, so we are not going to change that. And the second uh, message is that SMS does not disrupt the certification of the product exactly for the same reason. Safety records were good, so we are going to keep the way you certify the products, no way to change. However, SMS address the operational environment of the design and production organization. SMS anchors the risk tolerability and risk acceptability of the organization activities with the delivery of the product safety. So if in the context vulnerab vulnerabilities are identified, is it acceptable for the organization? This is the way we want to the cultural change, mind, change of mindset we want to bring into part 21. And an effective SMS, every word counts, yeah, effective, and don't implement an SMS to please the authority, but implement an, FML, an SMS effectively, which means you are able to identify your risk in your environment and you are able to mitigate uh, those risks. Hopefully, uh, we should anticipate safety issues uh, before it happens. Thank you very much. Now we are ready to take some questions, the ones that the audience has put in a slide. I understand there is only one, unless we we'll see more. This is the only one that we receive right now, which is about the certificate and participation. Uh, by default, we are not giving these certificates. Uh, if someone in the room uh, attending in, in presence has a high interest because of a very good reason, please contact us. But by default, the ASA is not issuing participation certificates on, on this. Not even before, uh, by uh, March 2027? 2025, no? When, when SMS becomes compliant, becomes effective. <laughs> we have more questions? You'll see the questions there on the screen. We are not transferring the information. Just give us a second. Thank 
anyway, you can always contact us if needed. If you refresh, if you refresh the screen. Well, can you probably say again how to remotely connect? I have some colleagues that try to connect, and the YouTube live channels is not the case. What's the WebEx? <coughs> Uh, you come come no, it's just the delay here. Okay, yeah. So you see there on one of the corners the number of votes per question. So the ones that are uh, the first one, for example, is the one that received three votes. Just this is just for your information how they are shown up here. So um, Jean Pierre or Judy, can you take? I will, I will take the first one. So the MSAT is the ERSA Management System Assessment Tool uh, presented by uh, Yuri. So we have published in September the second uh, edition of that tool, including uh, part uh, 21. Uh, and unfortunately, no, we do not plan to uh, publish uh, an Excel file for the moment. Uh, you can use the first edition where there is a, a practical uh, file to use uh, during audit, but for the second version for the moment is not planned. We will consider that. Thank you. Uh, maybe I take the second question on the industry standard when it will be released. So as per the title, it is an industry standard, so we are not the master. We cannot uh, give the answer to this. We know that they are working on the industry standard, but the question should be addressed to industry. Good morning. So, Gilles Fontaine, uh, chairman or co-chair of uh, this uh, international standard working group. Uh, the RFC is uh, under uh, finalization, I would say. Um, we do have a, mas uh, a master draft, which is uh, quite uh, uh, finalized for the time being, except for one topic, which is uh, the extensions of the, of the standard uh, for the maintenance organizations in order to be recognized as a means of compliance for maintenance organization implementing uh, an SMS uh, to uh, comply with uh, the uh, regulator uh, uh, requirements uh, for, for SMS. So first of all, the IASA requirement for SMS in maintenance uh, organizations. Uh, we are working on this topic uh, currently. Uh, we do expect uh, getting uh, uh, some uh, outputs of the subgroup uh, of the standard working on this uh, maintenance aspect uh, in the next uh, weeks. Uh, and depending on these outputs, we will uh, see if we uh, include some further uh, maintenance uh, guidance uh, in the standards, or if we publish the RFC without them uh, pending uh, the next RFD. Uh, to, to include uh, some further guidance for maintenance organization, SMS in maintenance organizations. So to be decided in the, before the end of this year and uh, RFC uh, to be published, uh, I would say first quarter, uh, most probably first quarter uh, next year. But the RFB, uh, just to, to add uh, that RFB, uh, which is uh, currently published, uh, has been uh, recognized uh, by IASA through an AMC, uh, through two AMC, by the way, uh, in part 21, uh, as a means of compliance for implementing an SMS, so in both DOA and, uh, and POE. Thank you. For the third question you see on the screen, um, as we are having now a panel, and that will really address those th these questions. So we basically wait a bit and we will have a, a better discussion on this topic. Uh, and we have time only for one more question. I see one at the end. Can someone from 
from the table, yeah, take it. Um, the two one, the two first one on the screen, we will discuss that uh, shortly uh, today and this afternoon. So I'm sure we we will have time later to answer it. Just for Stefan Boussu about uh, impact on bilaterals, this is part. It, it, it will be also covered. So uh, no problem for that. Yep. I can quickly take the last one if you allow me, Eugenia. Sorry. <laughs> uh, normally, there should be no no impact on the um, the way the OPO arrangements is set, so SMS is not affecting into that aspect of the uh, POA compliance. Thank you. So thank you for being active in, in the Slido. You see, it works. So please keep this active approach, and it will be much better for the complete day. We can close this slot already. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you for the participants for their active questions. Thanks to the colleagues again. And yeah, we have now a panel in in your in your agenda or in the agenda of today's workshop. You see that the, the title is SMS Implementation Authority Perspective. Here, the moderator is my colleague Gregory Liv. Head of Department of Design Organizations and ETSO, who will be, in fact, the one with the role of Master of Ceremony during the afternoon. I will be only in the morning and my colleague will be in the afternoon. So now I give the floor to you, Gregory, and we manage the panel. <laughs> Thank you, Aria. Good morning, everyone. May I invite the panelists to, to the table, please? So my name is Gregory Lievre. Uh, please allow me to uh, add my voice to those of my preceding colleagues in welcoming you in EASA, physically for some of you, virtually for, for the others online. It's really a pleasure for us to see so many interested uh, practitioners of SMS coming to, to Cologne to discuss with us. So while we are loading the, the presentation, maybe one word about uh, the, the, the flow of, of presentations and, and sessions today. So our idea was to start by reminding the uh, regulatory requirements. But before deep diving into the implementation aspects in, in Europe for design and production organizations, we thought it might be helpful to take a bit of a step back and uh, look at what is being done by authorities around the world. So you'll see in the panel, we have uh, one representative of, of the EU, but we also have guests who traveled a long way to come here and, and share with us their experience and give us some uh, food for thought for our own uh, developments in Europe. So I assume. Can you try to move from here? I don't have any fancy. Uh... Ah. So we are trying to load the, the presentation. Who is it copying? Thank you, Joaquin, and thanks, Patrick. So, um, before introducing the panel members, uh, just a word about the objective of this panel, which details a little bit the philosophy that I've just described. So, uh, we have identified four main objectives for this panel to provide a status update on SMS implementation for production and design organization in the panelists' respective areas to report challenges and successes uh, on, on their side and from their perspective, to raise points of attention for industry and other authorities based on their experience, and to highlight possible local specificities which might be of interest. And there was already a question uh, from Airbus in the previous session, so I'm sure there will be lots of interest for these, these aspects. So I don't know if I can, well, maybe I can rely on Patrick to... Good, thanks. So. We've got a few slides to introduce our panelists. So starting with Manush Valipur, 
So she's a technical officer in the safety management section at IKEO in Montreal. And in that capacity, she supports the development of Annex 19 guidance documents and various implementation support activities, mainly focusing on safety intelligence and safety performance management. Um, her background is of systems and process engineers engineering and uh, she's held various positions in quality management, data analysis. We spoke about data a lot this morning. So we have a specialist here, data-driven decision-making and implementation support strategies at IKEO. And I ask every panelist to tell us something a bit personal about them, so to break a bit of the ice. So they, they all accepted kindly to do that. And um, we learned that Manush is learning to play the chilo and occasionally performs with 12 persons in an ensemble. So. The comment that it proves that miracles do happen is coming from her. I would not have <laughs> dared making that comment. So welcome, Manush, and thanks for having accepted our invitation. Oops. So our next panelist is Dylan, Dylan Jung from Transport Canada. So his current job is Acting Chief Delegation, Surveillance and Quality national aircraft certification at TCCA. So he's got uh, engineering, uh, aerospace engineering background on lightweight structures, systems, and vehicle design. He joined Transport Canada in 2015 and worked on various, in various divisions, including regional engineering, project management, delegation, surveillance, and quality. And in his spare time, he enjoys woodworking and building furniture for friends and family. I'm sure he's got more friends since he's doing that. <laughs> So welcome, Dylan, and, and thanks also to have, uh, to have joined today. So, so they, they will maybe explain uh, the, the, uh, in the course of the discussion uh, how they are structured in Transport Canada, but to talk about SMS, we had two directorates, in fact, represented because it's an activity which is shared between two. Uh, if you can please go back to Xavier. So um, that's why we have uh, the pleasure to have two guests from Transport Canada today. And the second one is Xavier Bourdoulet. I hope I pronounced it properly. We rehearsed with the first name, but not with the family names. Um, so he's a Chief Technical Programs Evaluation and Coordination Division, uh, Chief of this division in uh, Standards Branch in TCCA. And his main role in this capacity is to advance safety management through effective regulatory programs processes and collaboration, ambitious goal. Um, so Xavier's got 30 years of experience in the aviation industry. He worked in various operators all around the world, uh, including in an airline and a manufacturer before joining TCCA eight years ago, more than eight years ago. And he holds an aircraft maintenance engineering license in Canada with the M1 and M2 ratings. And um, something which he probably shares with some of us. He believes in long li uh, lifelong learning and recently he graduated with an executive MBA and uh, he's wondering what he's going to learn next. So today is the next step for learning through the exchanges with, with you all. So welcome Xavier in the, in the panel. So, so we have two more panelists. Um, so for the next panelist, I, I did my best to pronounce it properly in Spanish, but at the end of many unsuccessful trials, he told me, okay, call me Nacho. So, <laughs> so Nacho, oh, the family name, I apologize in advance, Carretero Sanchez, is the head of airworthiness in uh, AESA in Spain, and he's been in that position since June 2022. Uh, his background is in uh, engineering and airworthiness for the Spanish Air Force fighters. Uh, he's, an PO, he's been a PO inspector since 27 and a maintenance inspector since 2017. So you can be, I'm sure, as impressed as I am by the amount of competence and expertise we have in this panel. And something special about him is that he's trying to improve his skills in tennis to become the new old Nadal. So we have very ambitious panelists today. So Welcome, uh, Nacho, and, and thanks for having accepted the invitation. And, and last but not least, coming all the way from the US, we have Jeff Devon with us. Uh, Jeff is a director, system of the site division at uh, the FAA. He's responsible for the other side of roughly 1,500 FAA production approval holders 
and other FAA authorizations. The scale is always different in the US. Um, so Jeff uh, has an engineering background. He's enjoyed uh, 37 years in the uh, aviation industry, more than 32 years at the FAA in many project and leadership capacities, covering engineering, production, continued operational safety, and industry-wide safety initiatives. So something special about Jeff, uh, he seems to enjoy the beautiful Northwest US, uh, and he's done that for most of his life, uh, where he enjoys uh, outdoor activities, hiking, skiing, biking, snowshoeing with family, friends, and now with a two-year-old dog, Charlie. So that's Jeff. Thank you, Jeff, and uh, welcome to the panel. So with such an amount of expertise, I think we, we can start. So just a word about how we'll organize the, the panel. We'll have two presentations, and then we'll take the first series of questions, and then two more panelists. In fact, three, when I say two, it's, uh, it includes TCCA, so, so two, brain, two brains of TCCA. So um, two organizations presenting, then questions, and the two others, and then questions again. So we'll start with Manush from IKEO. Thank you, Gregory. Um, good morning, everyone. Good day to the online participants, wherever in the world that you are. It's a pleasure to be here with you uh, today. I'll be um, speaking a little bit about uh, Annex 19 and where we are with uh, that particular standard. Um, can I control the slides from here, I think? Yes. So um, currently, Annex 19 Amendment 1 is um, in place. Uh, this particular amendment was uh, adopted in uh, 2016, and it's been applicable since 2019. Uh, at IKEA, we're currently in the process of uh, producing uh, Amendment 2 to Annex 19. Uh, as I speak to you today, we're actually in the process of finalizing the consultation phase with member states and international organizations, which means that the a proposal package for uh, Amendment 2 gets circulated across the world, across the aviation community, and we receive feedback about the proposed changes. We have just closed the consultation phase, and we are finalizing all the input received with the expectation that the new amendment will be adopted in the second quarter of 2024, so mid next year, uh, and it will become applicable in November 2026. So the new amendment is coming. Just to give you an idea of what triggers these amendment processes. Um, so at ICAO, we um, benefit from um, the input of expert groups that we call panels. So in our case, to support the um, maintenance and the updates to Annex 19, we have the safety management panel, which is a group of experts. I see some of you in the room who are actually members and advisors to the panel. So this group of experts from across states, regulators, international organizations, service providers, industry, et cetera, come together to propose the changes and the improvements to um, all IKO annexes. Um, so the panel has a mandate to look at each annex periodically to see what needs to be improved, what needs to be introduced, what doesn't serve and potentially needs to be removed or altered in the annex. Um, another source of the changes that are proposed periodically to update the annexes uh, come from the collective experience of the community, yourselves. When you attempt to implement SSP and SMS requirements that are outlined in Annex 19. So in the case of your industry, uh, the representation, I put a note here in the slide, is through ICCAIA, the International Coordinating Council of Aerospace Industries Associations. So panel members that represent this association uh, have the experience for a few years working with Annex 19 Amendment 1 provisions. They look at the lessons learned, their experiences, challenges, what works, what doesn't work in implementing the existing provisions, and then they bring back the, the concerns, the comments, the input, and the proposals for change and improvement back to the panel, which then feeds into the new amendment. Um, we also at IQ um, deal with stakeholders, states, 
international organizations and industry players. We have various activities. We have these kinds of meetings. We do workshops. We have surveys. So we reach out to the community to also see what needs to be included in new amendments. So just to give you an idea of where these changes come from, they're not just um, implemented by a group sitting um, in Montreal at ICAO thinking, oh, we may want to change and introduce new things. They actually come from the community and from the field and from the practitioners like yourselves. The message I want to stress here is Please do not panic because there's a new amendment coming. I think that's very important to note. A new amendment coming does not necessarily nullify what's already in place. So in the case of Annex 19, it's Amendment 1. What's already in place still stands. The good news is that what's coming in Amendment 2 is really there to enhance what's already in the Annex. We're not really walking back on anything that's already in place. If, if anything, we're really introducing improvements to what's already in Annex 19 Amendment 1. And uh, I'll touch upon some points. You will see the idea is really to support and facilitate the implementation of what's already in the annex. So the idea is not for your community to wait and see, well, let's wait and see what's coming in Amendment 19. We're going to, in Amendment 2, let's, let's put things on hold and wait and see. Our recommendation, strong recommendation and encouragement is to continue doing the work regardless. Uh, now to give you a very short overview of what's actually coming in uh, Amendment 2 that will have an impact on SMS implementation. As you will see, if anything, most of the changes that deal with SMS requirements are there to facilitate and support the implementation of what's already in there. There are new standards to support the identification of interfaces. Uh, there are also some existing standards that have been amended and clarified to emphasize the need for better and more effective identification of hazards across interfaces. So you see, again, there's nothing really new. If anything, this, these points really show how the thinking and the approach needs to be uh, more holistic and across the system. Uh, there are also some uh, new standards to ensure that products and services that have a direct impact on safety are also covered by the scope of the SMS that you implement in your organizations. Um, the scope of the uh, SMS applicability in Annex 19 Amendment 2 has also been expanded. Now the new amendment is supposed to address um, RPAS operators, the maintenance organizations that service and support RPAS operators, and also cer certified heliports. So you see that the changes, as I mentioned, in Amendment 2 do not nullify what's already in there. This is to support and enhance and facilitate the implementation of SMS requirements already outlined in the existing Amendment 1. Um, our colleagues in the previous uh, discussion addressed uh, SM001, the International Industry, Industry St Standard. I won't go into much detail. I just apologize for the um, clerical error here. Uh, as we saw, the standard is at issue B currently. Um, that was issued in 2022, and our colleague uh, already mentioned uh, what could potentially be coming uh, in issue C and when. So I won't go into much detail, just to say that in addition to Annex 19 and the ICAO guidance that supports its implementation, there are other resources that are really developed by your own industry based on ICAO standards and rec recommended practices, but geared towards more customized understanding of those requirements for the needs, the specific needs of your community. 
Um, there are also additional um, provisions related to design and manufacturing organizations in ICAO's Annex 8, Airworthiness of Aircraft. In case you're interested to dig more into some of those ICAO standards and to see how they potentially link back to what's in Annex 19 to support your understanding, better understanding of how Annex 19 requirements apply to design and manufacturing organizations. Uh, lastly, I would like to uh, mention uh, the idea that at ICAO we're not out of touch. We don't just sit there and produce these standards. We also have several activities to support implementation of the standards that we publish and produce. So um, in our um, particular area in the safety management domain and related to Annex 19, we have guidance documents. We have um, ICAO document 9859, which is the safety management manual, currently in its fourth edition. With the introduction of Amendment 2, this manual is also going to be updated to its fifth edition. So you will see that uh, coming out towards the end of next year. It will include new guidance, enhanced guidance on understanding the provisions in Annex 19. Uh, we're also in the process of um, drafting a new manual, uh, the safety intelligence manual. So a lot of the topics and the guidance related to um, data analysis, uh, development of safety indicators, using indicators in decision making, the concept of safety intelligence as a strategy that supports data-driven decision making, um, there was enough material to now justify a standalone manual. So we're actually drafting the first edition of that particular guidance document. In addition, we have training courses. There is a, the ICAO training catalog available on the ICAO website. I invite you to have a look. We also develop a lot of, develop and deliver a lot of workshops um, that contain um, practical examples. They're not just talk, 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 theory, theory, theory. Uh, there's a lot of practical um, ex examples, case studies, activities. Um, when we say workshop, uh, our participants really get work done and learn through discussions with us and with each other. So if you're interested to learn more about that, uh, I'm not sure if the uh, slides will be available to our participants because I've uh, embedded some links there for your reference. If not, please do feel free to to approach me later on. I'll be here to provide more information if you're interested. Um, we have a, a new uh, set of products at IKEA called IPAX implementation packages, which again put uh, various modules of guidance, including documents, manuals, workshop training. So some of these solutions are packaged together and available to interested parties. So that's another way for us to support the implementation of um, IKEA standards and recommended practices. In this case, we have some IPAC supporting Annex 19 uh, provisions. And last but not least, we also have a safety management implementation website where we showcase uh, real life examples of how uh, Annex 19 provisions are actually being implemented. So um, I invite you to have a look at that, even if you just Google the ICAO SMI website, it should come up. Uh, another request that I have is if you have examples of the work that you do in implementing uh, Annex 19 provisions, we would be very happy to include them on that website. So we're always looking for examples. We're always looking for practical uh, um, demonstrations of how you actually do the work on the field. And we have a lot of room on that website to expand what's already available. Um, thank you. I will be here after the presentation, and I believe we have some question and answer opportunities. So thank you for your attention. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Manoush, for setting the scene at uh, IKO level. Our next speaker is Jeff. Uh, while Jeff is, uh, will you present? Yes. Sir. Yeah. While Jeff is, is going to the to lecture, I, I started to look at the questions, and I see that many questions are very uh, EASA centric and and uh, EASA focused. So please bear in mind that we have a lot of uh, upcoming sessions to address those those points. So many of the questions that I've read now will not be addressed by this panel, but we have two hours for the interactive session this afternoon, where a lot of those questions will be duly discussed. So please, for 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 the question you will ask. We now and, and the next uh, opportunity for our panelists to answer. Uh, bear in mind that we'll, we'll focus on the international dimension in a way because of their background and their perspective. Thanks for your understanding. 
Okay, thank you very much and good morning. It's nice to be here in Cologne again and also connecting with folks that are joining uh, through the virtual connection. Can you move? We'll yeah. just uh, get our slides organized here so that my comments come up. Uh, so again, uh, very good to be here in Cologne and, and engaging on an important topic that is important to the entire industry uh, in terms of where we are with safety management and how that is a complementary activity to other things that we've been you know, actively engaged in for many, many years to enhance aviation safety. So I'm Jeff Duvin, the Director of System Oversight within the FAA Aircraft Certification Service. And Gregory's um, introduction highlighted the, the way in which our organization um, is set up. So uh, my organization is responsible for production approvals, which are based on a systems approach. Uh, in addition to our approval of delegated organizations, again, an aspect that is based on a systems approach to do work on behalf of the FAA. And then lastly, and more recently, a responsibility for the implementation of safety management systems. And so one of the things that we're very interested in is how we bring our knowledge of those systems together to really inform us how the, how the broader uh, responsibilities within the companies that we're working with are performing. So just a few slides here to, to share where we are uh, from the FAA standpoint. So the first one, the common ground really takes kind of an international perspective in terms of where we are. So Manoush, thank you for giving an update on uh, the activity within ICAO relative to Annex 19 and establishing the standards and being able to evaluate where some of those standards now need to be enhanced based on learning. And so that certainly is an important principle to the FAA in terms of how we are approaching implementation of our safety management requirements is to align with um, ICAO Annex 19. Uh, while our activity has been paced a little bit differently than uh, EASA, we have been very much following the work of the international group in developing the um, SM0001 uh, standard uh, following the initial development the steps that were taken to um, enhance that standard to align with uh, EASA's rulemaking. We understand that there's further review uh, in work now, and we expect that that process will be continuing and we will actively engage with that group to make sure that it will align with our standards once those are, are finalized. So the important message here is um, SMS is an aspect of how we manage safety. It is not the entirety of it, but it's important to make sure that we're approaching it from a standpoint of uh, aligning with uh, international activities broadly. Next slide, please. Now, where are we with regard to the rulemaking? So I'll just make a couple of comments. Um, one of the things that we have learned is to enhance our effectivity and to be better positioned for implementing an important change like safety management systems, it's important for the FAA to be learning with the industry. We've had experiences in the past where we've undertaken a large rulemaking activity or a large system change, and I think found that we're at different points in our learning, and it's important that we be learning as the industry learns. So one aspect to foster that uh, has been the activity to promote a voluntary SMS implementation. It provides industry a space to be learning, to be preparing, to be exploring and getting ready for SMS. And likewise, it also provides an opportunity for our employees to be taking that same journey as we get ready for SMS. These activities are intended to minimize the differences uh, in, in the final implementation of SMS under Part 5. Um, the prior panel spoke to the approach that EASA has taken relative to DOA and POA organizations. Within the FA, we've taken a slightly different approach, but I think it's built on similar principles. The implementation of Part 5 enables the FAA to have a common set of standards relative to SMS that then can be the basis by which it is applied to different types of certificates and responsibilities. So to date, the FAA has implemented SMS for air carrier operators, uh, part 121 air carriers, 
also for airports. Uh, we are in the process of rulemaking now for our design and manufacturing organization, also extending or proposing to extend uh, that SMS set of requirements to other um, operators. So part five gives us the ability to work from a common set of framework and then apply it into different domains, kind of a similar objective, but a different approach than what EASA had taken. Um, additionally, in terms of the, the focus on, on learning together, uh, we also, if we could go back one slide, please. We've also been um, involved in the SMS design and manufacturing focus group. That's an activity that has been underway now for a couple of years, and it's, a, it's an active collaboration between industry and authorities and standards groups, recognizing that everybody has something to contribute, everybody has something to learn, and very much promote a sharing and a collaboration environment where people can come together in an informal setting at different levels of knowledge and understand how they can benefit from other people's experience. There are no dumb questions. It can be an opportunity where people can just come in and start to engage and learn. And in fact, I think yesterday, there was another um, uh, in-person meeting of the design and manufacturing focus groups. They're hosting a series of meetings uh, monthly, uh, virtually, and then also finding opportunities where there's an opportunity to come together. So we recognize the value of that. And all of these activities then are, are contributing to our knowledge and putting forth what we think is, is a good proposal for um, design and manufacturing groups that was published in January. Um, each authority you recognize has a different way of developing rules. The FAA has unique requirements that we have to fulfill. Uh, the, the proposal was published in January the comment period closed in April. Um, for those that commented, I wanna say thank you. Um, I think the comments were serious, They're, they were thoughtful. I think they recognized areas where industry felt certain things needed to be reconsidered, where industry felt that there would be certain challenges um, and some additional thought or um, consideration should be given. I'm not at liberty today to talk about the specifics of what the final rule will be and how it may be different from the proposal, but I will say the final rule is progressing uh, internally and it will be published in 2024. Next slide, please. Okay, so a little bit about our final rule implementation. Um, as I mentioned, um, we very much appreciate the comments that were provided. Um, I would say that there were a number of recurring themes that were reflected in the comments, um, interest from uh, foreign manufacturers relative to applicability of SMS for their products. There was interest in um, the requirements and the submission timelines and the context related to those kinds of activities. There was interest in uh, revising uh, details relative to the system description and then I think lastly, um, there was one other area that I'm trying to recall, but very thoughtful comments. And I guess my own reflection is um, I've been involved in SMS activities and explorations over a period of time. And when I look back at my um, interactions, both within the FAA and with industry, I'm really encouraged to see that over a period of you know, five to 10 years, there's really been, I think, a maturing and a recognition that SMS does have a place within our broader set of systems, and it can be done successfully and done to complement how we manage safety. I think when some of our exploration activities began 10 years ago, um, the thoughts looked very different. I think there were some that felt that just by definition, whatever industry had done in the past, by definition, because of its enormous scale and depth of processes and procedures, that that must inherently be what was envisioned with SMS. How could you envision anything more that would be a new requirement, a new process, a new procedure? That was one perspective. I think there were other perspectives that were more open to learning. And then there were just a lot, I think, that were very cautious to try to understand how SMS might be introduced. 
I'm encouraged to say that I think um, through all of our activities, the whole industry I think has progressed and we're in a better place relative to SMS going forward. And I think the comments reflect that. As I mentioned, there's a number of engagement activities that we have underway uh, to support uh, industry and our preparation for the final rule. We're developing internal guidance. That'll be the guidance that we use to help uh, with our own employees relative to implementation of the part five requirements. We're developing training for our workforce to make sure that they're knowledgeable with regard to SMS requirements uh, and how that will work within a design and manufacturing organization. We're developing advisory circular material that will aid or assist industry in their SMS implementation. We're actively participating uh, in the SMS uh, design and manufacturing focus groups and also the activities in the future to revise the SM0001 um, standard. And then also um, maintaining and promoting our voluntary SMS program. Uh, and I will mention that we have five companies that have been accepted formally into our voluntary program. Over the last year, the number of companies that have engaged or come forward to express interest in participating in the voluntary program has grown rather rapidly. And over the last year, it's, it's nearly doubled. So we're encouraged with what industry is showing uh, in terms of their interest, and we expect um, that type of progress to continue uh, going forward. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. So, so we'll take a few questions, but we won't show them on the screen because they are quite at the bottom, those which are really uh, with an international touch. So I, will, I will read them. So maybe we can go back to the question from Stefan about uh, interoperability, mutual recognition. There are many questions around this theme, whether the BASA will, will apply and so on. So, so maybe I, I can ask to Jeff first and maybe to TCCA colleagues mm -hmm. to report about ongoing discussions in the CMT. So thank you, Gregory. And, you know, I guess my perspective is um, SMS is not a solution to every problem that we have. It's, it's going to provide us a, a, a way to deal with risks that have inherently been in the system, but probably not understood or not recognized in, until we've kind of stepped back and realized, you know, where, where there are unique risks that aren't covered by other standards. So I think my approach is we're seeing enough development now of different authorities and understanding what is considered within scope and outside the scope of their SMS, I think we'll, at a, at a leadership level, be able to start discussing a little bit more how we want to handle those differences. Uh, there are certainly differences between EASA and FAA, and I suspect uh, Transport Canada, ANAC, and other authorities that have work underway. I guess what I would say is because SMS is a part of a broader system, I want to make sure that we really carefully consider how we look at the differences. Um, a lot of work has gone into trying to harmonize standards, airworthiness standards between authorities. A lot of work has gone into trying to streamline uh, the acceptance of our products and the ability to move products internationally and to streamline the validation process. What I think is really important is that we don't look at differences relative to SMS standards as another way to complicate how we accept each other's products. Now, I'm not speaking for any authority. I'm, I just am trying to recognize, I think, the opportunity for all of us to look at how these differences apply. And ultimately, um, there may be different approaches between the authorities between what's done through a, a required implementation and maybe aspects that will be done under a hybrid where it's a combination of a requirement and an encouragement for companies to voluntarily comply. I think the important thing is we need to look at the outcomes and that's ultimately what level of maturity do we have with regard to implementing SMS and is it achieving its intended outcome? And so to me, it's very important that we not look at this in isolation, but rather we look at it in consideration 
of everything else that we've done to try to align our systems internationally. Thank you, Jeff. Xavier? Yes, good morning, everyone. So from Canada point of view, so I think we're trying to align also with our uh, partner, international partners, and uh, for example, also similar to the FAA, also in EASA, we recognize also SM001 also as an international standard. And uh, I think this is a step already in moving in the right direction. So there is not only one way to do things. It's not the Canadian way. It's not the FAA way. I think is the uh, industry also way is very important there. So we want to recognize that. Um, we're having also discussions also uh, with the industry about the best approach and what they see could work or not work. Uh, so we're taking that also into consideration uh, with our uh, proposal. Thank you. Dylan, anything to add? Uh, yeah, and the, the discussions that we've had with industry, one of the common um, comments that we receive is it doesn't make sense for industry to have three or four different approaches to SMS. So. Um, as part of the working groups that we're participating in is we're looking at the existing tools of other regulatory bodies to better support industry to ensure that um, we can leverage existing tools where applicable um, to because at the end of the day, as everyone said, SMS is SMS and um, the outcome is what's important. So uh, we want to support industry as best we can. And um, yeah, the, so uh, with us, we're, we're still in the rulemaking uh, procedures as well. So we are taking comments. So don't uh, hesitate to reach out to uh, to your counterparts at Transport Canada to, to provide those, whether it's Xavier or myself, and um, we'll definitely consider everything. Thank you. Thank you. If I may add from EASA perspective, um, it, it's an area which uh, has been uh, high on, on the, in our industry's agenda. So we are fully aware that it's a critical point for many of you. Um, it's been discussed with the CMT partners uh, for years now. The difficulty is that the, uh, the level of progression is not synchronized. So when we uh, addressed that only a few days ago uh, in Brazil, there was a CMT meeting. Um, we found out that it was still a bit premature because the, the partners are still working on their rules. So we, we know it's a very critical point. I think every authority committed on the principle to avoid any overlap or duplication, but how this will be organized and, and formalized still requires a little bit of work between the authorities. So maybe we can, we had many other questions, but I would like maybe before we take them to have the colleagues from TCCA and um, should leave a bit of time at the end for additional questions. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to start by uh, thanking IASA for uh, this opportunity to present our work on uh, SMS today. Um, maybe next up, yeah, thank you. As you can see on the slide, so we currently have SMS requirement for airlines, uh, uh, private operators, air traffic services, airports, and uh, approved maintenance organization performing uh, maintenance on aircraft operated by airlines. Um, we are currently modernizing also our uh, SMS regulatory framework, um, and we're going to uh, expand it to uh, SMS, uh, so our SMS to uh, Canadian design and manufacturing organizations. So we are also working on um, notice of uh, proposed amendment and uh, it is expected to be published before the end of 2023. So Canada and IASA, we have a uh, requirement for uh, QMS. So um, sector in Canada currently have this uh, requirement uh, uh, embedded in their SMS regulations, while uh, some other ones have it as a standalone requirement. So this uh, approach will continue as part of Canada SMS uh, modernization initiative. So um, I'm bringing this up because um, we believe it is important that uh, the uh, QMS and internal audit uh, information uh, feeds into the uh, SMS. Also, we have a uh, voluntary SMS program 
that uh, was put in place to give uh, the design and manufacturing sector uh, organization an option to develop uh, an officially uh, recognized SMS prior to the uh, uh, coming into force of the new regulations. So we recognize, I mentioned earlier, the uh, SM001 international standard. Um, and uh, we, regarding uh, implementation also, we are proposing a 24 to 36 month uh, implementation period for new applicants and a 12 to 18 month uh, for organization that already have a approved SMS. So the applicability for Canadian design and manufacturing organizations has been drafted uh, with reference to the advisory and rulemaking committee uh, report that was published by the FA on SMS. Uh, so that goes to the earlier comment that we are trying to, to harmonize as much as we can with our regulatory partners. And this was strongly encouraged by uh, our industry stakeholders within Canada. Uh, so for manufacturing organizations, um, the SMS will apply for applicants or holders of uh, Canadian manufacturing certificates. And we're currently in discussions about uh, what the, the scope will be. Uh, so because the rulemaking is still um, uh, being developed, um, but I, I do want to share what we're investigating right now. And uh, so we're looking into the applicability being for those manufacturers that um, are supporting uh, type certificate holders, TSOs and STCs for aeronautical products um, that um, could directly prevent continued safe flight and or landing should they fail. Uh, so this would be applicable to any manufacturer uh, within Canada that has a certificate, regardless of the state of design of the, uh, the de design approval. Uh, additionally, for design organizations, uh, SMS will be applicable to um, the applicants or holders of type certificates issued under the CARS, uh, Canadian TSOs, and STCs, both of which, um, uh, in respect of aeronautical products, could directly prevent continued safe flight and landing should they fail. Uh, so once again, um, one of the things that we're investigating is how to manage this and uh, what we're taking a look at currently with industry is the actual design standards. So for example, 525-1309. Uh, so aeronautical products, specifically the TSOs and STCs, uh, where those design approvals have a significant impact or could, could result in catastrophic or potential failure um, as a result of, the, um, um, of any failure. Um, the, the other thing to note, um, as I'm sure uh, in our review know, uh, the, the oversight and certification activities within Canada for maintenance and design organizations is tr uh, traditionally split into two branches. Uh, so one thing that we're doing is we are, so myself, uh, I work within National Aircraft Certification, and uh, we're collaborating with our maintenance and manufacturing division uh, to ensure that we have one surveillance program for SMS as opposed to two separate ones, um, as well as the certification. So we're, like I said, we're taking a look at other tools that have been developed by our international partners, uh, but we want to ensure that when we're conducting oversight on SMS, it's one program. So it's SMS is applicable to the entire organization. So you can expect to have three or four different SMS surveillance activities throughout the year, because that would be significantly disruptive. And um, yeah, so we are collaborating with those. Um, and the other thing I wanted to share is a common uh, theme yesterday, during yesterday's session was um, the amount of work and the uh, the amount of work that industry is having and the difficulty that the regulators are having to support that. So we're recognizing the amount of work that is going to be introduced um, into Canada for once the SMS is implemented. So we are currently um, growing. Uh, our divisions in order to support SMS. So that includes the original certification and implementation, as well as the continued oversight. And um, th so those those activities are underway in anticipation of the 2025 cut-in date. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. So our last uh, presentation for, for this uh, panel will be from Nacho, from uh, AESA Spain. So Nacho, you have the floor. And you can pronounce your, your name properly for the education of everyone. Well, my name is 
Thank you very much. My name is, if it is, is Ignacio, but you can call me Nacho, it's no problem. Uh, <laughs> first of all, I'd like to thank EASA for inviting us to this panel. I had a tournament this week in, in Asia, but I've come here to... <laughs> so, uh, as you know, uh, SMS uh, rules implementing are applicable for us in March. We've told it before, we have two years. Uh, we have two years for to, to finalize the process. But nowadays, after six months, only six months, we have also only two Spanish POAs that have applied officially for the for the approval of this of the new change. So what did I study do when the, the new rules started to apply? Firstly, we decided to the to hold a meeting with all our organizations, trying to explain and then the process we have to follow. Secondly, according to the to the material guide published by EASA, we published another material guide focused on three main points. Firstly, how they, they had to work with procedures responding to old rules, but according to new rules. It's a difficult situation, so it, we try to understand, to explain then how to do it. Secondly, how to manage changes in this process in the implementation of the SMS was finalized. And third, after the previous experience we had had with another processes, similar processes, we decided to establish a recommended final date for the for the application of the implementation of, this, of SMS. Why did we do this? Uh, I will ask you here if it's enough time two years. It seems it's enough time, but if you go to the... But our experience, you know, uh, recent experience with the implementation of new KMOS, it was a similar process was that in the last two, three months, many of the organizations came up with the application to implement the SMS. What happened in that case is our inspectors had extra work. The organization will have extra work to try to improve and, and, and get the final results. So now we want to assure that the result will be okay. So we want that the organization have time enough to solve all the questions that we, as, as, uh, we as authority indicate them to, to improve. So we, got, we have given this, then this gap saying, if you're acting this time, it's nearly sure you will be approved in time. If you do, do it later, we'll see if it's possible or not. That's our decision because of the experience we gain with, with the KMOS. And with KMOS, we also learned another topics as we found the, you know, most of our KMOS uh, have an um, SMS uh, common with uh, AOCs. They had a long experience with the SMS in, in, in AOCs. But uh, one of the main problems we found it was people were very expert in operations, but they haven't brought people from airworthiness to identify hazards, to analyze risk, to mitigate. So it was, and we still have it, we have been working with KMO for two years, and we still find problems with, with the mitigations uh, data and the analyzing of hazard and risk. So mainly we think it's a problem with the experience of the person who are working in the SMS in this, in this uh, aspect. And of course, we've been saying it before and we'll, it, I suppose it will be said during all the, the, the day, we we'll have to be with you. It's, we know it's a long journey, I think Jesper said before, when we approve the, the, this SMS, we know it's not a mature system, it's not a, an effective system. We know it is, and we know it, it works, but we know we have, we'll need a lot of years to make it an effective and mature system. That way, as we say, we as our authority must work together with you, must we, we'll be with you trying to make this process to be the most secure for all possible. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd like to talk to you also about organizations which, which have several approvals. Uh, some of, of our organization, I told you before, it, our experience now is with IUC plus CAMO, but one of our applicants now is asking to have a common SM, SMS for KMO, 145, and POA. So this in, this will bring us to different problems. First of all, from the point of view of organization, though the SMS is a common SMS, our experience tells us it's like a 
common SMS, but with two velocities. You know, EUC, or now it may be KMOS, they, they have been working for four, three, year, three, four years, have an experience, and they are part, they have, they can analyze very well things, but maybe POA, when it starts, <clears throat> it will be like a, a step behind them. So it's important, as I told before, the experience of the people who, who is part of the, of the group of the SMS. From the point of view of, of us as authority, I can tell you, we have discussions with our uh, operas, operations department nearly every, every, every week. We've been working with them for three, four year, years in standardization, but it's difficult, it's different rules, different points of view, and we know now we have to work also with initial and continuing airworthiness at the same time. It's a hard, tough work for the authority also because you don't see it, but internally we'll have many, many discussions trying to focus and to align to say to the, you, the organizations, to all the same, the same things, not to have different opinions. And sometimes we don't get it. And as a decision in this process, I also decided with our organizations that are only uh, supervised by, I thought, to, those organizations with us, a com with have a common SMS, we have made their, they have the same dates for their oversight plans. So they start the oversight plan and finish at the same time. So the final meetings with, the, with their managers and showing the results of these two days is together with all the, the approvals at the same time. That's a decision we've taken, I, and it's, uh, I, I, we're trying that it works. Um, that's all by my side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nacho. So uh, as you see, it's quite interesting to compare the, the, the level of advancement between regions is a bit different, but it's, uh, we see a lot of value in exchanging among authorities. There were a few questions about, about this area. Do you, do you communicate among authorities? Yes, we do. And this panel is just an illustration of this dialogue. So we have about uh, 10 minutes left. Uh, there are approximately 50 five zero questions in the, in the Slido. <laughs> But many of them uh, are not directly relevant for the panelists, so we will not uh, lose them, but they will keep for later. So our slide administrator, Vladimir, uh, if you can show the slide, has, has started to, um, to filter them. M maybe while we are putting them on the screen, I, I can ask one question, which I've seen in the chat coming in many questions, uh, about the scope. Um, so many of you are, are asking, why is the scope different? So, so maybe uh, in particular for, for the colleagues who are now working on the rulemaking uh, aspects, can you say a few words about the dynamics which uh, led you to the decisions you made already or the ones you are about to make regarding the scope of the SMS applicability? Maybe we can start with TCCA and then Jeff might, might complement. Um, there is, uh, we had a lot of discussions with industry and uh, so our scope, we already have uh, quite a few organizations that can have SMS. We also have a voluntary SMS available in Canada. But the industry was uh, pushing also for us to have SMS uh, requirement for uh, design and manufacturing sector. So we put it as a priority. We divided our um, regulatory uh, SMS modernization into two packages. The first one is uh, the expansion to the design and manufacturing sector, and the second one uh, will be the expansion of the uh, to other uh, sectors. So the second package is supposed to start at the beginning of a year, of a new year. Uh, we haven't had discussion yet uh, with the industry on that one, but will be part of the, the beginning of that phase. So uh, the same like uh, we have done with package one, we will have discussion again with the industry to see what's the best approach and see how we can be impacted. Thanks. Maybe Jeff from the FAA perspective. Yeah, so, uh, you know, relative to the, the rulemaking process, each authority has a different system that they need to work under and within the FAA, there's a couple of principles that are really important, one of which is rulemaking is a public process. You know, we, we need to engage the community that's going to be affected by the rule and, and understand their perspectives and try to account for that in the process of developing the rule. Another principle is that we need to look at the cost and the benefit of the rule. And so while I think the FA can look at 
SMS and broadly see the benefits. I can look at almost any segment of the industry and see opportunities where there are benefits that I think uh, could be achieved with SMS implementation. That perspective doesn't necessarily fulfill our rulemaking responsibilities. So I think we are, we are taking a cautious and incremental approach to SMS. We know that there's going to be a lot of learning that's still coming forward. And I think we'll continue to reevaluate whether other segments of the industry we think are at a point where we could proceed with rulemaking, which again, it, there are certain provisions that we have to go through within the FAA that, that in fact are different than other authorities. So I saw there was a question in here about one, four, five organizations. I can tell you that the FAA is actively looking at what would be required to extend our proposal to 145 organizations. The fact that we're having those discussions and actively um, exchanging what the considerations are doesn't mean that we're ready to do it. It doesn't mean that we have the provisions in place that would be required to fill, fulfill our rulemaking process, but we are actively looking uh, where we are with SMS. We're trying to take an incremental approach. We know that more learning is going to come and, uh, and while we may not have an SMS requirement in place for every segment of the industry, I, I think that provision to encourage industry to continue under a voluntary provision is, is a way that we can kind of balance these considerations. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I will give the floor to Yuri because there are many questions about why the scope was defined as it was uh, at EASA. We don't want to escape that question uh, uh, either. So Yuri, maybe if you can Shed some light on this. Uh, from EASA side, uh, we had the review of IKO Annex 19, and as mentioned a bit before, uh, our reading was that uh, it is more toward the organizational uh, view of safety. So we looked at our structure, organization, and as you know, we have a system with different organizations, so approved organizations, non-approved organization, and the direction in which we went was to target the so-called approved organization. So we are not looking directly at the product, but the type of organization. And of course, when uh, the organization is approved, so it is entitled to uh, work on certain products. But initially, we looked really at the organization. That, that's the little difference on our side. Thank you, Yuri. So, so I think, uh, Vlad, this answers um, most of the questions which are on the screen for now. There were some questions about uh, guidance material for self-assessment. And uh, there was a question in particular for IKO. Um, Manush, do you recall that question about, yeah, so. Maybe you can record the question and, and provide the answer. Thanks. Yes, if the question was not revised or um, maybe uh, superseded by another question, I think there were some comments about the ICAO gap analysis tool, which is a checklist um, for um, states um, and organizations to identify their gap in terms of where they are and where, where they need to be in terms of Annex 19 provisions. So there were questions about why it's outdated, why it's not uh, mirroring the requirements of the latest edition of the safety management manual. Uh, very valid point. Uh, the, re the reason I can give you is that we went through some organizational restructuring about four years ago. Uh, we lost some resources. We lost the capability to keep that uh, checklist uh, up to date. There was also an issue where we were getting um, some input from practitioners who were going online using that uh, self-assessment gap analysis tool, providing their input into the ICAO system, but um, our platform was not able to take the input and do something meaningful and valuable with it. And as I said, 
um, I know it sounds like a repetitive excuse, but lack of resources and the lack of capability to kind of keep that going. Uh, we're at a point where we are updating the gap analysis tool. There are efforts to not only align uh, the questions with what's in Annex 19 and the latest guidance material, but also to align some of those questions with the protocol questions that our colleagues in the USOP audit program ask. So that uh, for practitioners who use that gap analysis tool, it has multiple benefits. It's not just for information to see where the gaps are, but also to identify what provisions they're complying with and what, what they still need to do. I think there was another element to the question, which was why would we need to use maybe the ICAO checklist versus the EASA checklist? Um, these are different tools that aim to probably address the same needs. Um, they're not mandatory to you. So depending on who you are, what you need to do, and which set of, of tools and resources, questions, checklists apply to you, there is, I don't think there's really a mandate to say use ICAOs versus uh, IASA. So um, if if you see one set of questions and, and, and set of checklists um, catering better to your needs, then by all means use that. But the idea is not to duplicate, but to supplement each other. So I'm, I, I can't comment without knowing exactly what's in the IASA management system assessment tool, which is, I think, the checklist that was being referred to in the question. Um, but if there's no duplication, there is probably one is as, as, as good as the other one. Um, also considering the caveat that our IKEA checklist is not quite up to date at this point. So I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Manoush. I think we are running out of time for additional questions. Uh, Juan Anton will uh, add a, a word to Yuri's point on the scope as it was defined in the EU environment. Yeah, I, to complement what Yuri was saying, why we have applied SMS to all the organizations, is also something coming from the basic regulation. Because the basic regulation says that for the different type of organizations, and there is a clause specific to each type of organization, the organization has to implement a system to manage risk with an impact on safety. So this is coming from the basic regulation. We have followed the same approach also for information security management systems. So we are applying both requirements to all the organizations which are approved. There are a few exemptions for the lower end and of course the non-approved organizations are out. So yes, Ciro Pironi, the team leader, I wanted also to mention that the size and complexity of the organization is anyhow considered at the implementation level. So even if SMS is applicable to all approved organization, we take due consideration of the size and complexity of the organization. Thank you, Ciro and Juan. I think the question of proportionality is a theme which is close to many participants' heart and it will be addressed in uh, upcoming uh, sessions. So I think we, we, we are running out of time. I would like to thank very much all the speakers for their views and perspective and insight into, into SMS. There are many other very interesting questions which we could not take in, within this panel, but the good news is it's now coffee break time and the speakers are available. So maybe I, I can support uh, Arenia in inviting some of you to go to the room Comet. You can see it from here. So there are two places for coffee break. So you, you can... Uh, and, and the coffee break is until half past 11. So please be back in the room a few minutes before half past 11. Thanks a lot for your question and attention and thanks for the, for the speaker. Welcome back. It was good to see so many interactions now during the coffee break and all coming with this as a continuation of the discussion that we had before the coffee. We are ready now for the next slot, uh, which is a panel with the title, as you see here on your screen, on the screens here in the room, and on the WebEx, Benefits and Challenges of SMS Implementation in Large Organizations. The moderator of the panel will be Pietro Barbagallo from ENAC, Italy. Uh, I give the floor to Pietro to say he is the head of International Cooperation Unit in ENAC, at ENAC. And I give the floor to, to Pietro for a few words about yourself. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Eugenia. And uh, first of all, thank you very much to the agency for uh, making this workshop available, not only to those here, but uh, to the several organizations that uh, in the other member states are working for complying with these new requirements. Um, as is in this slide, I started to work in the Italian Civil Aviation Authority in 1991, so last century. And um, I work uh, in several fields. Uh, and regarding uh, to be here today, I am the responsibility to implement at the national level the EU regulation on production organization and to support uh, the awardness inspector uh, working at the regional office. In Italy, we have 62 production organization, uh, manufacturing helicopters, aircraft, uh, equipment components. So we are quite involved in this uh, dramatic change. Um, but I, I had also the opportunity recently to work on uh, cybersecurity, for example. And cybersecurity is another challenge that will come after that of the SMS. So good luck to everyone. I appreciated the, the presentation from the IESA before, because we all, is not only a matter of the organization, but also from the authority perspective, uh, are trying to do our best to make this big change smooth. So the word to, to my colleague, and I start with Marie-Sophie Vincent. Good morning, uh, Marie-Sophie Vincent, Airbus Helicopter. I am the Aviation Safety Manager for Operation. I joined this new position uh, the 1st January of this year, and previously I worked uh, for 10 years at Airworthiness Office. Okay, thank you, Marie-Sophie, and the, word to, the floor to Al. Yeah, good, good morning, and uh, thank you to Yasa for this excellent uh, workshop. Just a few uh, uh, comments about my background in SMS. I had the opportunity and the privilege to serve as the uh, uh, industry chair on the SMS Aviation Rulemaking Committee that eventually recommended, made a recommendation to the FAA that turned into Part 5. I then had the opportunity at American Airlines, the largest airline in the world, to lead the SMS implementation over the course of 10 years. And then in uh, 2020, I had the opportunity to come to Boeing to really jumpstart our SMS implementation there at Boeing. I've done that for a year or so, and then handed that off to um, Dan Freeman, who's also here. And Dan, you might just wave. Uh, if you see Dan, certainly you have any questions, you could ask Dan or myself. So looking forward to the uh, conference and the workshop, and thank you. Please, Stefan. Yes. yes, so I'm Stefan Boussou. <laughs> I'm the head of uh, Airwatches Operation and also the SMS Officer for Engineering and DOA at Airbus. And uh, today I'm not representing only Airbus, I'm, uh, I'm uh, the coordinator of the ISD SMS facilitation group, which was generated following the, uh, the pilot phase for SMS and ISMS launch uh, at DOA side, where we, on industry side, we, we decided to continue between us to have a kind of facilitation to exchange and uh, continue to take the coordination on the DOA side. And there is another group which has been uh, generated since that for the ISMS. So my background that was uh, some the SMS officer uh, since 2018. But before I was in the certification, I uh, hold various roles. I started in 1990 in the DGSC, the DGA, as a French uh, structure specialist uh, working for the DGSC being member of various uh, GA team in certification and validation. So uh, I've uh, made the TAP certification of the 330, 340, part of the GA team at that time, uh, making some validation exercise on Boeing, Goldstream. And then I uh, joined Airbus in uh, 1999, still on the certification, and uh, I host various roles, such as certification manager, even uh, DCS, TV on some of the topics and then uh, take the lead of the awardness operation, the transverse activity of all the process, method, or rulemaking screening, uh, supporting the Office of Awardness. And maybe just as an hobby, uh, just to explain the risk management. Uh, in my past, when I was in Paris, I was a part of a circus and was making flying trapeze, where the lesson, the lesson is that it's important that when you are practicing such a sport, 
you need to learn to fail first before making a success. So one word from my side before giving you the floor again. So thank you to Pietro, Marie-Sophie, Al, Stefan for being here. Uh, a quick reminder from our side on the Slido. And then, yes, we are ready to continue. Pietro, please. Yes, thank you, Eugenia. And uh, with this panel, we continue our journey. We start today with uh, the regulation, why SMS is important, uh, then we follow it uh, with the presentation of, from the uh, aviation authorities. And now we are in the phase of the implementation and we have the opportunity to have these two global manufacturers in this panel plus a representative of several manufacturers. So the floor to Marie-Sophie. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so we have 10 minutes, so I prepare a very short presentation. First of all, I would like to share why uh, Airbus Helicopter can be considered as a large organization. So Airbus Helicopter is a worldwide company. At PO level, we have nine industrial seats, Albacete, Paris Le Bourget, Marignan, Donovert, and so on. At Airbus Helicopter, we have an important workforce, more than 20,000 employees. 50% of the employees are working at operation. And today, we have an aviation safety network around 60 persons. At Airbus Helicopter, we have a lot of stakeholders, operators, civil and military, authorities. At PO level, we have one civil authority, and five military authorities. And we have also a lot of suppliers and subcontractors. At operation, we have 55% of our industrial activity that are subcontracted. Finally, Airbus Helicopter is a rotorcraft global leader. We manage all the helicopter chain value, conception and development, industry and production, support and services. For that, we have several uh, approval, PO, DO, MO. Airbus Helicopter has the ambition to decrease by half the number of accidents with zero technical contribution under Airbus, uh, Airbus uh, responsibility by 2028. And SMS is one brick to achieve uh, this uh, ambition. Airbus Helicopter has started to deploy the SMS, SMS since 2018, and I propose to share some concrete examples at POA level. So, even if Airbus Helicopter is working since a long time on safety, SMS provides us an applicable, an applicable regulation. Following ICAO and now Part 21 uh, requirement, Airbus Helicopter has built a common referential, implementing a systematic and standardized approach to safety risk management and improving the efficiency of existing process. For example, at operation, we have now a single safety policy, a single just and fair culture, a just and fair policy, and we have cascade at operation, dedicated safety objective. We have a common risk methodology with a unique tool. At Airbus Helicopter, we use safety cube with the bowtie methodology. We have also worked on the standardization of the safety training, safety learning path. We have also put in place some canal to communicate on our safety issue and on the lesson learned all around the world. We have also proposed uh, some initiative in order to work at operation on the hazard identification. For example, we have today some times where we can have open exchanges with workers in the shop floor. But at POA, we have also to manage challenges. 
As I explained, we have industrial seats all, all around the world. So one of the, the challenge is to handle the local specificity. We have to take into account some local law. We have to take into account culture and mindset. We are facing multi languages. We have also to take into account of the diversity of our employees at operation. With education background, they are different. You do not communicate, you do not train in the same way a blue collar or an accountable manager. One an important challenge is for, is for sure the onboarding of the interested party. We have a lot of suppl suppliers and subcontractors. Some of them are not under EASA regulation. For them, deploying a SMS is clearly, has clearly a cost impact. We have also to think how to manage confidentiality issue. But to do that, one another important challenge is to avoid increased complexity of our management system. When we deal with management, we also deal with people and organization. At PUA, at PUA, we improve operational safety by considering organization and human factor. But include organization and human factor could lead to longer analysis phase and corrective measure implementation. At Airbus Helicopter, we use MEDA methodology, MEDA process, so maintenance error decision field. We sometimes perform some interview. To do that, we need qualified people. We also need to take into account that person that will be interviewed not feel like finger pointed, but part of an improvement process based on the lesson learned. We have also to take into account by considering human and organization factor could have impacting measures. For example, training needs to tackle the issue, change of organization. SMS rely on a positive safety culture mindset. At POA level, it's clearly an opportunity to empower our employees, not only by a training, but clearly a way to behave. Continuously, SMS help us to improve safety, but also other process. But to do that, we have to conduct a culture mindset change. We have to move from a non-conformity culture in a risk culture. We have to move from a reactive mode to a proactive mode. At production level, we are more in a short time win. We need to deliver. And we have to now uh, think on long-term action, take time on the long-term action. But how to measure the efficiency of the SMS? I speak about long-term action with a lot of inertia how to ensure that it works, that it will work. And to do that, we need an aviation safety network operating. So people integrated in the shop floor with dedicated time, budget to perform avi aviation safety uh, activity with selected competencies. So it's just a relevant example that I could detail after if needed. But to conclude, at Airbus Helicopter, we are deeply convinced by the added value of the SMS to accelerate airworthiness and safety improvement. SMS is not a revolution, but the journey is long. We have a lot of challenges. But with this kind of workshop, with all the open exchanges that we can have, and for sure with the support of our supplier and the support of IASA, we, we are sure to, that it, it helps us to keep momentum. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Marie-Sophie, the, and your presentation quite interesting. There are several aspects that I hope will be considered for question. Ah, the floor is yours.
Hey, good morning again. Um, let me really start out and focus on the challenges in a large organization. Having done this at the largest airline and now at Boeing, and Boeing, we just sent out our SMS training for this year to 175,000 employees, which tells you the size of the organization. So the first challenge is, do you do this at an enterprise level or do you break up your SMS into various functions, various business units? And that's a very important decision. Some of the things that helped us decide, if you go to the next uh, slide, please, is this particular diagram. And I think it's important to always refer to the, an appropriate AMC so that you're just not making it up. I've seen over the years people, when it comes to SMS, everybody's got their own idea about how SMS should work. So I would urge everybody to always go to a particular AMC, whether it's 001, 9927, or the actual rule or advisory circular. It's very important. This particular diagram is an AIA standard, 9927. And I think it's very important because we talk about how do you integrate SMS into your existing management systems? Based on this diagram, we see SMS within Boeing as an integrating framework that encompasses both design, build, and operate. And it really looks at those systems that are there, the compliance assurance system, your quality assurance system and from conformity, and your continued operational safety. And SMS is looking and assuring that those programs are effective. That's how we see it integrating. So if you, if you from that perspective, SMS is really crossing the entire value stream of that organization. So that's one consideration. The next consideration, and the next slide here, at the FA's advisory circuit on SMS has a couple appendixes in the back with two particular flow charts. And when you follow those flow charts through, what you come to is a question that says, does the organization have a board of directors? And if it does, the accountable executive, the one accountable executive, in the SMS is the CEO. And then you go, you go to the next flow chart and ask a series of questions to validate that decision. And it says, does the person have ultimate control over human resources, financial resources, the operations of the, of the airline, and ultimately the safe operation of the organization? And if they do, you've selected the right person. And if you think about it, SMS, in the definition of SMS in many cases always talks about it is a top-down organizational system to manage risk, top-down. So who you have or how you set up the top of the organization is a key question that you have to answer to, to make sure that you're off to a good start. So in Boeing's case, that was the CEO. At American Airlines, that was the CEO, one accountable executive. Now, that authority from the accountable executive would be delegated, but again, it's that top-down approach that's so important. When you have the support from the very top, and that's a priority at the very top, it makes everything easy. Having done this in, at the airlines when SMS was in its infancy, it was difficult because there wasn't an understanding of SMS. At Boeing, there's a, there's a definite understanding and a very top-down uh, support for the SMS, which again makes it easy. So I would encourage you to ans answer those questions as you start into your SMS implementation. The, uh, so when, once you do that and you make that decision, there's some real benefits I think that you should focus on. When you have one SMS across the enterprise, you can have one safety policy and one set of objectives that across the entire organization. And that's important. Um, safety risk management. You know, what you have there is you can come up with common tools and processes, again, that when people move around in the organization, they see those same processes and that same familiarity with the safety policy, with the various tools that are used. And I'll give you some examples here as we move along. Safety assurance. You develop a set of KPIs for the various businesses, but all those KPIs are managed and looked at and analyzed in a similar fashion to understand whether the processes are being effective as they were um, intended to be. Safety promotion. I mentioned that we just rolled out our training across the, in, across the entire enterprise. 
everybody received the same SMS training, all 175,000 employees that is mandatory to be taken by the end of the year. So again, everybody's on the same page, and I can't emphasize enough, if people move around in your organization, you want them to be familiar and not have to learn SMS again. It just becomes a very common way of managing. There, this current CEO at American Airlines, I love the way his, what he would say about SMS when he's asked. He simply says, SMS is how we work. You build it into how you do your work every day. Next slide. Yeah. So th this is an interesting slide. When you look over on the left side, what you see is a lot of things and processes were there around product safety. Those have always been there at Boeing, and probably you have those too. What SMS adds is over on the right side, all those things around the environment, around the system, are you applying SMS principles to those? So when you're changing a system, revising a system, identifying new hazards, all those triggers that are for race safety risk management have to be applied not just in the product side, but over on the right side there um, around the system. And you're really asking some fundamental questions. We've always asked the question, is the product operating as intended? Those are your safety review boards. But now we're also asking the question, is the system as we envisioned it operating that way? And that's where you start to learn some real things about you know, how your products are being operated, new hazards within that environment that add a lot of color and make your SMS much more robust. All that information flows into the center there into various review boards, both from the product side and from the system side, you have a very robust process of safety assurance. You can also see the common tools. We use Bowtie a lot. Bowtie is a very effective tool to understand your system. And where to apply that is really in the system analysis and description, which is the first step of safety risk management. So using Bowtie to understand the various controls that are in place, and understanding where they're effective is that first step then as you start into your safety risk management process. Common risk matrices, again, people moving across the organization, this is very important. And again, down on the bottom right, you see a common safety policy, which the accountable executive owns. So it's how the accountable executive drives their vision of safety and accountability down through the organization. And having one, is very important. The, and finally, on, as soon as the next slide, slow. The last bullet there, it provides SMS across the entire organization, provides a very effective safety governance and leadership structure. And if you go to the next slide, please. Every organization should be able to, to really con develop this construct. How does data flow up through the organization based on risk? At the various lowest levels you there on the left, you can see low risk stays and has worked at the very lowest levels. And then as risk goes up, that risk, that safety issue is elevated. And eventually it gets up to the enterprise level. At, at Boeing that happens every other month where it reaches the accountable executive and it's, the, it's where, you know, all that data has been collated and that risk comes to that accountable executive to, uh, for their review and understanding. What you should ask yourself when you look at a chart like this once you've developed it for your organization is really, is it, develop, is it taking the right data, develop, moving that data to the right place at the right time so that the right people can be making data-driven, data risk-based decisions. That's what this is all about. And if, it, if it's working and that data is being delivered to the right place and people are being empowered to make the decisions, the right people at the right time, you've got a very effective governance structure. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, I uh, hope you are looking forward to your SMS implementation. It's a great process and something that can be very effective within your organization. So thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Al, for sharing with us a boring perspective on SMS. Uh, and now the floor to Stefan for SD. Okay, thank you. <coughs> so, uh, even I'm uh, from Airbus, I will not speak you about Airbus, but rather a group of ASD where, as I said, for the SMS pilot project, we built an industry facilitation group. And then you could go to the next slide, where we have a list of uh, participants. It's uh, not. It was a kind of a close the club because at the beginning, the selection of the company uh, for the pilot project was selected by the other, and we maintain uh, this uh, this selection. So we had uh, bah, Airbus, Airbus Helicopter, Aptos, Dassault, Diamond, Deal, Leonardo, Lufthansa Technic, MT Propeller, Pupilatus, Rolls-Royce, Volocopter. So a uh, variety of uh, companies, variety of DOI holders having different constraints. Some of them uh, having operators, some of them uh, uh, just on the engine, uh, not on the aircraft uh, level, on a small, maybe medium size. But finally, we discover that bah, we are facing the, in front of the same rule, the same uh, challenge, the same and some, uh, some of the benefit. Let's go. So here it's a question, if we come back to, to the SMS, it's also a question of perspective. Uh, for us, what, uh, at least what I want to, to, to push is that the, the SMS is something on top. We have already some foundation. We have already the initial certification. We have already the quality in place, the system in place, the approved organization are already in place. So this, should, this system should already work. They are here for that. And we have a monitoring. And of course, we have this continued airworthiness to capture, to make as a uh, capture the, the defect that the initial certification or quality did not catch and to recover the, the, this aspect. And on top of that, the SMS, what is adding the SMS, it has two axes. On one on side, on the right, the product announcement, which uh, when we develop new function to improve even the safety operation, but this approach of product safety announcement is beyond the compliance and is managed like any other change like any other dissension, so not a revolution with vast respect. We are just speaking about performance, safety performance of a product in operation. And the, the other side is the systemic approach, where uh, sometimes even we have already this approved organization system. First, we, uh, we, we have to deal with issue about the different issue and uh, error in the database, error on the interface. And the more you, you, the, the system is bigger, the more you generate interface, the more you generate complexity, and here it's where we, we, have, uh, we could have some, so some risk. So having said that, this is uh, important to, to say that we have to be careful that the SMS should not be an extra system. It has to be integrated and much together with already what exists. But again, it's not a replacement of what should be already in place. The SMS will not replace the quality. The SMS will not replace the ISM. The SMS will not replace the certification. We should not uh, forget that. Huh? So some of the benefits we, we push, uh, this was a common uh, outcome. Uh, first, the just culture. Yes, but definitely, which was not an element which was missing. But in Europe, for the EU 376, we have already this just culture, independent of the rulemaking approach of this uh, this uh, just culture also reinforces the, the, the reporting, which was always sometimes a, a challenge in, in the system. It's pushed also to have an active promotion of, a, of, a, of a safety and also uh, sharing the same requirement, sharing the same objective. Whatever is the organization is also a kind of a benefit and we should keep this uh, top level requirement be common as much as possible because at the end what is important is the safety of the product and its environment and uh, we are all looking for, for, for that. And then also the safety mindset evolution which is a part of the uh, uh, transformation. The human error is not, is not, anymore, not anymore, sorry, just a root cause. It's just a symptom, and then, then we need to, to work on it. Usually, uh, in the past, people were saying, well, human error is normal, we have human in the system, we will have error, so we have to live with that. This is not anymore enough, and this is not a, uh, the right excuse. We need to train the people. The principle of an approved organization is that we have competent people, they are trained for that, so the probability of error, we could mitigate some of it, but basically the people are trained, are capable to do the job and deliver the, well, what we expect. And this is the kind of a challenge what we need to, to have to face with when we launch the investigation. And therefore, we have to put also human factor within the process. 
not only within the product design, but within the process considering the, the human factor aspect. And finally, again, as we say, the safety is not only limited to the product, making safety system assessment, but also to, to the organization. And it's also complement because the DOA, the principle of approved organization, DOA and POA, was also pushing having the right organization producing the, the, the right product. And then, if we go on the, on the challenge, uh, the consistency. We are all have common uh, challenge, but we will have also specific threat according on which which uh, product you are, which kind of organization you, you, you have, you will have specific threat. But at the end, as I say, common requirement, as said by Hal also, people who could move within the company, the principle of the safety should be the same. The way to measure the safety should be the same. We are speaking at the end about the same product. There should not be different safety level from design versus production. The, the challenge also we'll face with a large organization, or even if a small organization is dependent on your, your footprint in, uh, in the system, the oversight consistency will be audited different by even sometimes by different authority for the same product between DOA, POA, maintenance, uh, operation, and so on. And sometimes the expectations are not at, at all at the same level. There's also a question of culture. Also, 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 also. sometimes a, a change of the culture of the, of, of the authority. Here, we, until now, we have the authority assessing us against compliance. SMS is not an issue anymore, an issue about compliance. It's an issue about risk management. So how to assess that you have the right risk management, which is a different mindset versus a pure compliance assessment. The consistency to have also a common system for all approved organizations. And here the tendency having also different regulatory systems or different even assessment tools. We have to be careful that at the end we have a consistent system. We do not have different ways to cascade the, the, the system or to cascade the requirement within an organization. If we cascade on one side, for example, what we have in OASA, we have either the choice of using the detail of the MC or the SM001. It's not a mix. It's either one or the other. If we start to make a mix, it becomes fuzzy and uh, there is no direct correlation. After that, we could even think about, but after that, the challenge is we are facing the same product, same development, the harmonization and the, within the whole organization against the methodology used to show the compliance should be, should be uh, ensured. And also, not only at OEM level, but with all the suppliers. And this is another challenge when facing suppliers, facing various OEM. Yeah, it's also we need to have some flexibility, but consistency. The supplier, Safran, Thales, and so on, are, are suppliers of many OEM. Each OEM cannot cascade its own system. It will not work at the end. But, but the, at the end, we have to ensure that the safety of all the product will be uh, at the same whatever is the system. And this is the last point, the supplier connection to several approved organizations. Yeah, it could be different. But here we have to be sure that first at the interface it's work and there is no differences and it's common also within the supplier to have common policy, to have common uh, culture because within the supplier also people will move and sometimes they will work on uh, Airbus, uh, tomorrow on Dassault, after on Boeing, but at the end maybe they're producing the same part from, uh, or designing the same element, it should be a flight control element. And here therefore uh, we're leading to that, we have to be sure that the expectation, the system in place will fit all the system, the supplier one, but all the OEM and all the authority. Another challenge also is the oversight capability. Uh, there is a few questions yesterday about this, this capacity. Here it's become a challenge. And it's also even more complex because here we have some timeline and we have other challenge also in front of us with ISMS, over management system, which are coming also in, in the system. Are to be sure that the authority will be ready to absorb all this case and have the uh, consistency approach in the oversight also. Having multiple authority, we are facing the risk, having different assessments, different expectations, whereas at the end, uh, it should not be the, the, the case. There is, should have a common level playing field, and this could be a challenge in terms of uh, capacity and uh, capability. And also training, because as I said initially, there is kind of transformation 
the VSSR also need to be trained against this particular kind of assessment. So it will take time. We do not have the resource yet. There is still a ramp up. And there is plenty of our challenge in front of us. And specifically, depending if you take the case on the other side, having, for example, on sometimes significant change or not significant change, it's not also the same level of involvement of formalism required when you are facing a significant change of organization versus a, a normal change. So there is a lot of things to come. And with the date of March 2025, for a large organization, or even taking, because within the, within the DOA, we have to face the whole set of the supplier. Uh, I take the example of, uh, of Airbus, uh, it represents more than 350 suppliers. So you could imagine it's not one organization, it's almost 300 plus companies which have to come together and be ready in 2025, assessing, uh, supporting this aspect. Of course, we could play here the risk management, so some of the suppliers which are more critical than others. But nevertheless, at the end, we, have this, we need to have this consistency. And therefore, the last challenge is to have an integrated and efficient system. We should not duplicate. We should use sometimes one of the advantages of sometimes having a corporate policy, as you mentioned. It's throughout the system, we have a command basis. We have a command policy. No need to further cascade or transform this policy because the, the, the requirements, the judicial requirements are the same. So it's an advantage to have a kind of overall or corporate uh, policy, which is cascaded everywhere, using also the same methodology. It's also a means to keep simplicity and to gain efficiency, rather than uh, at each time making customization. But also, this has to be uh, think about multi-organization. So the collaboration between OEM, the collaboration between the organization is key, because at the point of time, we need to make the system efficient, and we cannot have a nervous uh, cascade of requirements, you cannot have a Dassault cascade of requirements, a Boeing Dassault cascade of requirements, a Nervous helicopter cascade of requirements, a Leonardo, completely different and not compatible. Here we lose, we will go against the objective of uh, SMS, which is the safety, we will add complexity. A complexity in an organization, it's a, it's a strong risk with regard to, to, to safety. And finally, the culture, the mindset uh, evolution, and sometimes, uh, yes, it's, as I say, with the human factor, we need to, to change a little bit the mindset. We say it's an evolution, of, not a revolution. For some era, it will be a revolution. And it will take time. We need to have this uh, push and the, the, the mindset. We should not uh, add ourselves. Sometimes the human factor aspect, the culture aspect, will be very strong. And this is something, it's also a long-term aspect uh, and we have to face a different culture, as mentioned by uh, Sophie. We are all, in a certain manner, have a worldwide landscape. And we have to face this different culture, different approach, relation with regard to, to, to the safety. Also, sometimes having superior far over an ethical uh, field. When you're speaking about tier three, tier four superior, for which the business, the prime business, is not aeronautical. This kind of culture already, first, the culture of our nickel product and the expectation is already a challenge. So how, how to be sure that this kind of uh, basic supplier, which could be, be critical in the system, will have uh, the right mindset and will be there, will be with us to, to be uh, on the journey. We cannot uh, put them on the side, but the reality is that they are part of the business. And finally, that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. I hope that the 7 March uh, 2024 5 uh, will be uh, longer than because challenges uh, are many. Uh, I can talk about authority perspective, and uh, you, you highlighted uh, several good points co like consistencies, capability, and then the other dramatic point is supply chain. So I hope that uh, this could be done within the time frame that uh, the, the regulation will assign us. Now is the time for the audience, uh, time for questions. We have the slide on ready. And here you will see in a moment the uh, the questions. 
for those questions not really that relevant for this slot, as it already happened in the previous panel, we are moving them for the for the final for the final discussion during the day. And yes, Pietro, these are the questions we received and the likes in each one of the questions. If I may, perhaps, for the first one. Maybe the first one uh, I can address uh, to Stefan. It is difficult to define the different categories of SPI KPIs for a design organization. Will there be any specific guidance on this topic, maybe in a new uh, edition of SM0001? That's a good very good question and i'm still uh, to be transparent with you it's really a good challenge or oh, to be sure that we have the right spi kpi for sure what we could say is that uh, we should not think that we'll have a kpi defined at d0 and this kpi will stay forever we need to be flexible and define the right kpi according to the maturity we are facing this kpi could evolve at the beginning for example you could measure the deployment of a promotion element because so you start to know nothing and it's better to ensure that the knowledge the, 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 the KPI on for example on the deployment of the training and so on is one element but at a point of time it's not enough it's not making the thing efficient you need to transform this KPI or to measure the effectiveness of this KPI or to measure at the end that the people on the day-to-day -day business play the safety role or report the, the, the effect there is so we, for, for me, it's rather not, we should use defense some SPI, but the SPI itself will not be the measure of the maturity. We need to think about looking to the SPI being an indicator to open further discussion, to further dig into the problem. So that's why we, we have to be careful. And that's why I say, I do not find any adequate, simple PPI, KPI, which will cover all the need. It's for me, it's just a status to say where we are, to be able to compare different organizations where we are, for example, of, speaking the example of training, uh, deployment and so on, this would be one element of sure. But as soon as you have this, it's not that mean that the problem is solved. So you need always to be creative, adapt the KPI according to the maturity of the system, according to the return of experience, according to your uh, identify threat on which you, you need to, to work on. And this is the kind of a dynamic uh, characteristics. So I do not say that is there is a specific guidance. Is a, I would rather be open, do not be afraid to revise it, but there is no specific guidance saying this KPI will be the KPI, uh, the unique KPI and the good KPI. Thank you very much. Uh, again, we have time for another question or? Yes, in fact, as we started 10 minutes uh, late, uh, I suggest we stay for five minutes instead of ten, and we recuperate a bit. So we still have time for two questions, three maximum. It depends on how long they are. So here we have the next question, Pietro. So relevant to safety promotion, human factor, sensibilization, and awareness, proactivity, just cause. Which are the mainstay for the organization population? How do you suggest to change mindset and culture of the employee? It's a question for you, Al. Yeah, certainly it's a challenge, right, to capture the hearts and minds of your employees. I think, um, again, it goes to the top of the organization. If the very top is, you know, espousing the right values and the right behaviors within the organization, that flows down through the organization. So. When, when you don't have that, or when you have actions that are contrary to what people, you know, talk about, that destroys a good culture. So it starts at the top, and everybody has to walk the talk, so to speak. You have to live what you say that you believe in as your values and the, the behaviors that are appropriate for your company. So it's not easy, but everybody has to, you know, it helps when it starts from the top. Yes, please, Mr. So I think we have clearly to use all the means uh, possible. Uh, for sure, all the proposals are good. Um, what, 
what inter inter interested things is maybe to adapt each time um, the, the means to the audience. And uh, at uh, Airbus Helicopter production level, we try every time to, uh, to, to show clearly example in order that everybody feel part of aviation safety. If we are facing uh, a, 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 um, um, sorry, uh, human resources, sorry, we try to adapt with concrete example in order to involve them of the, of this, of the SMS. So I think we, are, we need to use all the different means, but with concrete example in order to, to, to have everybody with us uh, on the SMS. So, no, I was just going to say that, uh, again, it, it starts at the very top of the organization. And so in our safety policy now, it, it never said anything about the type of culture we look for. Now in our safety policy, it talks about a just culture, that we strive for a just culture. And then we put training out there that helps people understand what is a just culture. Because if you have that just culture, you then leads to people feeling comfortable to report. And if they report... Now you start to understand what's really going on in the organization. Things aren't hidden anymore. So again, it, it's very important to have that top-down approach within the SMS. Thank you. We are about to show the next question. I suggest that from a... I think this, is, this, this question is for Ianza. For, uh, for, I can say that for Italian, we are organizing a cross-domain mm -hmm. workshop. But for Ianza, please, Eugenia. I suggest we cover this question during the last slot where Ianza will be coming with uh, different things. But uh, we, I can advance that, yes, indeed, we have different workshops and different exchanges with competent authorities. This is happening. We are taking the advantage of having uh, the SMS already implemented in, in other domains. So for us, it's a continuation of the already existing experience in other domains, and we are considering the lessons learned on other domains for the coming changes. The next question. And we can take only one more. Should be there in a moment. Ah, OK. Yeah. And a long journey. I remember the presentation from Marie-Sophie. Can you say something about this last question on the SMS a cultural change, a long journey. So, I think I, I provide the same uh, the same uh, answer that uh, my previous. We have to try everything, every everything, and maybe propose a, a, a lot of different means in order to achieve uh, this cultural change. So, uh, sorry for my answer, but I, I am convinced that uh, we need to to try everything. Please. If I may add something, one key element is that and it's, uh, yeah, we, we start to need to have a global policy. It has to be a policy, as mentioned by Hal, declared and unique at company level. Then, after that, the idea is not to repeat and cascade and repeat, repeat again the same policy. We have to explain this policy, cascade this policy to all the different organizations, all the different layers, and to push this, this policy. To, to, to explain to the people that there are some benefit and also explain them how they are impacted by the SMS or how they can contribute to the SMS. And one of key factor we need to, 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 to take into account is that to, to make it a success, any item yeah. highlighted and so on has to be captured. We need to get immediate feedback to any people who report. Because if one people, when reporting, does not have an immediate acknowledgement, he will make it once. And if he has no news, he said the system will not work. So the key success, if you're ready to implement an SMS, 
you have to be ready and to deploy the things and not say, I have a policy, don't tick the box. This is a good recipe to, 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 to fail. And also to repeat, adapt the system, make it clear to the domain, as said by Marie-Sophie, you are not speaking or explaining the concept at, uh, at the same manner, using the same example, when you are speaking to an executive manager, a middle manager, uh, an engineer, or a blue collar. And even sometimes some transverse functions, such as IT support, such as human resources, are indirect players. And they, they also contribute in the system, in their recruitment, in their uh, facility to solve issues on IT accessibility to having the right tool. A portable computer versus a fixed station in a file which are uh, three kilometers from the place where the people who should work. So if the people in production need to work uh, 10 minutes to enter some data in the file, for sure at a time, point of time on Friday evening, the data will not be filled in the tool. The people, the guy will finish its action on the, on the aircraft, on the, on the part, and will come home and say, uh, the, the paper activity or the recording of the task uh, will be done later on. So all these kind of typical factors, typical human uh, factor, uh, some transverse function could contribute and could be uh, also impacting. So we need to think globally and having this adaptation, repetition again, we have to, to learn to repeat because it becomes a culture, it becomes, a, I would say, a, a mindset. Uh, it's a day-to-day -day, uh, job, and every day you have to, uh, starting in the morning, to, to to put your mindset in the right uh, in the right frame, and never forget that uh, safety is on top of everything. And uh, if we do not fail on the safety at the point of time, maybe it will not be visible on the day, but on the long term, it's very detrimental. So we can finish saying that the journey is very long. We are at the first station. So uh, thank you. Uh, it was a good debate. Um, thank you to the speakers, to the moderator. Again, we are. So now we have our lunch break. Uh, we are about to show you a few indications on, it is the coffee break. It's the lunch break, what you have now. So there are some indications where the lunch is prepared. And yeah, uh, please follow the indications for those and please reconvene in, in one hour. And thank you again for your active participation. And my colleague uh, will continue later on, Gregory, on, on the moderator side for the, for the speaker. See ya. Good afternoon, everyone. So I, I, I hope that you had a, a, a pleasant <laughs> so I, I hope that you had a, a pleasant lunch break. S some of you might have been brave enough to go for a walk despite the weather. Um, but anyway, this was a very uh, intense morning session. And I'm sure the afternoon session will be equally fruitful, interesting, and, and, and productive. So, so to, to trace back the, 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 our line of thought when designing the agenda, we, starting, we started with the uh, regulatory environment in the morning. Then we wanted to bring uh, a, an authority international perspective. Then we heard from large organizations all of the benefits 
and challenges they could see from implementing SMS. The next panel is bringing yet another perspective from other organizations, not as large as the ones which intervened this morning. And I'm sure we'll hear about scalability, about proportionality, about uh, common sense, and, and topics like that. So in, in order to moderate that session, we have the pleasure to, to welcome our colleague uh, Claudio Trevisan, who will introduce himself. Claudio, the floor is yours. And thank you very much, Grigori. Good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to the most difficult session of today's workshop, which is the after lunch session. So my objective number one is to keep you alive and kicking and interested. And hypoxia is not helping, so <laughs> please bear with me. Um, I'm very happy to be with you here because I have changed uh, several positions in the agency. Now I'm dealing with digitalization, but my previous position, I was the coordinator for the Flight Standards Directorate of SMS. And SMS is a topic that is extremely close to my heart. So for me, it's a pleasure. It's not a job, it's not a business. I'm really happy to be here. And I'll try to, to pass this passion to, to all of you in case some of you still have some skepticism about that. Uh, uh, what are we going to do in the next hour? Basically, we have two uh, panel members that I will introduce very shortly. They will introduce themselves much better. And it's a bit unfortunate. We should have had three panel members, but one of our colleagues, Bastian, had to bail out at the last moment. Unfortunately, he had some uh, emergency at short notice and couldn't be with us this afternoon. But nevertheless, what we have is two experts that represent a segment of the industry that is a bit different from the discussion we just had uh, in, in the first part of the workshop. And they have peculiar challenges. They have also peculiar opportunities. But uh, yeah, the, their environment is quite uh, different and, and quite specific. So I will be in this uh, short journey accompanied by uh, Christophe, Christophe Robin. Uh, who, as you will see from his introduction, has a lot of diversity in his aviation background. So I think he can bring a lot of added value to the discussion uh, by all the challenges that he's been through in his professional career. And then we have uh, Anna Maria Koroshetz, um, that also brings to the discussion not only the experience in her company, Pipistre, whereas uh, Christophe, I didn't mention it, works for Daer currently, uh, Anna Maria also brings uh, an industry experience, but also a bit of authority experience because she has been working also for the dark side of the force. And therefore, I think that the discussion, given the, the, the different background and different mix, should be quite uh, lively and quite interesting. Um, before I give the floor to them, uh, one plea from my side. Uh, basically, you put an effort in coming here, you spent money and, and weather is not helping. So I really would like you to get something out of this session, of this hour. And uh, we'll do what it takes, hopefully, but you also have to do what it takes. Meaning, if you have questions, if you have doubts, if there's something that we say that doesn't sound right or that raises questions, please do not hesitate. We have time. Actually, the fact of having uh, lost one of the panel members even may give us a bit more time than initially planned to go more in depth of some topics. So please, let's seize the opportunity to make this not another of those blah, blah, blah type of panels. Let's make this interesting. My biggest wish is that at the end of the session, you say, well, okay, this was an hour of my life that was well spent. So thanks a lot. That was just to set the scene. And now I invite to the podium first, Anna Maria. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard. Um, so this greeting uh, from my side is not, is not coincidental. Um, I started my aviation career as a cabin crew almost 18 years ago. When I did the calculation, I was like, ooh, that's a serious number. 
Uh, nevertheless, as said, uh, in the beginning of my, uh, of my aviation career, I was flying CRJs, uh, 200, 900, and Airbuses, 319 and 320. Um, after I finished flying, I did uh, various things. Most of uh, my career was uh, in one way or another related to uh, aviation. And today I'm very happy to say that I represent a kind of a mixture between the regulatory uh, oversight background and the industry uh, perspective uh, also. Um, now, like Claudio said, I'm also very passionate about SMS. Um, but I uh, would say that also compliance, uh, RAM system, human factors, CRM, CAT are also those areas that I have a strong background. Um, today, I work as an SMS manager at Pipistrel Slovenia. Next slide, please. So uh, maybe just a few words about uh, Pipistrel. Pipistrel is a manufacturer of uh, light sport aircraft that is based in Slovenia and Italy. Now, it is in Slovenia that we do our research and development, design, certification, um, maintenance, production, and it is in Italy where we do the final assembly and everything that is um, related to uh, delivery. Um, next slide, please. A few numbers about us. At the moment, we are uh, 350 employees, just to put things a bit uh, in the perspective. Uh, currently, around 2,700 Pipistrel aircrafts are flying around the world, um, over five different continents and more than 100 uh, countries around the globe. We have a capacity to produce an aircraft a day, and when we uh, mention number one, we cannot but point out that still to this day we are the first and only uh, type certified electric aircraft, which we are very, very uh, proud of. This is our Velis Electro. Next slide, please. Uh, but of course, today we are not here to talk about sustainable aviation, how far batteries or hydrogen will take us. Um, despite the fact that this is a very intriguing uh, subject, we're, we're here to talk about SMS. Uh, Pipistrel holds several approvals. Pipistrel is design organization, production organization, and also a maintenance organization. So we decided to go for what we call an integrated approach to SMS implementation. And this is for various reasons. Um, first, and in my opinion, the most important would be to align uh, and then implement our core business values to the safety values in a unified, this is something that we already heard today, in a unified policy that is applicable throughout our organizations, throughout our facilities, as you could see it's even in different countries. Now, when you integrate the systems, in my opinion, it's also easier to really draw that lines when it comes to assigning responsibility and accountability to different levels of management and, and employees. Uh, integration will also enable us an easier transfer, a very clear transfer of information and this centralized way of monitoring risks, hazards, and last but not least, it will enable us to be able to, um, let's say, tackle the documentation management in a, uh, uh, let's say, more easy and uh, more efficient way. Let's go on. Thank you. Just a few, uh, just a few milestones. Uh, on our roadmap, uh, what was envisioned and how implementation uh, was planned. Um, now we know that the regulation entered into force in the beginning of March this year. Uh, the talks about SMS in Pipistrel started already a year earlier. I'm very happy to be able to say that the commitment and dedication uh, from the top management was there from, from day one. Um, I cannot reinforce enough how important this is. Um, at the second stage, implementation committee was formulated, which um, performed the gap analysis. 
This was followed by, let's say, defining and publishing a post for the SMS manager. At the moment, we are in this um, in the process of uh, writing down procedures and all the documentations that are related to it. And I'm also very happy to be able to say that we are doing um, some bits of implementation already. And by this, I mean uh, we created a unified approach for the internal reporting across all our facilities. We put really a lot of thought into this to make it uh, efficient, easy, user-friendly, uh, so it's um, it's not a burden when someone decides to file a report or to report something. And also on the implementation scale, um, uh, training, safety trainings have already started and some um, safety, uh, safety communication activities. Now, if you go to certain materials that are related to SMS, um, there is more or less this impression that you would do safety communication after you collect occurrence reports and then when you you do the analysis and then when you have lessons learned then you go and then you communicate um, i look at these things slightly differently i would say that it's never too early to do safety communication um, to, re to represent the team to introduce certain topics from sms to people you don't have you don't have to have the whole manual in place to be able to talk to people and to say, hey, this is why we're doing occurrence reporting. These are the benefits. This is what we expect from this system. Anyhow, I look forward to this panel. Thank you very much for the invitation. And that would be all for the beginning from my side. Many thanks to Anna Maria. And just before I give the floor to Christophe, who's already working up, uh, in my quest to be a non conventional uh, panel moderator and in my quest to keep you awake, you may think that I have questions only for them, but in fact, I have questions also for you. And here's my question number one to you. And please don't be shy. There is no right or wrong, just, just answer. The question is, how many of you think that they that you know how to implement an integrated sms anna maria mentioned in her presentation integrated sms design production maintenance how many of you think that they know how to do it raise your hand i'm here fair enough okay and now question number two how many of you have actually ever in your professional career developed an integrated SMS in no matter which domain, airport, ATM, ops, air crew, you name it, FSTD. How many of you have done it? Okay. So a bit less than the ones that actually have to do it. So that's the first of the big challenges that Anna Maria has mentioned. Um, there's another one, but here I don't ask you to raise your hands because that could be embarrassing. The question would be, but again, you don't have to answer, how many of you have the commitment, the belief, the, the passionate intensity of the accountant manager behind the SMS? Which is something that you always hear about. In, uh, you've been in these workshops, you've been in these sort of things, and everybody says, yes, it's very important that the accountable manager is committed, is motivated, and gives resources. Why? It never happens. There's two options in my simple mind. Option number one is that all accountable managers are stupid, which honestly, I don't think it's, it's the right one. Some of them may be, but not the vast majority. So there must be a better reason. And I think the better reason is that in many cases, we collectively, authority, industry, experts, we fail to explain and to give concrete examples to explain why the SMS is not an administrative burden, but if you do it right, it actually pays off way more than what you have spent 
in, in setting it up. And that's what accountable managers would immediately understand because they think about value for money. They say, okay, if I have to spend one, what do I get in exchange? And here, I think often our conversation gets a bit fuzzy and safety first, and it's very important and we have to do it because, and then the accountable manager disconnects and says, okay, we have to do it, but please make it cost as little as possible. And then things go dramatically wrong. But that was just to, to, to keep you awake, let's say. And now I can give the floor to Christoph. Thank you. Thank you, Claudio. Thank you, Anna Maria. So uh, I am Christophe Romain. Uh, I am the head of design of DAER, and I am also in charge of the research and technology on the aircraft long-term roadmap. So as you will see later on, that's connection with SMS, even if it's not uh, immediate uh, when I make my presentation. So I am an aeronautical engineer. I have a specific um, parkour as I uh, study an aircraft during my engineering study. It has been built by my uh, robotic aero club at that time. We won uh, most of the French championship, and I started my business as a startup on the basis of that aircraft. So I did that for 18 years and built um, 600 aircraft. Um, uh, ten, mod ten different models at that time when um, Anna Maria was uh, on the dark side at that time, uh, knowing with the authorities, I was, uh, it was, I was a competitor of PP Israel on this uh, new market that was starting on, on Ultrate, and, uh, which became the light spot aircraft. So I did that until um, I have been hired by Daer in order to develop uh, the TBM 900. So the TBM, for people who don't know it, it's uh, a uh, very fast uh, single uh, um, turboprop, uh, six uh, people on board, uh, 30, uh, 330 knots cruising speed, uh, which has been produced up to uh, 1,200 models today, and we deliver mostly uh, worldwide and mostly uh, mostly in in the US. So next slide. So first of all, I will try to make a short introduction about DAER. And actually, that will answer part of your question, Claudio. Is a, and this is a management commitment committed with SMS. DAER is a very old company. It has been founded in 1863. And it's still a family-owned company. What does it mean? It means that those people, the shareholders, they are working not for immediate efficiency, immediate um, dividends. They are working for long-term strategy, and, they, and in order to have long-term strategy when you are building aircraft, you nearly need to make safe aircraft. And that's why I perfectly agree with you. It's, it's again, it's not a burden, because if you don't do that, if you don't make safe aircraft, you just get out of business. Of course, it has a cost, but at the end of the day, it's at the center of a business. And uh, for me, SMS is a tool that we need to use in order to do that. So. If you can go to the next slide. Uh, yes, just to give a few numbers on that one. Sorry, I forgot. Um, 10,000 people, uh, 1.2 million euros turnover. Uh, but we don't, and those numbers are not only about aircraft manufacturing. Can go on the next slide. Actually, we have four activities. Of course, aircraft manufacturer, and from the rest of the presentation, I will focus mainly on that one, but we also make manufacturing, manufacturing for Boeing, for Airbus, for Goldstream, for Dassault, I would say all the big guys. And uh, we have some manufacturing services, for example, uh, on the line uh, of uh, Airbus helicopter, or of uh, Airbus, as an example, and also we take care of logistic and uh, specific logistic, like transportation of uh, of parts of Airbus and things like that. So we are really concentrated on those four activities. And that's the first specificity of DAER. We are not only an aircraft manufacturer, which means how do we apply SMS? For example, in the PUA, which is doing in the same time parts for an aircraft manufacturer as we are, but on the same time as to answer to requests of Boeing or Airbus or whatsoever. That's first specific of DAER. Uh, we have been an aircraft manufacturer since 1911, producing aircraft without discontinuity from 1911. More than 17,000 aircraft have been built, and it makes us the uh, older aircraft manufacturers still in activities uh, right now. So once again, sense of longevity is a fact of, and if we did that, it's because Safety is really a culture inside the company. Otherwise, you don't uh, stay that long on, on, on business. We have today two uh, main product, which are, the first one is a Kodiak. Uh, it's a uh, new uh, TC, 
it's based in Sandpoint, Idaho, Northwest. Uh, it's a single turboprop, mainly a utility aircraft. And the second one is a TBM, which is built, uh, the final assembly line is in France, in Tarbes. Um, and that's the second specificity of DAIR. We are type certificate holder in Europe and in the US at the same time. Which means when we are speaking of SMS, not as a regulation, but SMS as safety, which is the most important point, we need to find a system that will work worldwide on both sides of the Atlantic, knowing that the regulation is not at the same level of maturity, but we need to find a system that will fit the need for both of those countries. And of course, we have several uh, agreements, uh, uh, either in uh, France and Europe and in, uh, in the US. We have um, POA, DOA, MOA uh, in France. We also have uh, some uh, military certification, equivalent with military certification, which give put another layer of complexity. And in the US, we have MOA in Florida. We have MOA, of course, in Sandpoint. We have, a, we are, we have an agreement of production, and we are not under uh, ODA um, in the US. So very complex uh, organization with agreements everywhere, both sides of the Atlantic, and with the size of the company, which is not so big. Because when I say it's 10,000 people at there, 25% uh, of the turnover is for the aircraft manufacturer, but about the people, it's maybe only 10% of the people that making all that job. So we don't have the same um, large team as a big old, uh, I see you, sorry, you're in front of me, Airbus helicopter or Airbus as an example as you are in, in front of us. And we need to apply the same rule. And that brings the question of proportionality, which we, we be probably discussing uh, later on. If you can move forward. Okay. So, and Claudio told me, okay, what do you think about SNS? So I tried to organize that in a few lines. So first of all, I don't want to speak SMS as regulation. I wouldn't say I don't care about regulation. I am the head of design, so I cannot say I don't care about regulation. But which is important is safety. It's safety culture, the way we organize in order to ensure safety. In order to do that, we need to use SMS as a tool and not as a burden. The worst things to be done is to take SMS as a burden on each of the agreement we have and just put another layer of administrative paper in order to say, okay, cross, we, we did it. And uh, so we find the rings oversight. That's not what we want to do. And so it shall be a tool and not a burden. And also our job is not to, to make papers or regulation or whatsoever. It's to build aircraft that answer uh, society new expectations. So, I'm glad to be there with an Amaya about PP Strait, which is the only uh, electric aircraft which is certified yet. But we, we need in our aircraft to introduce new technology to make them more sustainable, which means we need to change not only the product, but we need to change also our process in order to be fast and so on and so on, and keeping the same level of safety. Because I don't think the authority will accept to lower the level of safety just because uh, you put the battery on the aircraft. I don't think this will happen. So, um, and SMS is also about that. We need to use this as a tool in order to change our organization to make it better and capable of the technical, technological challenges we have in front of us. Of course, and that's a specific uh, for, for DIA, I would say, for that size of the company, is, is we think of SMS about safety, we need to find a way of working which can be applicable on both sides of the Atlantic. Because if we start to have different systems, different procedures, different philosophy, just doesn't work when we want people to work with synergies together, will not work. And last but not least, uh, SMS for me is also the meeting point of the authority, authorities and the industry for real safety in an efficient manner, not paper safety. And I make a big difference between real safety and paper safety. And for that, uh, we need the authority to work with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christophe. And I hope these uh, two short presentations helped in warming up a bit uh, the atmosphere. We wanted also to avoid death by PowerPoint, which is another typical risk of, of these workshops. So we, we've kept the slides to a minimum. And now we have some questions. And first, it's my turn. So first, I have some questions for them. And uh, I hope that these questions will address some of the questions you may have. 
But if you have additional questions that will not be covered by my questions, you know how to, what to do with that. You know how to enter Slido, you know how to submit your question, and then it will be voted, it will be brought up, and hopefully we will have some, some good answers for them. So you both have a mic? Very good, perfect. Yes. And then please get ready because we go for question number one. No help from home, please. <laughs> the question number one, in effect, all questions are for both. So I will start with Anna Maria, but it's just a convention. Please, please step in the way you prefer. How do you see your responsibilities as a DOA, POA, dealing with this particular world of general aviation with all its complexity and different actors and so on, when implementing an SMS, and what are the implementation tips and suggestions that you can share with us based on your experience so far? Anna Maria first. Very good question. A long one. I mean, a long answer, I suppose. Um, well, when we think about the responsibilities, um, it's important to understand that when I was listening to presentations from Boeing and had the Airbus helicopters and so on, and Airbus, not Airbus, but uh, um, exactly, thank you. Um, a thought came to my mind that the, the, let's say the big planes usually are operated where? In a controlled airspace. ATCs have safety management systems for years, for decades. They are, they are operated by mostly by AOC holders. You have SMS in place for decades. They are flying to mostly certified airports. You have safety management system there. Plus, you have very strict entry requirements for pilots, for people who are operating these machines. So your products are in, let's say, a very good environment when it comes to managing safety, as opposed to ours which is very, very different, you know, non-controlled airspace, grass airports, relatively easy entry requirements to become a leisure pilot, and so on. So when you think about this in such a way, you immediately realize that there are many things which are outside of your scope of influence. Therefore, what is inside your scope of influence, and this is that we have a safe and reliable product is very, very important. So I think that would answer the first half of the question. Um, when it comes to tips, um, yes, there are many, but I would say if you haven't started yet, start the implementation now because uh, 20, March 2025 seems far away, but in fact it's not. Um, Dedicate personnel, I would say, if it's possible, from in-house. Don't buy manuals on market. <laughs> because um, this may come as an easy solution, but it will cause problems on the long run because you will have no ideas what, what you have in your policies, what you have in your procedures, who is supposed to be doing what, what is safety action group, what is SRB, and so on and so on. Um, yes, about uh, benefits, we will talk for, for the time being, that would be my answer. Thanks a lot, Anna Maria. Christoph. Hello. Yes, yeah, we'll jump on your first point, actually, and put the emphasis on that. So just imagine a TBM aircraft, which is sold at 95% to private owners. It flies at flight level 310, flights at flight level, it flights at 330 knots in cruising speed. At a range of 1,700 nautical miles. So that's, that's it's a small airliner. And those are handled by private pilots. So we don't have the, the role of environment. And so for us, SMS, safety, the pilot is in the system and not outside the system. Even if the regulation today is working on DOA and POA, because you won't take care a lot about the non commercial operation or part 91 in, in, in the US. For us, we have put the pilot inside the SMS in the way we are thinking the SMS. Once again, it's not on the regulation point of view, but on the, on the system point of view. Why? Uh, because the problems are coming 
most of the time from here, but if it could be coming from the operation, but what we call pilot induced error. The pilot made an error, or his fault, yes, but maybe we provoked it by the way that we have done some such and such design or the complexity or something on something. So the whole system we are building is around this idea of putting the operation, putting the private pilot within the inside of the system. So what did we do? So it's, it's not a tip, I would say it's more a share of experience. Is that, um, and that's why I am at the same time the head of design and, and head of research that we have been working for the five or six last year on several R&T plan in order to uh, put in place a methodology which is based on uh, digital continuity. What do we do? We define the product or the next product. We are actually doing this first um, experiment, uh, experiment right now. We define the product with key characteristics, which are the same as the ones that are followed during the production, which are the same but will be monitored during operation, which are the same which will be coming back automatically uh, to the pilot through an application we on ITDM is using, but also on continued roughness. And the whole methodology is based on this digital continuity, just eliminating as many human errors by putting everyone with the same language, which is the same data, which is the backbone of everything we are doing through the DOA, through the PUA, but also by monitoring uh, the operation. So that's how we try to handle it. And what, what's that, what tip can I give? I would say, before defining what you need to do in order to answer to the same as, you need to ask yourself why you are doing it. To make sense about it. In our case, we are doing it why? Because we want to ensure real operational safety to private owners that use a very powerful and performance aircraft. And we need to do that. First, I will start by that. Why I'm doing it before? How I am doing it? Thank you very much. And I think uh, question one brought some good ideas to the table. I hope you, you see it the same way. So I move to question number two, which is a bit more difficult for us because question number two is, what would you expect from the ASA in the implementation of an SMS? Dangerous question. Yes. Anna Maria, yeah. if you wish. If you have no expectations, fine. Oh, no. <laughs> of course I do. <laughs> Um, first of all, I would say support, which is something that we are doing today, and I think this is very, very beneficial for the industry, um, to have this uh, open channel of communication where um, we see that we are in all of this together, because this is our common goal, right? Um, and maybe not only us, I would say also for, because um, as Christophe mentioned, we are, we are encountering different competent authorities, right? Um, on the other hand, I would say we would expect um, proportionality, which was already mentioned today, and, um, and patience. We know that Rome wasn't built in a day. We will do our best to, um, you know, document everything, and then it will take time and dedication for the system to show results. Thank you. Very reasonable requests, I would say. Christoph. Yeah, actually, the answer is on the skin of the board. The meeting point of the authorities and industry for real safety and efficient manner, not paper safety. Real safety, not paper safety. So I would just take an example. When you are doing an oversight and you are taking a 200 pages procedure, which is almost unreadable because that's been done just by oversight, by oversight, just adding 10 pages each time you have an oversight of the authority. Just adding 10 non pages will just make it not better. Just another slide of something we cannot read anymore. So it doesn't go, it brings human errors when we should be, when there is a proposition to make simplified procedures, to go straight to the point. To only put on procedure, which is important, and not the details of the details. Uh, sometimes we have some difficulties with the authority saying, I mean, that's, no, I, I, I want exactly the answer to be done that way and be detailed. So that's where also we, we think we need to work with authority to do that. The authority needs to see the why we are doing it 
and the environment in which we are also using those procedures. If we are in an environment with people that are, let's say, blue colors that don't read, uh, that will not read uh, 200 pages of uh, very French complex uh, wording, we don't need to read that. We need to make something very simple. Maybe it will not cover 100% of the subject. Okay. But this will be a lot more efficient because this is a question of human factor. So we really need the authority because at the end, so why is safety and safety is a common goal. I liked that one. Thanks a lot. I think you, I have this feeling that also you like it. And now, and now for question number three. Uh, how do you see, in general, the benefits and the challenges of implementing an SMS? Now, let's pretend that I am your accountable manager and you have to do a sales pitch and you have to convince me that there are some challenges, but that there will be benefits. Okay, this is, yeah, this is tricky now. <laughs> um, okay, maybe now all of this shouldn't be for the, for the, um, accountable manager, but I will share it nevertheless, just, just to open, you know, the line of thought for, for, for the other uh, participants. Um, most probably the implementation of SMS, if I'm now on the side of challenges, is the biggest management of change that you'll ever do. It's such a huge thing to implement a system in an organization that has been operating 20, 30 years. Maybe it's easier if you do it from scratch. Why? Because we need to understand that as individuals, we will always resist change because it gives us an impression that we are losing the control over the situation. So people will immediately say, no, no, I'm okay. The way I was doing things, just let us be. Why would I have to report this to you? Because we, we are very operational. I know what the issue is. I will figure it out with my colleague and then it's solved. Why do we need all this paperwork? So of, of course people will you know, have second thoughts when it comes to change. It's, it's complex. We need to understand the psychology behind it. Then a challenge that I see, and this also applies to us, is what happens when the introduction of a new system is not the only major change that is happening. Pipistrel has been acquired by a foreign company a year ago. We are now entering this corporate era in terms of Textron. We are part of a huge family now. So this is one thing. We, we are experiencing an, a massive growth, the number of employees has risen for 30% in the previous year. People are joining from different continents. So these are the challenges, apart from the four pillars from the IKEA Annex 19. So there are a few, for sure. But in terms of benefits, um, I would say, in my eyes, the biggest benefit is uh, a chance for a reset of values. We have a chance to ask ourselves what kind of organization we would like to be. How are we going to do business in future? Are the old ways efficient and enough to remain in this playground? As you said, we need to be, we need to be safe because, you know, one bad mishap and you're out. You know, and then there are the traditional ones. Um, informed uh, and risk-based decision-making, just culture, structured environment, and so on. Everything that SMS brings. Thank you. Christoph. Uh, challenges. Challenges for the are coming from a specific uh, uh, position between the uh, US and, uh, and Europe. Well, first of all, uh, we have worked on change of methodology and we are implementing that and we have been doing that for the last five to six years. So I would say uh, we, we, were all, we were making SMS before SMS was in place. But now we need to match with what the regulations say. But what we have learned through uh, this experience, which has been done made in France, is that it's a cultural change. It takes time. And now we need to translate that 
with the requirement, that's what we need to do in France. But in the same time, we have acquired a Kodiak aircraft in uh, 2019, which was the perfect best time to acquire our company, end of 2019. Very easy in 2020 and 2021 to merge process. Um, and we need to, to, to make this culture and change also on the other side of the US, taking care of the specificities of the way uh, the US are working and the way FA also is working. And that's our biggest challenge, is to be able to, to put in place is to be able to put in place a system that will be applicable on the regulation point of view in Europe and that will be applicable also in the long term in the US. When I say in the long term, it has been said several times during the day, it's a long journey. Will that be, okay, there is SMS on the 3rd of March 2025, no, it's a long journey, it will take time, it will be step by step. So we need to think ahead for probably, we are, I anticipate about 10 years, uh, we have a 10 years roadmap in order to do so. Uh, how can we do that in the same time in Europe and in the US, taking care of the difference of culture of the people in both sides and the difference of, of, of dealing with uh, the documents with FA and EASA? That's our biggest challenge. Thank you both. And now my last question, because I want to leave also some time for you to raise your questions. The last one I have is whether you have already any lessons learned from your implementation of SMS so far and that you would like to share with the audience, free of charge, of course. Anna Maria. Um, yes, maybe the first impression would be that maybe it's too early to say what are the lessons learned in, let's say, a six-month period. Um, still, I would be courageous and say that the lesson learned is uh, communicate openly. Um, go to people, explain things. Um, if you don't have all the answers just yet, say we will learn along the way. We will see and learn from each other. This is also something that we heard already, um, already today on behalf of EASA. Um, hello, it works, sorry. Uh, second thing would be that we learned that uh, if you make the reporting easy, it happens despite the fact that maybe you would expect the opposite thing. For us, it happened that we, when we announced our managing director was really happy when he announced when we have a unified approach to reporting ready, I was sure, okay, now the form is there, but it will be silence because people don't know me. They are not really sure what happens now with the report when I click that submit button. But I was pleasantly surprised that this is not the case. So make it visible, make it short, make it simple, and encourage people to speak about deficiencies. Even if you receive something that you would say, but this is not SMS. This is, oh, it's something completely different. No, give feedback, say thank you, because I think it's very dangerous if you have a safety or SMS manager who says, no, this has nothing to do with safety. At the end of the day, even you know personal things or disappointments in something related to HR could be linked to safety. Um, and as I said already initially, uh, engage in safety trainings. That would be our lessons learned. Thank you. And Christophe, you were saying we were doing SMS before SMS requirements were published, which, by the way, is something that I think many of you have been doing, because in the end, it's no rocket science. Lesson learned so far. Yes, but uh, that's exactly what you are saying. Uh, first of all, it has to be a top-down decision, and this decision has been very easy to take, and it was in the culture of the, uh, of the company. So. We have this top-down vision, but we say this order in order to implement SMS. And uh, what we did immediately is that we made a, a bottom-up. We, we just went uh, on, on TOA, of course, uh, but on POA and also MIOA, we say, okay, what do we already have in place? And we were quite amazed about all the process, but we're already in place, uh, which was good news. The bad news is that sometimes the processes, they are the same goal and they are not exactly the same, but they could be the same. So uh, that's now what, what, what you need to do. But I think, uh, I mean, companies which are, uh, most of the aeronautical companies, I would say, well, all of them 
have a safety culture. So there is things that are existing within the company. So you need to have an order coming from the top, but for sure, but there is probably internally inside the company already things to build on. And uh, in our case, we have been working on this philosophy of digital continuity in order to, uh, to destroy the barrier between the conception, production, certification, and so on, so on, to have an, an operation also, to have that in the, the backbone of digital continuity. We did it without knowing we could use it for safety. And now our goal is what? Is to take all those initiatives, all those procedures that are already existing and make one thing uh, to, to relate it, all of them to SMS in order to have an integrated SMS. Still a lot of work, still a long journey. Thank you both very much. I'm finished with my questions. I could ask more, but yeah, enough. Um, and I think we have more or less 10 minutes left for your questions. So now I'd like to have a look at what Slido has uh, to offer. And besides Slido, you can also raise your hand and we will be giving you a mic. But let's see a bit what, what we have. So I'm going in the order proposed here, which is the order of your votes. So 12 have liked the first question. Occurrence reporting requirements will already exist in part 21 before SMS. Why so much emphasis in a new reporting tool if this is already a requirement for compliance and not a new requirement linked to SMS? To a certain extent, this could be a question for EASA, but do you have your perspective on this? Why is it so important? May, may I sure. Uh, I agree with this. Um, it, it was uh, existing in part 21, but maybe I didn't, uh, no, I know that I didn't make it clear enough. Uh, the reporting as it's prescribed by part 21 in Pipistrel was, of course, established before the requirement for, for SMS. What I was speaking about is the internal reporting that is uh, monitoring and collecting the information of hazards that we have as an organization. So whenever someone recognizes that the procedure is not clear, or that something is missing, or that there is, a, I don't know, a, a mismatch in, in the version of, of a particular document, or something is wrong with the protective equipment, and so on, and so on. So this is for the hazards that we have internally across all our approvals and across all our our facilities. Thanks, Christoph. Yes, to add on that, so uh, of course there is reporting what were existing and what we discovered actually is that uh, mostly they are doing the job. The only thing we need to formalize more the answers and uh, the feedback group and things like that. And that's what we see mainly. So tools that are already in place most of the time answer almost 95% of the question and the last 5% is just more formalization or just pointing out more what we were already doing. Thanks. Shall we go to the next question? Could you please provide further clarification regarding the data collection process in the safety performance monitoring, specifically about safety reporting, safety review, and safety surveys, excluding voluntary safety reporting and safety audits? I guess the question is about the importance of the data collection process. Why is it so important? Who wants to give it a shot? Anna Maria? Um, okay, I will try. Um, maybe I hmm, let me think about it for sure. Christoph? I can tell you that one. So, yeah. we took the problem the other way. We say we. Uh, the, the question is human factor. How do you reduce human factor? So we're trying to find a way to codify the, the design production through only data. And after we will monitor for data, but we will monitor anyway because they are uh, design data, production data, or operational data. In, in order to do that, I don't know if it answers the questions, but we we design aircraft now and we produce it for specific data which are related to safety, which called um, key characteristic. And therefore, the day-by-day -day work of all the people, either in design or certification or in production, is anyway to follow those data. So we have a built-in system. As we have in the room also Jean-Pierre and Yuri, who have been holding the pen for most of the 
time. If you want to step in, if you would like to say something, please just raise your hand. Sure. Yeah, so here we go back to the same statement that was made before. It's not just for the sake of I need to collect data. Let's just collect data. We have to start with a policy, we identify objectives, we identify data that will look at the objectives we addressed. And then we have the continuity. I like that one. Thanks. Then the next question in terms of figures would be a slightly provocative one that says, how many accountable managers are attending this workshop? No, please don't raise your hand. <laughs> there may be risks associated to doing that. But I would answer a provocation with a provocation, meaning it doesn't matter. They don't have to attend in person. Of course, if they can, and if they're willing to invest, it's better. But they don't have to. They have to send here the right people, people that they trust, and people that will be capable to report to them the conclusions, the outcomes, the lessons learned, and will be able to ensure that the accountable manager, who is a busy person by definition, will then be in the right position to take the right choices with the right information. So I think what matters most is that the accountable manager sent you here and approved your mission and, and the costs and the budget and the time and so on. And then hopefully he will be willing to listen to your feedback and then you will have to be good in convincing him unless he's already convinced, in which case, please tell me where you work because I'm interested. <laughs> so next question, uh, already existing SMS, which authority will be responsible to approve the new version of the safety management manual, knowing that the current version is already approved by DSAC and that the new one will include parts under the responsibility of OSAC for uh, 21 Golf and of EASA for 21 Juliet. Um, here, I guess it's a question not for our panel members. So I look at my EASA colleagues. Juan. Okay, so so now any any subjects related to the 21J approval is responsibility of EASA, the oversight. Any area linked to 21G, it would be the French authority in that case. So at the end, if you combine both approvals, I mean the management system in a single manual, the manual will have to be reviewed by both authorities. Now we are going to work as much as we can to coordinate our approaches. Now it's not going to be easy because for 21J we have many authorities and maybe each authority has a different way to interpret the rule. But, but we are going to do as much as we can to put everybody in the same line. But it's just an intention. <laughs> we cannot guarantee 100% alignment, but certainly the procedures will have to be reviewed under 21J and 21G by both authorities. If I may run, uh, perfectly agree with you. And if I could have asked one question, actually, uh, when I say what uh, the question you ask uh, later on, uh, why do we need from authorities? This is a key point because if you are thinking of SMS for safety and you are working for the why and you want to develop an integrated system, with different oversight, with different um, bodies making the oversight, you can have some some crazy situation. But at the point to have also this uh, overall focus seen at ASR side, is some my point of view is is a key of success. Yeah, and and looking from experience from other domains, and not talking about SMS, and talking about any of the existing rules, we have tried for years to standardize the way the national authorities implement the different rules. We have had standardization meetings. Many authorities, they, they are very ready to align themselves, but you cannot avoid that they, in some cases, they may not agree with a certain interpretation. So at a certain point, there is always the possibility for certain friction with some particular authorities 
or some particular subjects that we try to align, but, but at the end we uh, agree on disagree. <laughs> but, but. Thank you both. I move to the next question, which is uh, to Pipistrel. And the question is, how the safety management team is set up in a company like yours to serve both the design and the production organization simultaneously? Any specific DO and PO SMS responsible positions as established under the SMS manager? Um, to this, I unfortunately, I cannot, I cannot answer um, at the moment to the fullest. Um, our procedural part and documentation part was not confirmed with any of our competent authorities just yet. Um, even the setup for the um, responsibilities and how the safety functions is integrated into the, let's say, corporate uh, work chart. Um, once this is uh, coordinated with the authorities and confirmed, maybe next year on an, on an event like this, um, I will be for sure willing to share. But I can say it hasn't been decided yet. We have a few scenarios in terms of dotted lines or just straight lines. Uh, we will see. But we don't have it uh, defined just yet and confirmed. Thank you. I see you, Juan. And just for your information, in the following session, when we discuss the different implementation issues, we are going to have an item on positions at the organization, responsibilities, and some opportunities for combination of positions. So, so I'm sure there will be questions there. So, Thank you. Then we have a question that uh, could apply to both, but for the park condition, as um, uh, Anne-Marie had uh, to answer the first one, the previous one. This one will be for Christophe. Of course, you can also chip in. The question is, you've talked about the advantages of a corporate SMS, of an integrated SMS across different parts. How about the drawbacks? For example, a small DOA within a big corporate, including an airline, AOC, Camo, MRO, if we integrate the DOA into the corporate SMS, isn't there a risk of have, having a paper SMS which is not focused on specific DOA issues. Christoph? Yes, there is a risk. Uh, there is a risk of adding papers and having things that don't make sense at the end of the day. That's one of the main risks, I would say, and uh, that's a risk you should avoid. But knowing that there is a risk is a first condition to avoid it, I would say. So maybe you don't go for the integrated approach, have it. Yes, in that case, in our case, we are going to an integrated approach because we were already working on an idea of a methodology for, uh, for, for design, certification, production, and operation with the same backbone of data. So for us, it's natural to go in that direction, but uh, depending on your organization at once. I mean, putting too many, if at the end of the day, SMS is just adding papers to papers, it will not work. Or it will, uh, you, will, uh, you will check the cross and say, okay, I, I'm SMS compliant, but it, will, it might not achieve uh, uh, the safety objective. Uh, yes, I see a question from the floor. I am afraid it's going to be the last one because looking at the time, we are short of time, but please. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It is Nesnegia Hoesdemirak Pnar from Airbus Helicopters. Uh, although hazard reporting is a very important element for SMS, uh, I believe it is a little bit uh, reactive instead of being proactive. So, uh, are you planning to make safety analysis for all your design and production procedures, beside all SMS procedures, or have you already performed it so far? Thank you. As I said, it will be a long journey. So <laughs> I cannot answer specifically to, to the question at this level of, uh, we are, but we, uh, we will define priorities on the focus we will put. And I don't know today if the priority will be put in this specific points as uh, we don't have too many events uh, at that stage. Yes, and from my side, um, it is true. It is, um, in a way, very, um, let's say, reactive, something bad or, let's say, tricky 
happened and now we are reacting and trying to fix it. Um, so safety service, this is something that would, uh, uh, that would maybe fall under, well, under what you're asking, are certainly a way to go. To, to do it proactively. But um, as Christoph uh, all, all already said, um, at the moment it's not envisioned. Um, but yeah, maybe. And I'm sorry, but I know you have more questions. There's more questions on Slido, there's more questions in the room, but we're running out of time, so I have to stop it here. I kindly ask you to applaud my panel members who stood up the whole time. Thank you very much, and have a nice continuation of the workshop. Thank you. So thank you, Claudio. I think you were quite successful in keeping people awake after the lunch. So thanks a lot for that. We, we, we've just passed the, the threshold of 115 unanswered questions. So I think the next um, session would be really important for you because that's the time when we can really interact with you. We have two hours for that. We uh, collected throughout the day some of the questions that were not placed in the right forum, but now it's really the uh, very transverse session where all questions are relevant, in particular those for, for the authority. So for this last panel, uh, I will call three colleagues Juan Atuli for a few minutes, but he'll be back very shortly. We have Joaquin, who's introduced himself this morning already, and Robert Mers Persma, sorry for the pronunciation, uh, one of our senior DOA team leaders and one of our best experts in SMS. So what they did in the past few weeks, they collected through various channels, uh, topics of interest from industry, and, and they clustered them into 10 clusters of, of, uh, or areas uh, related to SMS implementation. So I'm sure you'll find that a lot of the questions you asked this morning will fall under one of these clusters. And the way we intend to work in this session is to give them the floor. They, they have pre prepared one or two slides per topic. So they will say, okay, that's a policy issue. That's how we see it for the time being. Do you agree? Do you have questions? Do you have points? So it's meant to be very interactive, like one topic, one interaction. And, and, and the, the whole session will last two hours with a coffee break in the middle. So, Rob, are you, are you starting with the first slide? General slides, one. Ah, okay, so, Joachim, do you, do you think you can take one slide or sh yeah. shall we? One attack. He'll be, he'll be back in Just a minute. A ah, here he is. Five seconds. Very good. So, I'm happy to give the floor to one. Okay. I'm not sure you introduce yourself already. <laughs> Well, okay, it's working. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. So I have already talked before, but, but my name is Juan Anton. I'm the section manager, one of the two section managers for DOAs. In particular, I'm also responsible for the policy issues. So what we are going to have now, and, and I will have with me for this session, and this is going to be a two-hour session, and there will be a break in the middle for some coffee, where we are going to discuss implementation issues, implementation policy. We are all learning. We, as, as it was said before, we are trying to align what we are doing also with your expectations. Uh, we have certain way of doing the inspection so far, but, but we are open to comments and discussions so we can improve also our oversight on the organizations. So we have with me also Joaquin. He is the section manager for production organizations. And I will have with me Rob Borsma. He is our senior DOA team leader, especially dealing also with safety management systems. So he is our focal point <laughs> also for safety management systems. And he has a lot of experience also doing oversight. So anyway, I'm going to make a quick 
introduction of how we are going to run these two hours. The idea is that we, we have already established like 10 topics, 10 topics where we know there are discussions, there are, I would not say frictions, is topics where we have questions, okay? And taking into account, we have almost two hours. We can spend about 10 minutes per topic. We are going to introduce each topic with one slide or two slides. It will be a question of one minute or one minute and a half. And then we can use the other eight minutes for each one of the topics to discuss the subject and to, so you can make suggestions. So when you use a slider, it's not only for asking questions, it is for making comments or suggestions about how we do or how we should be doing the oversight on a particular subject, okay? Now we will go one item by one item. And for some items, we may take longer than 10 minutes for others, maybe there will not be so much discussion. Just as an introduction and as a reminder, here you have which are the regulations we are talking about, about safety management system, the, the one for organizations and for the authority requirements for EASA and the one for the POA authority, both for EASA and for the national authorities. And these are the acceptable means of compliance. And as it was mentioned before, one package was published in December last year, the other package was published last week. So now the AMC is complete. So I don't know if we can go with it. Okay, so just for your information, these are the 10 topics we are going to cover in these two hours. So as you can see, those are topics where you probably have questions, where we always have issues and discussions. So we are going to share the presentations between the three of us, and we will share the questions the same. So, <laughs> okay, fine. So, so we are going to move now to the, then to the first topic. Okay, and, and since we will have a break in between for a coffee around uh, right at 3.30, hopefully we will be in item four or five by that time. So we would know if we are going to the, at the appropriate speed. Okay, so the first topic is flexibility period and the surveillance approach that we are following. So now for some of, just as a reminder, for some of these items, we have only one slide because we are using the same approach in POA and DOA. For other topics, we may have a slight differences. So we are going to explain those differences, okay? So, so first we are going to start with topic one on the DOA side. And the floor is yours. I think the floor is then mine. Yes, yeah, thank you very much, Juan. So on this first topic, uh, there's a DOA section and uh, Joaquin will take the POA section. Um, the first two bullets, you know, by now that there are some deadlines associated to this, that we have an applicability date and a deadline for the closure of any related findings. So how do we get to those findings? We will get to that. First of all, uh, very important to note that when we do investigations of organizations and that span the date of 7th of March, we apply some flexibility for those organizations that were already far on track. We will consider that they do not need to comply with SMS yet we will use the flexibility given by the two year period to allow them to develop an SMS after the initial approval of the DOA. For those DOAs that on the 7th of March were not yet so far advanced, we will ask them uh, to also comply with SMS. Now, there's some flexibility there. If there's anybody here that have their design organization under investigation by us, they do not have an approval yet, have that discussion with your DOA team leader. By now we're in October, so the flexibility gets less and less, obviously, but this flexibility can still be there. So, important thing to note. On the DOA side, for those of you having a DOA will have noticed we did not publish or give, give you a generic DOA finding. On the DOA side, we say we do the surveillance, we test the water, we see how far you are with your SMS, and we decide in that moment, no SMS found, Here's a finding, or on this detail, 
your SMS is not complete yet, will issue a detailed finding rather than a generic finding. The deadline of any finding we raise as per the rule will always be the 7th of March 2025. So that thing is, is fixed by the rule. We don't intend to change and, and we haven't. How are we doing the oversight? We are merging it in our surveillance program. Depending on the organization you have, we may come in and do a full-blown SMS audit. On the other hand, small organization, proportionality, little things needed to be added to the system, we added on top of an audit we already planned. There will be an agenda item that says SMS, and we will talk about SMS. We will ask questions about the SMS, about the progress of the SMS implementation. And that's the way we do it for DOA. I'll stay here. No, no worries. Otherwise. Okay. So, yeah, as it was already um, advanced, uh, in, in POA, we decided to go for a, for a transition finding. Yeah, but we'll cover more into that later on. Uh, first of all, let me focus on the flexibility part of it, uh, which I'm afraid to say there's not much, because the flexibility was for the, uh, before um, um, being applied, but now we are in the two years, so we regard that Regardless whether you applied before or after the implementation date, uh, you should comply uh, with it by the 20, uh, by the 7th of March. Um, if you applied before, uh, in this case, there was no provisions in the in the rule. So yeah, we are uh, binded by this date. Um, we decided to go for a transition finding. Um, the reason for that was a, a, a GM material that we have because we are going to change reporting lines. We're going to make changes to the nominated personnel quality and safety that was addressed uh, as a GM in part one to one. So that was um, one of the main reasons for that. Um, and also alignment with FS, uh, with NEASA, the approvals we did with NEASA. Um, yeah, so what we did is we, we raised a transition finding. Um, the good uh, news is that you get only one, so you don't get as many as, you know, um, when we do oversight, we'll raise observations, but we'll, I will go more into that later on. Um, at the moment, what I want to say is our biggest concern was to have the job done in time. The experience that we are having, as I mentioned this morning, is the part M to part camo uh, transition um, show us that it's going to be done late. And when I say late, I say uh, the last two weeks. And that puts a lot of strain on all resources. Um, because is we've got a number of approvals, just like the member states do have, and we want to avoid that. Okay, um, how we want to avoid that? Uh, we've got a, we're thinking of a tool which is um, sometime before the due date, we will issue a pre-consultation for a negative decision, meaning um, it's a case where we say it's a legal alleviation for you to take action or to appeal. We will say that if you have not applied or if you are not done yet, there is a high chance that you will get suspended or limited according to what is the situation. And we hope that if a accountable manager gets that letter from EASA, they will react fast. So we're now discussing with legal how much in advance should we do it. We are of the line that if we do it a week before, there's no purpose of it. We might do it a bit late, earlier than that. Uh, still no decision taken. Um, yep. So, uh, fine tuning a bit more. And again, here we are using a bit of a carrot on a stick. This is the stick part of, of the business. Um, if we have to use the negative decision uh, unilaterally from EASA, there is two possibilities, two scenarios. One would be the suspension of your approval because you're not compliant with the rules as that are applicable. Uh, and that will be used it in the case that we have not received even a change application. And again, we'll go later on, we'll cover uh, why we decided um, what we need as, um, what that um, significant change application needs to, to have. Uh, but if we have received the change so we know that work is ongoing, we may have just a limitation. And the scope of that limitation, it will depend on a case by case. I mean, we cannot say right now what it is. It will depend very much on where we are with the assessment period. Um, yeah, uh, I can help uh, foretell more on that. Um, in this case, and again, it's another difference to DOA, 
uh, how are we going to merge the oversight? So in this case, the OA, um, we will only perform oversight of the new novelty elements once the applicants have sent the significant change application. So let's say we are ready when you tell us that you are ready. Before that, we will keep radio silence. We will not come and check into the new, into the new novel elements. Okay. Thank you. So, so in now that you have seen more or less the approach from both sides, uh, we can have questions. They can be from a Slido, although I don't know if there are specific questions on this subject in a Slido, or there are questions from the room. As well. from the room. So, uh, is working the microphone that one? Yes, okay. Thank you. A little bit from from uh, Air France. Uh, we have a payway also, and uh, we have been uh, uh, received an uh, inspector from uh, from Ozak, and uh, the rice finding uh, that for SMS that should be uh, closed in three months. Oh. <laughs> okay, so. I mean, on POA, you have the national authorities, in your case, OSEC. If the finding is linked to, directly linked to the novelties of SMS, the deadline should be 7th of March, 2025. In this new rule, there were also some other changes which were not linked to SMS, but, but if it is linked to SMS, the finding, the closer, needs to be by 7th of March, 2025. Bernd Heinrich from H55 in Switzerland. Um, you have laid out the rules how EASA wants to coordinate the oversight for POAs, but POA is also transferred and delegated to the national authorities. So do the national authorities follow the same rules? Uh, are, 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 so just one clarification. Are you talking about national authorities acting on behalf of EASA for POA or national authorities for na the approvals they have in their own country or member states? No, no. So the oversight of the POAs in a country is made by the national authority in that country. Okay. But are we talking about member states or outside of Europe? Okay. So, so in, in that case, um, the, the member state authorities is yeah. uh, performing the oversight for the production organizations. Yeah, yeah. We, we, are not, we are not involved in those. Now, you are asking how we are going to standardize. Well, you have laid out how you want to coordinate the oversight within the ASA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, so this is why I said before, okay. we are going to try to, and this is part of the last slide that we will have later, the, the item number 10. Okay, so. If I may try to. To, I, I think I understand your question. So, uh, Joachim, you explained how EASA is handling the introduction mm. of POA, and I think uh, that the person in the room is asking, is how that a coordinated states? action with NAAs that oversee POA, okay. or do they follow their own route? No, normally um, they should have a proactive communication dialogue with their industry, definitely. We just heard a voice from, from ISA this morning that they had met with their industry and they had you know, lay down the questions on how we want to go ahead and so on. There is nothing in the rule that says the member state should have a system in place whereby they, it doesn't exist anything like that. But yes, definitely the, the member state should have got out there into their industries and said how they want to go about with the change. So my expectation would be that, yes, the member states have done that. Um, but again, I'm not a standardization expert. Um, I cannot give you a final answer on that. But yeah, the expectation is yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take the question that we have on the screen from a slider. What is the case of an application before 7th of March 2023, mm -hmm. but no nomination yet of the DOA team leader? You know that we are under certain constraints of resources. This could be a case of an organ. So as, as, a, as a way to move forward with the oversight that we have to do on existing organizations, we have something like a waiting list for new applications where we delay a bit the assignment of the DOA team leader, well, a bit, sometimes a few months. And 
But the main thing is, if we have not assigned any DOA team leaders yet for this initial investigation application, it means the investigation is not, obviously has not progressed anything. It has not progressed. So we will certainly ask for implementation of SMS once we start the investigation. So what we did was to use some flexibility for existing applications where the investigation process was well advanced on 7th of March this year and said, okay, if the investigation is well advanced, we are not going to start again asking for manuals to implement SMS. So we finished the investigation and then we asked for the SMS implementation. So, but in this case, yes, we will be asking for SMS implementation before approval. And most likely the approval probably will take typically one year or even more. So, so we will be probably at, at the end of the flexibility period of two years. Okay. Any, okay, so there is a question over there who has the microphone. Uh, you cannot see it's behind the column. Ah, you have a mic, okay, fine. Okay. So then, good. I'm okay. Fred Simberg and Rubach Aviation of Switzerland. I'd um, like to attach to the uh, question from Ben Heinrich. Um, if an organization, uh, like we have a design, production, maintenance organization, we have one common uh, SMS, but we are going to be audited by, by, by the EASA, DOE team lead, and by the production and by the maintenance organization from uh, the national authorities. I think what Bernd was, was going for is, is, is this coordinated, because we can have from different uh, audits have different in, uh, inputs, which might even be conflicting. Yeah, yeah, so this is, this is what I said, it will be covered in item number 10, but as an advanced, certainly we are going to work together with the national authority to see how we can coordinate as much as possible. Uh, so far, we have not fully started yet, but, but we are going to do efforts to coordinate as much as we can. Okay, so if if I may just complement, and again, I'm, I'm here I'm talking just to the ASA directly approved POAs. Um, in our case, the setup is a bit different. We are not a national authority, we're just a competent authority. So we have no visibility into what the country in particular, what level of safety, what kind of SSP, uh, state safety program have, and so on. And in that case, those cases even more difficult to coordinate with the national authorities. So in, in our in, in case of EASA POAs, that will happen on a case by case, depending on the working relationship that we have with that national authority. It could be a, yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm I'm looking whether there is any more questions on in the in a slide. Anyway, we cannot answer probably all the questions because we have around ten minutes per subject, so so I, I hope you understand. <laughs> that we will have to move so you can use the remote if you want uh, once it's green so push it green and then keep pushing next one yeah but that should work so next one okay so so then we 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 move to the second topic uh, i hope you have more now an idea of how we are doing the approach in DOA and in POA. It's a bit different. Now, regarding the industry standard for the SMN0001, it has been already mentioned today. This is a means of compliance that has been accepted for certain elements of the new requirements basically for the requirements of 21A139 for POAs and the requirements in 239 for DOAs. Uh, it has been explained today what was the purpose. Now, one important thing, and this has to be very clear, this is, you can use the standard in order to comply with those paragraphs, and this is an acceptable means of compliance, but it doesn't mean that we are not going to do an oversight on how it is implemented. So, or the national authorities are going to do an oversight on how it's implemented. So you can use the provisions of the standard, but we will be checking how this is implemented. 
uh, I hope that's that's clear because sometimes we get some confusion and some people think, okay, if we comply with the standard, the ASI is not going to audit us. Mm, it's not the case. <laughs> okay. Now, on top of the standard, of course, we have the acceptable means of compliance and the guidance material that was published in December and now last week. Yep. And of course, you can use that material as a means of compliance. So uh, here we don't have a different approach, POA or DOA is the same thing. So if there are questions on this topic, you can raise the hand or you can put it in a slider. Thank you, Anis Giro from PUA Airbus Commercial. Can we use the SM0001 to cover the other impacted requirement by SMS? Sorry? The requirement impacted by SMS, 143, 147, etc. Can we use SM001 to cover the SMS part of this requirement? So we, we attach the AMC that says you can use the SM to, to the main SMS requirement that we've put in the rule. There's links from that rule to the mentioned paragraphs, the mentioned points uh, by you. And so we would have to look at, we, we can be flexible with applying this standard where it says something about staff or, or how the organization structures, where the safety manager is located, things like that will be covered also by, or are covered by the standard. And obviously then we will look at that as well. The formality of it is that it attached. It needs to be attached to something, and it is to the to the main SMS element. But that SMS element also refers out to other points within Part Twenty One. So we will look at that, and we we'll use, we'll use common sense for the application of this standard. Is there anything in a slide or on this one? Um... No, I think uh, something that can be mentioned is that this is um, a very useful, it can be a very useful tool uh, for the for the um, industry. When we're talking, and this question we had this, this morning, we had this question about different regulators. So you could have suppliers who are not necessarily holding an approval directly by themselves. And this could be a means of accepting um, a system of a supplier who is delivering components to different uh, POAs. Um, so, if this is beneficial for you, then it could also be a, a case for implementing this standard. Uh, just, just before the question, uh, it seems we are having some issue with a slider because it's blocked because of the number of questions for other topics. So, so what we are not related to this. Uh, what we are going to do is to archive those 70 or 80 comments that we have in order to unlock the system. And now if you want to send something to a Slido, it should be related to the topic we are talking. Okay? Uh, please don't send questions for different topics. I mean, we, we go in order. Otherwise, the system will be blocked and we cannot go through 100 comments. <laughs> Reset of Slido is done now. So <laughs> okay. Okay. So reset is done. <laughs> so, but there was a question here. Yes. Thanks, uh, Jean David Zitoun, and Salt Nexelia France. Dealing with uh, companies which are multiple approval orders, is there any plan to harmonize these Part Twenty One uh, requirements with the one of the Part One Forty Five? The whole rulemaking activity was based on the premise that we would harmonize as much as possible. So as far as the rulemaking exercise is concerned, we try to harmonize as much as possible, but not forgetting any specifics of the particular mm -hmm. organization approval, whether it is MOA, POA, uh, DOA, or before CAMO, uh, things like that. So it's not identical, but as close as possible. It yep. is very close, I would say. Okay, so we've... 
couple of questions coming now. Yep. Okay. So the first, are oh, yeah, you showing it? I oh, am yeah, taking it over. Okay. Is the OS current yeah. responsible for SM safety mask? And what is the interface between SM safety management? Independent system. I think that's one for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is the DOA's current independent system monitoring responsible for safety management audits? So the independent system monitoring covers the complete DOA system. So if that complete DOA system includes safety management, then we ask the independent system monitoring to also review that. Make no mistake, independent system monitoring is something completely different than safety management. So. The independent system monitoring will audit the safety manager as well. Maybe that clarifies it. Okay. For for the second question, this is a clarification whether when we talk about new applications, we are talking about completely new applications or application for changes. No, it's new applications. I mean, if 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 you already hold an approval as a DOA or as a POA. And, and you send a request for a change of the organization, you will have the limits for, I mean, the change may be approved, but, 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 mm -hmm. but depends, but you will have the time, but we will be checking the SMS within those timelines. So. Yeah. And there was and can the safety man I, th I think the questions related to the safety manager can be well maybe we can address it already because we will have another topic or we're we, not linked to this topic so no so we so we, we we leave it for the for the topic related to to that now this this topic will be discussed later okay okay because we have a specific yeah so okay so then we we will move to the next uh, topic in the slides. So we go to the yeah to the presentation. Yeah. Okay. So now we go topic three. Yeah. That one. Yeah. So let's see. Lost the visual. So there's no. Uh, no. Okay, now. So this one. Yeah. So this again will be a two-part story, one for DOA and one for POA. I'll kick off with the, the DOA version. Um, so when we do our DOA oversight, I already mentioned to you, we integrate it within our surveillance programs. And uh, obviously we would not schedule an audit on SMS if we know you're working on the gap analysis, it would be too early. So we uh, do that in an opportune time. And uh, we do it uh, basically in three steps, three steps following the way of working that we've established for SMS uh, using the PSOE model, also uh, used by the MSAT and, uh, and in the uh, standard developed by ASD as well, although they have a fifth element. Um, so in, in the first step, we were going to be looking for present and suitable. So you could also call this basic compliance to what SMS requires. So what does the rule say? What do you have? Uh, cover the basics. In step two, we will look at you're actually operating those processes, new processes you've put in place or old processes that fulfill SMS already from the past. We will look at that they are actually operating in your system. And then in a later stage, we'll look at effectivity of those processes. Are they producing the right result? Are you tagging uh, safety issues, are you dealing with them? Does the feedback uh, 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 system work? Uh, are you, are you en encouraging, uh, fostering just culture, things like that? So it follows the maturity system, obviously, 
that we've developed, also supported by the MSA tool. And now on the POA side, the next slide. So if you go to the next slide. Yeah, so we, we've also used the step uh, nomenclature, but don't think we, we're referring about the same thing. Here is more about the SMS implementation and what happens throughout the time. So today we would be at step one, meaning initial investigation. And this would be the same step if you were a new applicant in five years time, okay? A new POA applicant. So in this case, we are not raising findings because we've got the, the transition finding to fall upon if, if everything goes south, okay? Um, what we're looking at is the presence and suitability of a management system only. We would not be looking at how efficient it is. We would not be looking at how operational it is. Of course, we can still give recommendations. Um, we consider that this is a sort of activity that can be done remotely or through desktops uh, interviews because it relates about processes and so on. And then, of course, it will later on be implemented in the um, on-site audit. And what we are looking at is the safety management uh, of the organization is in line with EASA expectations. And here I have to come back to a comment I've already done. Um, for us, EASA is a competent authority for POAs. We are talking about non-European member states, meaning we there is no SSP. We, we really don't have a feeling of what the state safety program is, what is the condition of that country in. So we are taking that into consideration. And that is necessarily, necessarily not the case in a member state. In a member state, the national authority knows about you know, their, their own state and the status of, the, of their industries. Then we move on into safety, into step two, which is the continuous compliance uh, with safety management element. And here, this would be your first, at the end of your first uh, surveillance cycle. So in this case, we are evaluating, we're doing oversight to check that your system is present, suitable, and it works in, in plain English, okay? And in this case, the efficiency is only assessed. So if I come across that your system is cumbersome and doesn't produce, and I would put it in observation, I would not put a finding to the efficiency of your system, but I can raise findings if it's not present or if it's not suitable for the nature. And this is how we ensure proportionality, how we make sure that the system is adequate for the nature and complexity of your organization. Um, yeah, I did mention about the level two findings, if it's not present or suitable or operational, and observations only if they're, if they're not efficient. Um, step three, uh, by the way, before I go to step three, this is what we have today. If your system is not mature, if your system is not good enough, in plain English again, the POA will stay always in step two, which translates over cycles of two years, although we will later see um, that we might even use uh, shorter over cycles. Um, yeah, but then if you've demonstrated that your system is efficient and that you have a positive uh, compliance history, then we will extend the oversight to 36 uh, months, meaning you will have an oversight cycle. You will see less of an authority. It's up to you to decide whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, but the oversight cycle can be extended. Um, at this stage, we have no policy on what will be a finding or what will be an observation, okay? Um, and then if on top of management system and, and a satisfactory compliance history, meaning your, your audits are turning out to be a good audit, um, and you have, have demonstrated to have a, an effective reporting system, then we can extend your oversight cycles uh, to four years, meaning you will see the authority, the, the scope of your activities that are taking place today within the framework of two years, that would take uh, four years. Again, um, we do not have a policy for how, what will be a finding, what will be an observation in that scenario, because still we, we are a few years ahead of, of this minimum of, of three years at the moment. So we are still okay not to have a, a policy. I understand we'll have to have a policy like we have for, for today. What is a finding, what is an observation? Okay, because of course uh, compliance uh, can deteriorate and that could have an effect on your surveillance cycles. So, yeah, that's... Yes. So just before the question, so as you can see, 
Uh, there, are, there is a mention here to the length of the oversight cycle. We will have an item on length of oversight cycle later. Uh, but but as you as you know, for POAs they have been always in a two year cycle oversight. For DOAs we have been in a three year cycle oversight. So so for DOA in principle we are going to follow the continuation of the three year initially. Uh, unless we have a reason to reduce it. So, but we will cover that later. So if there are questions on this subject. Yes, yes again, a very short question. Uh, you talk about uh, EASA POA, but what about uh, NAA POA? So, okay. um, if you're talking about the, the um, assessment, so how are they going to assess your SMS systems? Um, this we will have to go to your competent authority. I mean, um, they, they, uh, these, these same questions, they will have a policy. We know, and we've made public the tools available today. For example, the, uh, the management uh, assessment tool, uh, uh, the management system assessment tool, they can use it, but they don't, they're not forced to use it again. So, um, each authority, again, should should have a, a communication policy with their own industry, and they should come up with the, their expectations. So I know it doesn't answer your question, but... There, there, are, there is a question there. Andrea Cittirico, Copter Group, uh, Switzerland. Uh, taking uh, in consideration the EASA DOE oversight, in particular, the three steps that you mentioned in your slide. I assume that, that uh, step one will be the 7 March of 2025. Uh, uh, have you already um, a data or uh, a plan uh, for the step two and step three or uh, implementing uh, for especially the operating and effective uh, steps of uh, SMS? A timeline or uh, some data indicative. So I must correct uh, the timelines a little bit there. Uh, for the last step, no, we don't. It is an ongoing process. It will go on forever. How how effective is your system? You will mature to grow the system. This is a, this is a always requires active input. You will need to adapt. This is always something that will go on. So we can't even put a deadline on it. The deadline of the 7th of March, for me, is present, suitable, and operational. Already. Well, yep. already. <laughs> 18 months to go. Yeah. We, we, we have heard today that this is going to be a long journey. So we will see how deep into the operational phase you are on the 25th of March. Sorry, on the 7th of March, 2025. So this is something we have to evaluate. So. Uh, the, there are questions in the room. This one, sorry, just for you. This is one from the last topic, which was not addressed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you have two questions from the room, so whatever one do you prefer. Okay, we, we go with the room first, and then we, we take this one. Okay, um, this is Luca Romano uh, from my restructure division of Leonardo. Um, I have a similar question regarding the POA uh, with reference to the time for implementation. If I look to the, the slide, in my understanding, I got that uh, we need to reach the step one by March 25, if I'm not wrong, mm -hmm. while all the other steps will come afterward in the cycle of some months. So is this right in my comprehension? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in, in EASA, and again, the member state of, in your case, Italy, they, they'll have to develop. But in EASA, we identify that to be compliant, you have to be present and suitable because it's a new requirement. You cannot be operational to something that doesn't exist. So this is by default. The day that you have your change approved, you can have an audit and ask you to be operational because it's applicable. Okay. So during your first surveillance cycle, and I'm, again, I'm talking about surveillance, during your next oversight activities, they can, and an and like inspector can go into your organization and ask and expect the system to be operational. 
or raise findings if it's not operational because it's not working. Of course, we cannot ask you to be operational during the initial certification phase because it doesn't exist. So that's why to get it approved, precedent suitable, once you get it approved, it should work. And the oversight activities should check that the system is working. So and audit for operational review, let's say, will come after the March 2025, right? Correct. Oh, no. If I approve your, your uh, change today, okay, your SMS approved, tomorrow I can do an audit and expect you to be operational because it's already. <laughs> now, just on this. Yes, it's uh, Stéphane Boussu. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, okay. Was I there? But here, maybe it's question on Airbus, but it's a question that a lot of people in the road could share. I see really, it's a common, rather, I see really a kind of systemic issue. We have the same requirement at the beginning, and already, again, a simple question. You already provide, within another POA and another DOA, different answer. How can you expect that with the over NA, with our system, which where we face a common and integrated SMS, that at the end we'll have a unique answer if yourself, again, simple question, are not harmonized? So, so just we fully accept the criticism on this. So that's that's clear. As the same as national authorities can have their own discussions, we have our own discussions. For POA and DOA, we have from different environments, different uh, way of doing oversight. We have different number of organizations under DOA and POA, very different number of organizations. And we are, we are still discussing some of those topics. That's why I'm saying whatever you see here on the policy is not a fixed policy for everything. It's not completely fixed. That's the reason why we are discussing this now and and in some areas we will still have to align between DOA and POA. So we, it's work in progress. Okay, so but but we understand your concern. And as you have seen already, we have a few differences already. And some of these of those differences may be solved. Some others may stay because we come from different way of doing oversight so but we are going to work on that and we and i can tell you we have an internal group in easa not only with doa and poa we have an internal group discussing all the approvals and the way we implement sms also for operations for flight crew licensing for atm aerodromes and all the other domains can i add a question to that um, Organizational-wise, and Heinrich again, H55. We have so many questions now for coordination between EASA DOA, EASA POA, and national authorities POA. Can we probably address the question number ten now? Because when I look at the clock, we will never make it in the afternoon to come to item. <laughs> I think you have to have faith. And <laughs> so. <laughs> So, okay, so we take this question directly after the break. Okay. We are talking about the item number 10, not? Correct. Okay. So, Jean Pierre, maybe. Yeah, we try to answer that one. Um, EASA has been invited uh, as observer for the development of uh, SM001 issue A. At that time, we had identified, in fact, this is you, industry, who identified uh, gap analysis with uh, our rules. Um, and uh, issue B uh, was supposed to empty that uh, gap analysis, so that means that if an organization uh, implement uh, an SMS, it, should it be in line with the EASA EMC or with SM001, it should be, uh, it should be okay. 
Uh, I don't know whether um, you would like to complement my answer, uh, Gilles. Oh, just to, uh, yes, to further uh, specify that uh, uh, SM01 and HUE is a means of compliance and AMC, uh, part 21 POA, uh, yes, part 21 POA uh, and DOA uh, uh, rules. So uh, it can be used as a standalone for uh, safety management elements. Uh, uh, and then with regard to the assessment tool, Uh, again, they are not, these are not AMC or, or guidance material, but just tools that can be used on a, uh, let's say, voluntary basis uh, uh, to self-assess or uh, by the inspector to, to help them to, uh, to assess uh, an SMS. Uh, the tools between SM01 uh, assessment tool and IASA uh, assessment tools are not uh, identical. For sure, uh, but uh, anyhow, they are consistent since they uh, they are related to the same uh, to the same requirements. And for sure, the uh, tool in SM01 is aligned with uh, the AMC, which is in the SM01 uh, itself. Thank you. So, I just to add to that uh, that. Should it be SM001 or uh, the, uh, the tool, the MSAT tool, this is not a checklist. It has no legal value. It's just a end memoir or a help for you to identify the missing enablers in your system and going from compliance, I don't like this word about SMS, but moving toward Effectiveness, I just want to echo uh, Christophe Robin's words how to do it because it has a real safety value. This is what we target. Okay, so can we remove the slider from there and then we move to the next? No, you can take over. You can take over. And these are about the These questions are about maturity. Yeah, yeah but, we, but we, 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 have, we don't have him. So we will see how we address the other questions that we have in a slido, but certainly if we, 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 we cannot reply to all of them right now because of the time. So topic number four that we have here is proportionality. Uh, has been already mentioned, one size does not fit all. We have room in the rule and in the AMC material to apply a flexible approach, considering the size, the complexity, and the nature of the organization. And there are some examples there that you have regarding the safety manager and whether it is required or not, or you can use alternative methods or equivalent methods. And the same for the safety review board. And, and we are training now, and we have already trained our, lead, our team leaders to follow a flexible approach and a proportional approach with the organizations. So, <laughs> so at the, at the end, you have to adapt the evaluation to your organization, to the particular activities you are doing, the size of your organization. And we are supposed to take that into account and, 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 and not ask about the same for big organizations and small ones. So we fully understand that. And we, we are taking that into account in the, in the surveillance. Any questions? <laughs> okay. Yes. 
Um, no, the, I think I'll take the first one. The, the expectation is that each organization is able to customize it, uh, to make it really applicable to their business, to their nature, to their risks. Of course, I cannot, we cannot enforce it down. Uh, then it, it would be a, a compliant <clears throat> element. So it, uh, uh, we can provide you guidance. We can say for your type of setup, and then you can say the pros and cons of, I don't know, having one quality manager and safety manager or one person for each one of the two positions. We can t discuss about it because we know the company. We can give, provide guidance into that, but. <laughs> Keep the conversation going with your team leader. Uh, get the information through that. If you're asking us to provide a generic proportional manual, going to be very, very tricky. I don't think we can do that anyway an SMS manual, consider whether you need that. You want to put safety management elements within your system that you already have. The danger of an SMS manual is it lands with some other manuals that may be in some kind of closet mm -hmm. in your organization. Is an SMS manual really the way to go? Maybe for some companies it is. I'm not excluding it, but think about it. Yep. I think we can go back to ICAO this morning. They mentioned that they have got like a pool of information from applicants that have voluntarily provided information and so on. So yeah, yeah. There, there, there's a lot of resources available, but there's value in as well in you going through the process. Yeah. Develop your own system, adapt your own system to cover SMS, uh, because if you walk that road, it will be effective. If you don't, it was already said that please don't buy a manual <laughs> for us. If we would make it available, maybe it would be for free, but it would have the same consequence. So don't do that. Um, regarding the question of performance based approach. Okay. So certainly you have to comply with the rules. The rules provide certain margin of maneuver. That's why we have AMC and we have the standard on the way you comply with the rule. Those are acceptable means of compliance. So it means it's not mandatory. Of course, if you use one of those methods, the existing AMC or the standard as a way to comply with the rule, we are going to check that you actually do that. I mean, we have to audit that. Now you can propose a different way to comply with the rule and, and we will have to review it whether it meets the intent of the rule. But, but AMC is not mandatory. The standard is not mandatory. Okay. Now regarding performance-based rules and the concept of performance-based rules, this is something that has been going on for many years within EASA. We always wanted to have performance-based rules and at a certain point, we started drafting the rules more performance-based, a bit more high level. This was stopped at the commission level by the legal services because they said there is no legal certainty. Okay, so, so we have to provide certain clarity in the rule. We cannot leave it completely open. Okay, so just we, we foster performance-based approach but the rule has to have some legal certainty and this is the way we have the rules. But again, we are not making the AMC or the standard mandatory. Then there is a question, organizations that struggle yeah. often need formal structural risk management the most but are also much more likely to skip step in the process. And he, yeah, this one is a really good one, but I think probably I, I would expect, I will pass the mic around. This is, uh, I think you're better suited, the industry is better suited to answer this one. Um, or or Jean-Pierre, maybe you want to tackle this one. Basically it says the organizations that already know the best performers or compliant or, so they are the most likely not to have resources, not to have the culture, not to have the elements, and then they might either omit or skip important steps in the process. So recommendations for organizations, which of course they might not have the resources or the know-how or the training capacity of a consolidated. 
<clears throat> I would say I would say use the the assessment tool that EASA has made available with a clinical eye. You don't need to <coughs> implement everything that says in there. So the the critical eye is just pick and choose the elements that are needed for your organization. So simplify it in a way, make it suitable for for your needs, for your nature, for your complexity. Uh, that would be one uh, I would say. And that way, you you make sure that at least you you go through the main expected elements. So these are two to use the eight thing. Yeah. yeah. So okay, so we are already five minutes past. 3.30, uh, we are going to have 15 minutes. Is 15 minutes or 30 minutes? 15, 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, 15, 15 minutes break for coffee, but please be back in 15 minutes. It's difficult to call everybody outside and tell everybody to come back here. The <laughs> Uh, I talked to Gregory, we are going to do topic 10, then 7, the key personnel, yeah. uh, and then maturity, maybe, uh, the maturity, there were some questions on maturity. Yep. Yeah, we, we just need to kick our slides overboard, basically. Yeah, yeah. Sure, that would be at Okay, uh, just a quick announcement. If anybody expects to leave before five and has the luggage in the room, please collect it now, okay? Because we are going to lower the screen and then afterwards it's going to be more difficult. So, so if anybody has the baggage there and is planning to leave a bit early, then, okay, the second thing is we are going to follow the order suggested. So, and those areas where we have more questions in a slider. So we are changing now to topic 10, then we, we move to topic seven, the key personnel in the organization. And then we will see, and, and we go back to a few questions on maturity, and then we see how much time we have left. Okay, so anybody has baggage there that needs to correct? Okay. No? Okay, then we lower the screen. Good. Okay, so item 10. This was the DOA POA alignment. So as we said, we are trying to align as much as possible internally in EASA. We are still under discussions with other domains, other domains where we implemented SMS before already. And and we will try to iron out those differences between POA and DOA as much mm -hmm. as possible. Some, in some cases, it may not be possible because of the different environment and the different oversight, but we would try to do it as much as possible. 
Now, questions that were in a slide on this issue. Uh, I don't know if we what questions we had in relation to topic 10, DOAPOA alignment. Yep. We can go while we find them. We can just go through the uh, slide to set the scene and then we can start. Yeah, the slide the... is this one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, but this it's already yeah it's very so it's very self-explanatory uh, you just make reference to the regulatory where it says that okay so what kind of impact will the sms system have on subcontractors who develop software and hardware compliant but do not have doa poa approval what will okay now as a general rule and this is not linked particularly to the software or the hardware. When you when we are talking about suppliers of existing DOAs or existing POAs, our rule does not apply to the suppliers directly. If they hold an approval, yes, they will have to comply with the rule. But if they don't hold an approval and they are a contractor of an existing DOA or POA, the requirements are on the DOA and POA, are not in the contractor. So we will audit how the DOA and the POA is controlling the supplier, is managing delegations, is managing communications and all that. But we are not going to ask the supplier to comply with the rule because the rule does not apply directly to them. So I don't know if you want to say something. Yeah, um, in a practical way, that means that we are expecting that when you extend your design management system to your suppliers, that that is also done for SMS. As already was mentioned uh, today a couple of times, this is uh, this is something that you need time for, and you need to uh, educate maybe your suppliers. Some will be prepared for this. They may already have an SMS on their own initiative, or they have certain organization approval that requires them to have SMS. But we do see that from an organization approval using suppliers, that some of that SMS and that SMS thinking tailored to the relationship you have with that supplier needs to be in place and uh, this this is what we feel is very important to him. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Now, the, the second comment we already discussed that we will try to align as much as we can between DOA and POA as I said we are ongoing discussions with the other domains. Now uh, a person covering the role of quality, sorry, the role of quality manager POA and the role of independent system monitoring can be appointed. Okay, this is for a different topic that we will address immediately after this one, but but we can already maybe I, I, cover me, uh, that one. I, I, I don't think there's an order to our slides anymore. Yeah, Let's so, just take the questions so the as they come the to, be, uh, to, to be able yeah. to answer your questions. Um, uh, the answer is depends. Depends on your organization depends on the proportionality that you think you can apply and, and, and have for have that discussion with your DOA team leader and POA team leader. Challenge on you is to get them on, the, on board mm. on, in the same room or at least in the same virtual room, but I would like to encourage that uh, to, to be aligned on that. Uh, not a lot is excluded there from the principle that if you're a really big organization, putting that responsibility on one person I don't think that will work. If you're a very small organization, it may work, but all done in the right context. The person needs to, first of all, have the competences to do that, the time to do that, sufficient time to do that, uh, and be enabled by the management. It starts from the top down. If the management is, is, is really wanting to implement the SMS, supporting the SMS, uh, enabling the people to do that, whether it's done by one person or three persons may not be so important. So if you make that work, then it's fine. Mm -hmm. In a big organization, I don't think that will work, right? to be true. <clears throat> Anything from your side? Your life, no, your just I would apply proportionality. This is the kind of setup that I can accept for small organizations where you, don't, you have a limited amount of resources and the job needs to be done. But definitely for a large, complex organization, it would not go through. Okay, the, the next question, the one at the bottom on the screen, whether we are planning to implement a common assessment tool for SMS between EASA and NAS for multiple approval organizations. The, 
the current assessment tool can be used already by the national authorities. It's supposed to be for that purpose. Of course, it can also be used by organizations. Uh, so it's already there now. Uh, this is the way the tool has been designed. Foster common uh, assessment across all domains. Okay, those four items are covered. I don't know. If I'm not sure everybody heard your comment, but it is an important uh, comment, Jean Pierre. So the the MSAT, I, I can repeat your words if you want, but you can also. Uh, the MSAT is 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 designed for that very purpose, to foster commonality, similar approaches over all the national aviation authorities, EASA included. That's correct. That's the way the, the tool has been built. We can make a common assessment across all domains. It covers all domains. But you also said it can be applied by the NAA. You say it must. No, no because it's no we, by having the tool, yeah. we encourage the tool, the yeah. NAA to use yeah, yeah, yeah. the tool. The question for the other two yeah, the question. question. Yeah, your question was: Is it mandatory or uh, is the use of the of the MSAT tool mandatory for the national competent authority. And this is at least the benefit of having this tool is that we encourage national authorities to use it. And hopefully it will create a level playing field. But we cannot make it mandatory. Yeah. I mean, yes. so. The... But it's also an invitation to NIAs. If one of you wants to be very proactive and they want to come with a very efficient system and or a tool that they want to share with the rest of the community, we're very happy to also implement it. So it's not one way communication. I mean, we are also having a resources issue. It's also a new element for us. Um, the number of experts we have on, on SMS principles is um, it's it's also limited. So we, we are also learning in here. But again, if there is an authority who's very proactive because their industry is very uh, uh, seizable, let's put it that way, we could also take, I mean, it's not one way, we can also learn from the uh, other member states. So when we have our standardization visits and we do take away uh, of the good points and we share them across. So yeah, there's um, also gap for, for or improvement in that side. I think the top question we already answered. Yeah, top one is done. Um, so moving down to the, the one below, uh, which is not the top one. Uh, no, this is just, no, it's not. So it, it, it was about uh, a, a system in place to handle safety issues uh, that DOAs already have and uh, was required by the rule 21A3A requires DOAs and PUAs to have a, uh, a tool, a system in place to handle deficiencies in designs, uh, issues, occurrences, etc. cetera. Um, so does it need amendment? Yes and no. No, uh, in the sense of you have reporting tools, you may use that for internal reporting already. Uh, yes, because the way the rule was designed, it was rather product centric. And we would like you to also include more organizational view to safety and, an, and, and the concept of organizational safety. Ultimately, the goal is product safety. We want aircraft flying safely uh, around this globe. Uh, but the way the SMS targets is, is also looking at organizational uh, elements more than before. So it really, uh, the need to adapt your system is really dependent on what you have already in place. Again, doing a gap analysis there is very important to know what you're up against, to know what you have to do or not have to do. So, so we are trying to see what is the most efficient way to follow. So we think what we are going to do is we are going to take the questions from a slider, no matter what is the subject, regardless of the subject, we are going to deal with them now. And once we finish with the question from Slido, with any remaining time, we go with the remaining slides, okay? Because if we, if we already have, I understand that there is a significant number of questions on the different positions in the organization. This was the topic number seven, which we didn't cover. So instead of going, we can go to the topic seven one moment 
I can give you some ideas to avoid questions. So, and previous slide, because there are two. No, 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 the, the, seven, the seven has two slides. Go back. Yes, that one. Okay, so key organizational personnel. This is where we have a good number of questions. So for, for DOA key personnel, and this may differ for smaller organizations because of proportionality, these are the positions we have. Uh, the safety manager is the new role. We have removed the form four for the nomination of the key personnel from the website. So, and we have removed it from the AMC, so it's not needed to be used anymore, but you still have to nominate the personnel. Now, depending on the size, you have several examples there. For example, the chief of airworthiness may be performed by the head of the design organization for DOS, these are examples of things we are already accepting or things we think is more difficult to accept. And you can take a quick look to that and then we can, we can address the questions that we already have or the ones you raised because, I mean, every organization, in many cases, you will try to propose something different from that. Uh, this is something that we will have to evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the organization and how you can ensure proper responsibilities. It doesn't mean these are the only possibilities. <laughs> these are just examples of combinations that we are finding appropriate. But at the end, it's a discussion between you and us. And so, yeah. So there is a question here. Um, you published uh, last week uh, the MC and uh, you changed the name of uh, CEO with, uh, uh, if I remember well, senior company manager. Yes, right. And uh, so uh, with this uh, new uh, denomination of the CEO, uh, is it in accordance with uh, other regulation, for example, for the operation, for uh, the uh, uh, for the part uh, one forty-five uh, and so on? Is is period related or? Yeah, we in, I know from continuous workness we use the accountable manager definition. Um, honestly, I, I was not aware of this uh, change of definition of the uh, CEO. Okay. <laughs> okay, I, I cannot answer to that. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is. Yes, it is part of the um, of the IMC. Because it is the IMC that you, that was published on the twentieth of. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, you change uh, this name, and you sh you change also the name of the um, for the compliance um, uh, compliance uh, uh, monitoring uh, manager, and uh, that uh, uh, go back in uh, in uh, quality manager. So uh, so it, it was uh, before quality manager. It changed for uh, CMM, and now go back uh, to uh, quality manager. So in the both, it change. Okay. Um, there have been some some changes. The the exit. The, uh, no, no. Yes, in, in the IMC, the senior executive, indeed, uh, in certain uh, instances, or in POA and in the wave in, in one uh, form, uh, we have uh, aligned this this reference, indeed. Uh, to uh, for the person in charge of uh, si uh, signing, in fact, the the commitment, it was to explain that it it was not stopping at the level of the head of ferociousness. So we use uh, this term indeed. Now for the other term that you are uh, mentioning, uh, I don't have it in in mind. We need to have, to have a look. Um, at least. 
In part 21, between uh, POA and DOA, the terms are, are the same. Now, yeah. maybe with uh, part 145, in, we tried to be always aligned, but maybe there are some instances where we need to have a closer look. Mm -hmm. so, but so the names are not changed. The, the, the names mm -hmm. uh, for some of the functions are defined by the rule, so we can't change them by AMCGM. We, we try to use neutral wording, I think is the, uh, the, the right way to say it. Yeah. For a, a generic organization, now you need to target this person to be this function. The function names are defined by the rule in certain cases, unless you go deeper in the organization. For instance, a head of design organization is called head of design organization. Mm -hmm. But the function we expect to be carried out by a senior person in the organization. Uh, and, and, and so we try to find, come, come up with a wording that is not the title of the yep. person, but to target the right location, if you want, in the orga organization chart mm -hmm. you have for the person to carry that title yep. of, for instance, mm -hmm. head of design organization. And, and taking the discussion again back to the SMS implementation, what we are aiming here is to, to uh, formalize the top-down approach on the, uh, especially the policy and so on. So even if on our... Um, approval um, nominated personnel, we normally stop at the account manager or uh, head of. We're aiming that the, the senior most person has to also endorse that. And normally that goes by means of countersigning the quality policy or the safety policy or whatever policy that you're selling as your SMS policy. So the, the message here is that reinforces the top down approach on, on management systems implementation. Slido. Sorry, do we have questions on a slide on, on this subject? Because I'm going to slide. Sorry? Ah, oh, sorry. Yes, next slide. Because I've, I'm, I've got a, a few practicalities here that are different also, again, for, okay. uh, for POA. So the jobs, the, the roles are different. Uh, they're having different names, okay, but that is uh, already known. Um, in, in our case, and again, I'm talking about EASA, I'm not talking about uh, your member states' authorities. We're removing the Form 4, which is a document whereby the authority was accepting nominated personnel, but we will, our intention is to maintain a document with a similar layout. And the purpose of that is twofold. On one hand, we want to formalize and standardize the entries when the industry is proposing nominated personnel. So we would propose you a format. And also two, the second objective is to record the minimum criteria for this personnel. So again, for EASA POAs, we will have a document which will not be the Form 4, but will look very much like the Form 4, whereby we will ask you to use for nominated personnel applications. It will not be countersigned. It. It's just a formality, it's just standardization purposes. The approval, uh, of nominated personnel will be done through approval of this significant change. And the second element in here is the one we are discussing, uh, also applying to POAs. Um, we can accept, uh, let's say, different approaches, but also after due assessment into the size and complexity of your organization, of we can we can consider, uh, you know, merging roles. So we could talk about even a, 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 the example we put in there. We could even talk an accountable manager being quality manager and safety manager. We could accept that after the, we've done a risk assessment and we accept it, um, that it can be suitable. And again, the size of the organization is also taken into consideration. So that would definitely not be the right approach for a large complex organization. Now I'm happy to go to the questions. Okay, so the questions. In a slide. Oh, it's looking funny. Okay, the first question, whether we will continue evaluating the 
form for holder or applicant, even if you don't submit a form for, yes, of course. So, so for wherever, um, by the rule or by the nature of your organization, uh, you have key personnel that change uh, may be significant, defined by 147 or 247, BOA or DOA. And yeah, we will still do the same thing. The only thing that was deleted was the need to have an EASA form four. Mm -hmm. It's the only thing that was deleted. Yep. Can the safety manager work in other roles of the company? Yes, if that works in your system. You need to show that that works. Uh, in a small organization, a dedicated safety manager does not make sense. So this person will have other roles in the organization. In a big organization, it may be their only task, uh, but probably not as well. So the basic answer is yes. Simple, non-complex organization. Simple, non-complex um, here I can take us, uh, we, we've done this sort of assessment already at the, we've implemented RBO in, in, uh, continuous worthiness in the 145s and, and camos. And here the elements that we're looking at are size in terms of persons. We're looking at the scope of your activities in terms of what are you authorized to do, uh, what sort of activity you are doing. Uh, but also we look at your compliance and so on, but in this case, it would not apply. Um, so complexity, what else have we got? Your, your subcontractor structure, sorry, your subcontractor structure. We also take it into consideration. So how many tires of suppliers you have, how many, you know, what amount of percentage of your activities actually done outside. What kind of tools do we have? Are your subcontractor using the same tools that you have internally and so on? So just to give you a flavor of what, of what it is, uh, we, we're using this. We're also using uh, locations. Uh, we're using um, how, in terms of locations and then in terms of countries. Also, we're looking at how many countries because we the, that the cultural element or the distance element could also be. Um, just to give you a flavor of what we're using in continuous awareness. Um, I'm not saying that we will use the same one for POA or DOA, but to give you a sort of flavor of what we're looking at. Okay, the, the, the second question there, we already addressed it, uh, but, if, but if, if, if you have subcontractors, your SMS has to take into account the subcontractors. Okay, so we are not, out, we are not imposing the requirements directly on the subcontractors. Okay. Uh, which are the safety performance? Which are the safety performance indicators that the ASA will adopt in priority for conducting their SMS audits? Now, maybe we don't fully understand the question. If the question is, with who we start, <laughs> and on the basis of what? Uh, at the at the end, we are starting. At least in DOA, we are doing it as part of the normal oversight activities. And, and one of the aspects we are checking is SMS. And it depends on whether the organization is large or small. We put it as an item on an audit or we do a full audit on SMS for the particular subject. Uh, if, I, if I'm allowed, again, to go back to this um, RBO topic, um, the, the system that we've implemented, and again, in continuous worthiness, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that we, we will implement exactly the same. Um, they look at complexity of the organization. So again, very basic indicators. We will not go into the details of them. Complexity. So we have an, an indicator to somehow give us a flavor of how complex you are in terms of size, complexity, your business, and so on. So that is one element that we look at. The other one is compliance how good or what is the result of your compliance activities? And the other one was SMS. How developed is your SMS, your management systems? Um, here I can say that it can go in a single bucket or we can be split it. So we can be looking at the quality and management systems together, but we could look at them separately. And this is a discussion we're having today. And there is a soft 
human element to it. So it's not data driven. There is also human driven. So there is an amount of data that goes from a human person to a human person. And this is, you want to call it the gut feeling, but this is the sort of information that normally on a handover, the previous inspector will tell you uh, to the new inspector, how are they performing? Where are their weaknesses? Where are their strengths? Where do you normally find, you know, this is the kind of elements that you would, we would be looking to implement into an SMS system, uh, into an RBO system, sorry, uh, from our side. Um, I don't know, I, mean, I think I've got a flavor of how the DO is doing it. Uh, in, in, in EASA, uh, we are still uh, developing it. We just had the AMC last week, so we, we, were, we are still, uh, like you guys, <laughs> deadline is very clear for us also. Thank you. Like the next one? Yeah. So how can the head of uh, independent monitoring also be the safety manager without conflict of interest? Thank you for the question. Uh, proportionality uh, should allow for this in, in, in DOAs that are very small. We have DOAs that are three persons. Um, you have to make uh, adjustments for that. How can this still be okay? By doing a proper job, by clearly separating when you're doing independent system monitor work or when you're doing safety management work. And the question we have when we go to our, such an organization and we're, we're looking for an answer, it is working. The conflict of interest does not exist. The world isn't fully black and white there. Can the head of independent monitoring audit himself for his safety manager task? No, D definitely not. Impossible. So we'd have to ask somebody else to do that for him. It, it is a very simple answer, but that is really how it works in very small organizations. And um, that, that's also a proportionality aspect that we have to consider. There's a question on this one? Okay, okay, then I, I think it's better if you use the microphone because then people online can also hear the question. I just want to ask an additional question about that. If sure. uh, the same person uh, is head of design and safety manager, how he can manage an anonymous report about him and his work? Yeah, the, the difficult, with difficulty. <laughs> in, in that sense, that, that's a drawback of doing it like that. And, and we would have a discussion with such an organization. Uh, with, with, uh, the, the question was on head, head of independent system monitoring and, and safety manager. If the head of design does the safety manager role and there's a safety management issue on the performance of the head of design, it's the ultimate responsible. So always, it, you, you can always construct the case where the ultimate responsible has something to decide on his own performance or her own performance. We're reaching the, the limits of the system. Okay, the, there is a question there. The third one on the screen. Why not create a common question database with expectations of an SMS audit, like a questionnaire for EASA and NAS? Now, of course, the, the, the audits depend on the, on the type of organization, the size of the organization, but but okay, this is a, this is a good comment, and and I, I took note of it already. So uh, and let's see how. I mean, maybe we cannot implement exactly like that, but we can yeah. review it. The, the way we go about this is is not to have a common question database per se, but suggestions for ways on how to audit an organization. The the, the big danger with these things is that people take it and ask the question. It's not what we want. We want people to say, ah, this could be a good question. It doesn't fit so well to this organization. I'm going to audit. I modify it a little bit, and I'm going to ask that question. That's what we want to achieve. So, yes, th these things can be very helpful, but we're treating them with caution. There are many interesting questions. We're not... Your resources. <laughs> I, I can take this one. So, so we've archived literally hundreds of questions. So I would not like to raise unreasonable expectations. We will not 
be able to answer them all. But what we can commit to do is to review them and to extract from those questions. First of all, many are redundant. So if we spot some topics which are not already addressed in FAQ, then we would uh, respond to those questions and add that to the FAQs. So we can commit to review them and depending on uh, the relevance, uh, we, we may indeed add uh, some of the answers on our website. That's a very valid point. Thanks for the person who has the question. There is a question. Can we go please to the topic of significant changes? Okay, just then we can we can do that. And it will not take very long. Uh, probably is topic number five or six. Yep, um, and I was thinking uh, now, um, I just got uh, the hint um, for the standardization between EASA and member states. Um, in the case of, of POA, uh, uh, FS1, so is our, our standardization uh, unit, they did create a document and share it with the um, with the member states, laying out uh, the, the guidelines of the, of the uh, implementation of the new novel elements. Um, and I think this is in the public domain. I'm, I'm not. I think it's in the public domain on the other website. So, at least to allow you to take a picture of. I mean, we are going to post the slides on the website, but, but at least, just to let you to take pictures of the slides. I'm going to go quickly through the slides we didn't see, and then we will address questions afterwards. So this was the next topic that we didn't discuss after the break. Significant changes for DOAs. Not everything. Not, it's not always a significant change. It will depend on each organization. You will have to determine the gaps. You will have to agree with the DOA team leader. How large are those gaps? And on that basis, whether it is a significant change or not. For some organizations, it may not be a significant change. For many, it will be a significant change. So. This is the policy we are following in DOS for POS. Uh, the policy is it's a significant change for everybody. Okay, and and again, so mm -hmm. that's the policy for. Yep, for us, as I mentioned, there was guidance material as one of the object of the reasons for it, and also alignment with the other um, domains within EASA FS. Um, but we also said what is the expected uh, level of documentation that we receive. So we don't just want you, us to say, okay, uh, this is my application. We want you to apply when you're ready for it. So we are asking um, together with the Form 51 to come with a POE. So you've already identified who's going to take the new roles and also an implementation plan. So expected you know, milestones on that, on that journey. Um, is this element, this last element, is getting more and more crucial as we're getting closer and closer to the uh, to the due date, because we are all very busy and and we can plan or, or work ahead. But as as I said, the or or historical experience on this type of changes is going to happen <laughs> in the last two weeks. We want to avoid that. Um, yep. So so, whatever questions you have on this topic. We leave it for a few minutes later. I'm going to go through the remaining slides, so at least you have the opportunity to see all of them. And then any remaining time, we use it for questions. So this is the slide related to significant changes. Now, the next one is topic six. Okay, so the length of the oversight cycle for DOAs, and this is something I mentioned before, we come from the different practice for DOAs, you have been under a three-year oversight cycle. In POA, you have been under a two-year oversight cycle. So for POA, here we, we are, again, you know the flexibility that is provided in the rule. So normally, if, you are, if we are stuck on what I call step two, it will be two years. If you've got an, an efficient implementa system implemented, you will go to three. And if that is topped up with, uh, compli uh, with reporting, four years. But we can also go down to one year of side cycles. And this is a tool that we can use. I mean, it doesn't mean that we are going to implement it if, you, if, you, if an organization is not performing as expected. But it could be the appropriate tool to deal with your approval. And the rule allows for it. 
So there could be cases out there where we, EASA, again, decide that the one year of a cycle is the most adequate tool to oversee your approval. So in the particular case of the OAS, again, since you are already having a three-year oversight cycle, in principle, we are going to continue with the three years mm -hmm. unless we have a reason to reduce it based on your performance. And later, based on how your management system is working and how efficient it is, we can discuss whether we move to four years or not. But, but in principle, we are going to try to keep the current cycle of three years. Okay? Um, I think that's it. So item number seven was the one on the personnel. So we already covered that. So you can go to the, the next one is also topic number seven. The next one is topic number eight. Okay, findings and escalation policy. Now, this is important. Uh, in the new requirement, there has been a rewarding of the findings. We don't have level three findings anymore. The level three findings have been replaced by observations. So, if we think we need to open a finding, it needs to be open as a level two. Okay, so. Uh, so the, the the observations are not supposed to be used for a small findings. I mean, observations are observations. So level two findings will be everything else except level one. Now, regarding the safety significance of the findings, in the case of DOAs, we for sure discuss and coordinate with the project certification managers and experts because we know we want to know what is their opinion on the projects they are handling from your organization. So our DOA team leader discusses with them, and we coordinate with them. In the case of POAs, this is discussed with Joaquin, who is the section manager, uh, in order to discuss how critical the finding is. So this is where we decide whether it is a level two or a level one, and, and whether it is a real finding or not. For the ASA. For the ASA POAs. Not for the member states again. I don't need to receive them. <laughs> yeah, this is, <laughs> he's not reviewing the findings from the national authorities, okay? So it's only for the ASA POS. Now, there is a new provision in the rule regarding escalation from level two to level one. Uh, the rule says, we open level two findings, we give an initial period of correction for three months maximum, if after this period there is a need of more time or it can be extended as long as there is an implementation plan agreed. So it's possible to give more time. This is clear that there are certain findings that need more time to be solved. So the rule provides enough flexibility to agree on longer corrective action plans. So going escalating from level two to level one is probably the last step. I mean, we have to try to solve it at a, as a level one, and we have to agree on a solution. Mm -hmm. Sorry? We solve it as a level two. Yeah, yeah. So the, the idea is to solve it as level two. But if for any reason there is no agreement and the issue is going on for very long and we need to escalate to level one, unfortunately, the rule does not make any difference about how we treat a level two finding going into level one compared to a level one finding open initially as level one. Mm -hmm. so, so there is no difference in treatment. The only difference is the concept that at the end, if the level one finding is not issued within the 21 days of the rule, we can decide how big is the limitation or how small is the limitation. We have to take certain actions regarding limitation or suspension. But maybe the action is not very large. Maybe the action is, the limitation is a small. So it will be depend, depending on the case. So it will be a case by case. So, but initially the objective is not to escalate to level one. I mean, let's try to solve it as level two with a proper corrective action plan and implementation time. So. Uh, there was a yeah, there was a question from the floor on that one, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> there is.
<coughs> Alexander Tzelikis from Software Engineering Services. Can you specify the deadline here? Because I remember one hour ago you said any finding need to be closed for the deadline, which is 7 March 2025. But with a different level of findings, we have different deadlines. Is it just that level one finding need to be closed within 21 days? Level two, is it three months or something like that? So we need to clearly distinguish between findings that are raised for uh, non-compliances to what we introduced with the new rule which is a deadline of 7th of March 2025, and any other findings. So, yeah. is any other findings follow the normal route? Uh, for level two findings, you have initially a three month period or less if, uh, if, if we deem that necessary. And then within that period, you either need to uh, provide corrective action to that finding based on a root cause analysis, obviously, or you uh, provide us with a corrective action plan that we find realistic and, 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 and proper, and then we can extend the finding. Yeah? Yeah. For the very particular case of SMS, the deadline is set by the rule, and there's no extension possibility. So, mm -hmm. sorry, there, there is a question there? Yeah. Ah, okay. Hello, Christian from uh, Volocopter. The theoretical question, if you have still open level three findings, are they now automatically an observation and what happens to the closure? Uh, they, they remain level three findings and they are closed as normal, as used to be with level three findings. Oh, so we don't transform them into observations. Uh, we treat them as level three findings until they're all closed and then one day they will not be existing as open findings anymore. Mm -hmm. This was for DOA, but I think for POA. Uh, to be fairly honest with you, I don't think we've developed a, I don't have top of my mind okay. a, an answer for that. Okay. So, uh, got a good suggestion. Sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So in that case, maybe we can move to the topic nine, which is the only remaining topic because the 10 was already covered and the 10 was on the DOA POA coordination. So the item nine is the unannounced inspections. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I can, I can cover ahead. that. So mm -hmm. unannounced inspections is one of the type of inspections called out by the new rules. It says we have to do audits and those audits could include elements, different elements. And one of them is the unannounced inspections. So what topics could we cover there? different topics. We could cover whistleblowers, we could cover response to safety concerns, safety priorities of a state safety program, or regular oversight elements that we consider should be treated in an non-announced inspection. Now, for DOAs, we could check, we could do something of minor changes, minor repairs, flight conditions, compliance documents, etc. And we could have questionnaires with a limited number of questions. We can have queries. We can have a topic which is not announced during a regular audit. So there are different ways we can do the unannounced inspections. The important thing is that we are not planning to, and we are not going to go to an organization without telling you that we are going. I mean, we are not going to show up there and ask to find that you are somewhere else. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, here, uh, if the difference is for POA, we, we have not completely closed the door to that. Okay, let's put it that way. So it would be very, very rare, but it could still happen. And if it does, of course, we'd not be interested to look papers. We would be interested to see production, uh, probably. So uh, I was not feeling confident to make the same statement, uh, and I kept it. Uh, we would use it on very rare cases. So, so uh, as you can see, this is one of the areas where we are in a different environment. And there are reasons for that. I mean, in, in, the, in the production, you are producing a product. We may have certain concerns about the product itself. So they may want to go there on a very rare case. In our case, okay, maybe it's not as critical for that. So at least <laughs> we will tell you that we are going. Maybe we don't tell you what we are going to check, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, 
Um, for uh, DOA and PWA, uh, our activities are in uh, areas that uh, we don't uh, manage the access. The access is managed by the authority because we are inside of the airport and to go inside of this uh, uh, sensible area, it is uh, it should be at least uh, 40, 45 hours before coming. So it, I know well that uh, refusing access to authority is a level one. But in this case, it is not our uh, decision, the decision of uh, uh, administration of the French uh, government or French uh, authority. So, uh, oh, so this, uh, of course, you have provisions in your manuals and in your procedures where you have to grant us access. Uh, now, we understand that there are certain requirements from your government or from the authorities, but at the end, we have to get access. How much time? How much time? This is something we can discuss. But, 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 we have, but in the meantime, we are not going to tell you <laughs> what we are going to check, maybe. Um, yep. And if they have a real concern on safety, we will have to speed up the situation. And if we don't get access in so many days, there may be a need for certain action on our side. I mean, if we really think that there is a safety issue with a particular product, so we can we can always put certain limitations. <laughs> yeah, depending but it, depending on how extreme the case is. Yeah, yeah, we know this limitation, and of course we cannot bypass. I mean, we are not. Um, federal agents now that we have the FAA in front of us. We are not the police, literally we're not police. We, we cannot just go through security uh, controls on an airport. So we, we understand um, that will be done. It will be considered when we need to perform this type of activity. But again, it's not envisaged. Um, it's, it's not something that happens every, every day. So it would be used on very, very rare cases. Okay. I think we have time for a few more questions. Uh, I believe our certification director is going to come any minute. Yep. So, but in the meantime, maybe Willie has a plan to do interview for safety manager as per. In, in principle, the answer to this question is yes. We see that person as a key person. In the introduction of SMS, it depends on whether we call it a significant change or not. For sure, we will speak to the person, whether we call it a formal interview to support a significant change application. Maybe not initially, but when that person changes later on, it's just like a change of head of office of awareness, head of design, or head of independent system monitoring. Okay, so. On that one, so the rule does not give a maximum period. The AMC suggests mm -hmm. six months. So that's sort of the time frame we're looking at. External safety manager, somebody in touch with the organization, knowing, being available to people. It could be very tricky, yeah? an external safety manager. I don't see how that can work well. Okay, regarding regarding the question on ISMS and information security, uh, I don't recall exactly now the positions held, I mean, in, in the ISMS rules, but if I remember well, we refer to the positions already described in, our, in each one of the implementing rules. So the accountable manager was the same accountable manager, and I don't think we have specific positions in part IS. So is, of course, they will have certain responsibilities, but there is a cross-reference for the key personnel to the existing rules. We didn't want to mess with the existing positions in each organization. Mm -hmm. So, because in POA, there is a name for the top person. In DOA, it's a different name. So, at the end, we try not to interfere with that. So, we use a cross-reference to the existing rules. 
And I believe we already have here our certification detector, Russell. So, so I think we are on time. I hope we have been able to answer many questions, not all of them. As Gregory said, we are going to review them, compile the different topics, and extract the, the conclusions. And then we will see how we add this information to the frequent asked questions. Okay. So thank you, uh, Joaquin, uh, Juan, uh, and Rob. It was not an easy exercise for them because the questions were very wide in scope. So I'm sure you appreciate how challenging it might have been at times for them to, to answer, but I think they did a very good job, so thanks a lot. And I think the level of interaction uh, really uh, matched our expectation, and it, and it shows that we are still, as it was said many times during the course of the day, part of the journey. Uh, some topics are clear, others need further discussion, and, and we'll take a lot of messages away from this exchange today, so this was very valuable for us. So this concludes the afternoon session, and it's now my pleasure to give the floor to our certification director, Rachel Deschler. Good afternoon, everybody. So for those of you who are uh, with us since yesterday, uh, thanks for having stayed with us uh, until now and uh, even tomorrow. Uh, we have an apology to make because we underestimated, I think, the number of people who would be interested by this event. And you are really, really uh, many people in the room. The room has never been so full. If we had better anticipated, we probably had chosen a, a larger space uh, to receive you. But at least it's, I think it's a sign uh, of uh, the level of interest of the topic and, uh, and your enthusiasm to, uh, to work on it and to work with us uh, on it. It's also the first time we are doing it for the design and manufacturing industry. And we will be particularly interested in, uh, in receiving your feedback afterwards. Uh, whether we need to repeat uh, this event uh, next year or whether uh, a one-off uh, is sufficient and, of course, how we can uh, improve it uh, should we have to, um, to repeat. So <clears throat> I will try to summarize, and uh, as you may have noticed, I did not uh, share the day with you, but still I will try to summarize the highlights uh, of the day uh, as they were uh, shared with me. Um, so, uh, first of all, as you know, this, this day was dedicated to the implementation of SMS uh, for design and manufacturing. SMS is not new. It has been around uh, since a long time, uh, IK19, uh, and deployment in various sectors of, of aviation. What is new is the deployment uh, into the design and manufacturing industry through, through rulemaking. Uh, what I can notice also is the design industry uh, is that you didn't wait at all for a rule to be in place uh, before working actively and actually implementing SMS in many of your organizations. I think that's a very uh, good sign about the value uh, of the SMS concept. Uh, it's by far uh, way beyond uh, a set of rules or new processes and and procedures. It is really about changing the organizational uh, culture towards a strong and robust uh, safety culture. So it has to deal with processes and roles and responsibilities, but it deals also with uh, organizational mindset, culture, just culture, and uh, how we interact together also as, as people. Um, <clears throat> as part of the highlights of the day, uh, I think we got an um, introductory briefing on uh, what we have been doing in Europe, SMS requirements for design and production as we have developed them uh, in our context. And we, get, we, get, we got also um, a more international perspective uh, from ICAO, FA, Transport Canada, and uh, uh, the, our Spanish uh, National Aviation Authority. Thank you very much for all these uh, international uh, insights. And uh, maybe from that, uh, one concern may have been expressed about um, 
mutual acceptance and harmonization of requirements, etc. Uh, personally, I think um, we don't see risks uh, in the domain of mutual acceptance. We are recognizing that the systems are being implemented with slightly different scopes and slightly different timelines. But uh, what matters is that we are all engaged in the same direction of implementing uh, SMS for, uh, for design and manufacturing. And uh, for the differences uh, uh, in the details, I'm sure we will find ways uh, to, um, to work around them uh, constructively. Then we had a panel on uh, benefits and challenges of SMS, SMS implementation in, uh, in larger organizations. And this is, I think, really the sector where we have seen uh, the earliest implementations of SMS in our big companies. Um, I'm sure they found a lot of, of benefit for the organization itself, for the organizational efficiency and for the business to implement SMS. Um, one of the concerns uh, that was impressed, uh, expressed was uh, about the consistency of our approaches yeah, the beauty of Europe is that we have EASA and NAAs as competent authorities and that you may have uh, several um, organization approvals, uh, DOA, POA, maintenance organization approvals, and maybe two or three or four uh, aviation authorities engaged in, um, in the oversight. So I keep asking the question to uh, our teams, you know, how are we going to do that? Um, ensure the coordination and, and the consistency of approaches. Uh, I think that the key will be in communication and close coordination. The person in charge of the DOA oversight needs to know who is in charge of the SMS uh, on the POA side and on the 145 side. Uh, we need to have these connections at European level and we need to talk to each other. And we need to be creative in, um, in shared oversight initiatives, no? common audits maybe, uh, uh, on the same organization. And, and we will learn uh, as we go and, and we will, I, I'm sure we will get your feedback also when things uh, are not consistent uh, and, and, and we will improve uh, step by step. Then we had the panel on the benefits and challenges of SMS in smaller organizations. And here, <clears throat> uh, it was noted that uh, one of the main uh, issue was to get a full commitment at top management level and to get actually the change of mindset in the company, the companies being usually um, smaller. So this is well noted. And then we had the interesting session um, about SMS oversight, uh, which, was more, which was more about how are we going to do it from an IASA perspective. And uh, I hope we have been able to answer uh, a majority of your questions. And I'm sure we have noted uh, some the ones that, that were not fully closed. And one of the major uh, concerns expressed here apparently was the lack of consistency of IASA itself uh, between how we do DOA and POA uh, oversight for SMS. Um, I think uh, further to the feedback of, of today, this is something we will uh, uh, revisit uh, because maybe uh, we still have the possibility to um, uh, to change uh, certain aspects. Uh, but uh, I know that on the design side, we have taken, for example, a decision not to issue findings during the transition period. So if we want that we change that, we can certainly uh, revisit and uh, come back to a more system. No. no. So maybe we don't take uh, all items for strict alignment, but we will revisit all the differences we have between uh, DOA and POA uh, oversight policies. And hopefully in the coming future, we, we can report back in a, in a better shape. In conclusion, as I said at the beginning, SMS is not only about processes, procedures, roles and responsibility. It's about uh, the organizational culture. And I'm pretty sure that in this room, we have made already a very long way uh, towards uh, a high quality safety culture in, in our organizations. Uh, a few topics that are that need uh, careful attention from our side, I think, is proportionality, ensuring that we ensure also proportionality in the oversight and that we don't expect the same from small and from large organizations. 
the handling of multi-approval uh, organizations. And in fact, you are all, uh, you have all multi-approvals. So that's really the, the norm rather than the, the exception. Um, and uh, our DOA versus POA oversight policies. These are the three uh, main topics I maintain. We want to continue collaborating very closely with our international partners to continue the dialogue, to make sure we have no problem of uh, uh, mutual acceptance, that we can continue to work uh, within our respective uh, bilateral agreements. Maybe there is a need to consider some additional requirements. Now, I'm not speaking necessarily about DOA, POA organizations, but maybe in other domains. Um, and yeah, uh, that's about all I had to say on the content itself of the workshop. Um, I, I would like to repeat that, that we really need your feedback on this event, whether it's something we should repeat or not, and how we can do better. And uh, and as a final word, final word will be of, of acknowledgments and thanks. Thank you to all of you for your time uh, in this packed uh, meeting room all along the day for your patience. Uh, and uh, I hope you, you have found the discussion useful for your respective companies and informative. I would like to say, say thank you very warmly to all our speakers, especially the ones who have traveled uh, and who have kept, come here uh, on invitation to contribute to make this event uh, what it is. Uh, and uh, the team behind the organization. We have all the technicians behind the organizations and we have a large uh, IASA team uh, involved uh, in all aspects. So I will name a few people that will recognize themselves. Yves Pauli, Christina Tolis, uh, Philippe Brook, Vladimir Foltin, Patrick Moreau, John Franklin, uh, Juan Anton, Joaquin Duran, Chiro Pironet, and of course, uh, our moderators, uh, Eugenia and Grigori. And I would like uh, a big applause from everybody. Thank you.